Section 12 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4, The Height of the Ottoman Power, by Moritz Brosch. Part 1. The failure of the Turkish attack upon Vienna in 1529 almost decided the Christian powers to take advantage of this first check in the advance of all conquering Islam. Near, however, as they came to such a decision, they failed to reach it. After, as before the siege, the Habsburg sovereigns, the Emperor Charles V and his brother King Ferdinand, were restlessly eager to put down Protestantism and secure to their house an unassailable predominance in Europe. After it, as before, Francis I persisted in his efforts to prevent the realization of this scheme. Concerning the Habsburg policy, it is interesting to note that Francis, the most Christian king, and Solomon II's grand vizier, Ibrahim Pasha, expressed themselves in different words, indeed, but to precisely the same effect. The power of Charles V, said Ibrahim, is like a flood which swollen by many a stream and fall undermines the most solid foundations the austrian brothers wrote king francis are bent on making the imperial crown hereditary in their house and exalting themselves in every possible way a new emperor must be elected who will enthrone justice and restore the german nation to its ancient freedom even as these words of the king and the grand vizier bore essentially the same meaning so did the interests of France and of the Ottoman Empire point in the same direction. This was the formation of a Franco-Turkish offensive alliance against the Habsburg power, which, not content with Spain, Italy, Austria, and the Netherlands, was reaching forth towards universal predominance. A preliminary agreement paving the way for an alliance was signed in February 1535 at Constantinople. The formal treaty followed in February 1536, negotiated by Laforest, the French ambassador at the port, and the Grand Vizier Ibrahim. So the way was prepared for the accord between France and Turkey, which grew more and more intimate, until it afforded the world the spectacle of the fleets of Solomon and Francis united for common action in the Mediterranean. This, to the feeling of the time, was a heinous offence and the scandal would have been infinitely greater had it been known or even suspected that solomon's siege of vienna was the result as the grand vizier ibrahim revealed to the ferdinand's ambassador of an appeal to the sultan from francis his mother louise of savoy and clement the seventh for help against the emperor even in our days it is often said that francis in allying himself with the port ranged himself on the side of the barbarism of the east against the civilization of the west this view however the impartial judgment of history must pronounce to be not wholly correct it was not invariably barbarism and civilization which were opposed when in the age of solomon and charles v turk met christian barbarism was often to be found on both sides and in rank plenty it is true that the ottoman method of carrying on war was as a general rule barbaric but that of their opponents was not less so. The ill-disciplined hordes of Charles V in their rioting in Rome outdid the Turks, and the Emperor Charles himself, when he had taken Tunis, 1535, handed over the town to a merciless loot in which thousands of men and women were killed or led away into slavery. Two years earlier, Andrea Doria had devastated with fire and sword the shores of Sicyon and Corinth quite in the manner of the Turkish admiral Cheridan Barbarossa, when dealing with the Spanish possessions in the Mediterranean. The laying waste of the land, the ill-treatment of the populations of the countries with which Solomon was at war, and still more the practice of employing prisoners of war as galley slaves, a practice extending to Christians also, were alike indicative of barbarism. But the way in which the Spaniards, even contrary to their interest, seized every opportunity of fighting with the moors and of destroying or driving into exile that highly civilized portion of their population was the height of a barbarity not less infamous than foolish 
It was no doubt a barbarous act to send the ambassador of a power with which the port was at war to the al the fortress of the Seven Towers. But surely it was outdoing Turkish barbarity to strangle Solomon's ambassador, as King Louis of Hungary did five years before the Battle of the Mohawks, or to murder the ambassadors of King Francis, Rincon, Fergoso, in time of peace, as was done in Milan, fifteen forty one by order of the imperial administrator the marquis of vasto the act being justified by charles v after its perpetration in the matter of tolerance towards those of differing faith the sultan was the superior of those with whom he fought the exaction of a tith of their boys from the defeated christians was an act of cruelty but apart from this no one was persecuted for his religion in the ottoman empire in solomon's time when the Inquisition was carrying on its deadly work in Spain and in the Netherlands. In view of all this, it cannot be said that in the wars of Solomon, barbarity was to be found only on the side of the Turks. In several points, it is undeniable that the Ottomans were better, the Spaniards and imperialists worse than their reputation. The raising of the siege of Vienna, fortunate as it was for the emperor and his brother, brought them no political advantage. Ferdinand had himself crowned King of Hungary, two years before, but here he was, and remained, a king with only a fragment of a country. Solomon had bestowed the Hungarian kingdom as a fief upon John Zapolia, and the latter maintained himself in its possession by Turkish help. Charles V now found himself in a position which might be described by the French proverb, que trop embrasse mel in trente. Spain urgently demanded his presence. France kept the peace, but pressed on a course of action which rendered the emperor's position more difficult. The Pope promised to summon a general council, but secretly did all he could to prevent its meeting. In Germany, the wishes of the Protestants stood in sharp opposition to those of the emperor. The latter, finding himself in sore want of money, was at last induced to make concessions which he abominated to the Protestants, and to try to bring about peace with Solomon. He wrote again and again to his brother, April and November 1531, advising him to come to terms both with the Turks and Napolia, and to instruct his ambassador to yield the very utmost that he could in the negotiations. Ferdinand, in accordance with his imperial brother's wish, actually yielded as far as he could. The king's ambassadors at the port were instructed, if nothing else, would serve to bring about peace to give up the whole of Hungary to Sapolia on the single condition that at his death it should revert to Ferdinand. The ambassadors were received in state at Constantinople. But when they had spoken with the Grand Vizier and had audience of the Sultan, they saw that, in spite of their utmost concessions, peace was not to be obtained, and that a new war was at hand. Solomon made mighty preparations, hoping for an easy victory over the helpless emperor and his brother, and the army which started from Constantinople at the, at the end of April 1532 was 200,000 strong. It was to meet this imminent danger that Charles made concessions to the German Protestants, which, though ambiguously worded, induced the imperial states to grant for the defense a levy of 25,000 men who were to muster in Vienna by the middle of August. This resolve on the part of the estates was due in a great measure to Luther, who persuaded the Protestants to lay aside their distrust of his imperial majesty, and be satisfied with his gracious concessions. Nevertheless, we are assumed by Charles' Spanish biographer Sandoval that he did not allow any Lutherans among the Italian, Spanish, and Dutch levies, which he himself joined in Vienna in September, lest they should contaminate the Catholics and help the Turks. He probably had gathered in Vienna a force which, including the imperial contingent, would have been strong enough for the defense, had the siege of the city, so universally dreaded, been renewed. The siege, however, was not to be. Solomon had advanced as far as Goons by way of Belgrade, where 15,000 Tartars from the Crimea joined him, and Essek, where he was reinforced by about 100,000 men from Bosnia. Seventeen strong places on the route had yielded to him without any serious attempt at resistance. Goons, however, before which Solomon appeared on August 9th, made preparations for defense. It was well fortified, but it is said to have a garrison of only 700 men. 
this handful of warriors held out for three weeks against a dozen assaults, defending heroically and successfully a breach of eight fathoms in length, and winning even the admiration of the enemy. The governor, Nicholas Jurishitz, was invited into the Turkish camp on the security of two hostages and a written safe conduct, and was cordially received by the Grand Vizier, who warmly acknowledged the bravery of the defense. In Solomon's name, the town and castle of Goons were presented to Jurishitz with the robe of honor. At his request, it was even granted that a guard of twelve Turks should be posted in the breach in the wall to prevent any others of the besieging force from entering. This episode carries one back to the Third Crusade, when Richard of the Lion's Heart did not hesitate to knight a kinsman of the Sultan Saladin, and when, after bloody fights, Crusader and Saracen met as friends. The Sultan's experience before goons probably helped drive out of his mind the thought of besieging Vienna, now so well defended. He contented himself with overrunning Styria and some parts of Lower Austria, with straggling bands of horse, turning the campaign into a plundering raid in which the afflicted land was wasted, its people hunted into the woods or carried away into slavery. Solomon himself led the retreat with the main body of his army, and on November 18 reached Constantinople, where he was lauded as the conqueror that, on this occasion, he was not. It would now have been well for the army concentrated in and around Vienna, under the command of Charles V and Ferdinand to march in full strength against Hungary, free it from the Turkish overlordship, and hurl Zapolia, the vassal of the Sultan, from the throne. For this, however, money, in the first place, was lacking. Furthermore, the season was too far advanced, and the help of the imperial troops was not to be had. Already at the Diet of Radisbon, when the grant of reinforcements was under discussion, even the Catholics opposed it. The whole Turkish danger was attributed to Ferdinand's feud with Sepolia, and it was declared that if this could be brought to a satisfactory conclusion, Germany would have rest from the Turks. The commander of the imperial troops also pointed out that these have been levied against the unbeliever, and were ready to fight against him, but not against Apollia. To risk the advance into Hungary, with an army reduced by the withdrawal of the German troops, was obviously out of the question. While the Ottoman attack was checked at Gunz, Andrea Doria, Charles Admiral had taken the offensive by sea. He had been successful in seizing Koron on the peninsula of the Moria, one of the strongest Turkish coast fortresses. Patras and two other sea forts either submitted or were taken by storm, the Turkish fleet retiring before the Genoese admiral's victorious advance. But Doria could not maintain his position in these waters when winter drew near. He sailed westward leaving behind in Cordon a strong garrison of about 2,000 men. To Solomon, the success of the bold Genoese in the Spanish service must have been simply an annoying episode, which must soon come to an end, as the Christians in Cordon were merely a fighting outpost and could not maintain themselves against the superior Ottoman power. It is incredible, therefore, that alarm in at Doria's success inclined the Sultan to peace. And indeed, there is evidence that a very different cause influenced him in this direction. He had conceived the idea of the Persian expedition, which he actually carried out next year. And it was to avoid the necessity of, of carrying on war on two frontiers that Solomon lent his ear to the plea for peace offered by King Ferdinand. In the beginning of January 1533, Hieronymus Jurischitz, brother or stepbrother of the defender of Gunz, appeared in Constantinople as Ferdinand's ambassador. Two audiences, one with the Grand Vizier and one with the Sultan, sufficed to secure an immediate armistice. Even peace was not in principle refused, but the acceptance of formal proposals was made dependent upon that of certain conditions laid down in writing by the Sultan and dispatched to Vienna by a Turkish agent, Chiaus, together with the son of Jurschitz. Ferdinand received the Chios as an Ottoman ambassador in all state, and, in order to forward the peace negotiations, found himself to accept the Sultan's conditions. 
These were not difficult of fulfillment, but hard to bear for an independent sovereign such as Ferdinand felt himself to be. Solomon demanded the keys of Gran in token of submission and homage. These keys he would then generously return without insisting on the surrender of the fortress. The Chios received a favorable reply, and shortly after his departure from Vienna, a second ambassador was dispatched to Constantinople. The latter was to take with him the keys of Gran, deliver them up, and, with jurisdictions, carry on the peace negotiations. This second plenipotentiary, Cornelius Shepherd, was also the bearer of two letters to the sultan, one from Ferdinand, who styled himself Solomon's son, and offered to mediate for the restoration of Coron, Doria's conquest, the other from Charles V, trying to induce the sultan to give up Hungary to Ferdinand. When Shepper arrived in Constantinople, the negotiations for peace followed the course marked out by the Turkish program. The keys of Gran were handed over to the Grand Vizier with the words, Isi claves ilas quas tu et Caesar torcarum petifitis ad fidem et firmetudinum regi majestatis domini me declarandum. Upon this, the Grand Vizier with a smile made a sign to Jurisdicts that he might keep the proffered keys. The negotiations then proceeded and were drawn out for a month longer between the Grand Vizier Ibrahim and Alvise Gritti, a Venetian in the Turkish service on one side, and Ferdinand's two ambassadors on the other. Charles' letter to the Sultan, brought by Shepherd, gave great offence. Both in form and in substance, it was highly displeasing to Turkish diplomatists. Shepper, moreover, in the emperor's name, insisted upon the surrender of the island of Archil, from which Cheridan Barbarossa plundered the shores of Spain and Italy, and further declared that Coron could only be delivered up on condition that the whole of Hungary were left to Ferdinand. The result was, as might have been expected, that Ibrahim and Gritti cut short all discussion of the matter with the words, Charles V if he desires peace, must send his own ambassador to Constantinople. With Ferdinand's ambassadors, an agreement was at last, June 22, drawn up, which became the basis of the first Austro-Turkish Treaty of Peace. In virtue of this, Solomon granted peace to King Ferdinand so long as it should not be infringed by Austria. In regard to Hungary, the status quo had to be recognized. That is to say, Spolia was to keep the kingdom and crown, while concerning the portion of the country, which was in Ferdinand's hands, a compromise and delimitation of borders were to be arranged to which the sultan's assent would afterwards be given. The final result of the negotiations, therefore, was a treaty which afforded a respite from the Turkish attack upon Austria, and enabled the sultan in Asia to turn his full strength against Persia, and in Europe to renew his attacks by sea upon the Mediterranean possessions of Charles V. Shortly after the conclusion of the peace, Solomon dispatched an army for the reduction of Coron, which yielded and was handed over by the Spanish garrison. Furthermore, he made Cheridan Barbarossa, commander-in-chief, of the entire Turkish marine force, laying only one binding injunction upon him, and this as a later addition, namely, to refrain from attack upon the shores of the ally of the port the king of France. Sheridan was supreme at sea, Doria's fleet being too weak to cope with him. In the year 1533, Sheridan, whose ordinary occupation was attacking, plundering, and ravaging the coasts of Spain and Italy, succeeded in carrying out an act of real humanity. Landing at Oliva on the Andalusian coast, he, in the course of seven expeditions, brought away 70,000 Moors, whose life at home had been made insupportable to them by the Spanish government in alliance with the Inquisition and conveyed them across the North African coast. Next summer, 1534, he passed through the Straits of Messina, whence he carried off booty and ships to the coast of Naples. Here he attacked several places, took thousands of prisoners, and narrowly missed carrying off for Solomon's harem, Julia Gonzaga, widow of Vespiano, Colonna, celebrated at the time as the most beautiful woman in Italy. 
and a loyal disciple of the brothers Valdez of Castile and Naples. In her castle at Fondi, the fair lady was surprised by the advent of the Turks, and in dire distress had to leap half clad to her horse and ride for freedom, with one knight for her companion. For reasons best known to her, she caused the knight with whom she had fled from her pursuers to be stabbed. Cheridan Barbarossa, meanwhile, sailed with the fleet plentifully, provided with money by Solomon to Tunis, which town, with its strong castle, La Galetta, he easily seized, August two from the hands of Muli Hassan, a descendant of the Arabian family which had borne sway there for four centuries and a half. He was now, as the vassal and representative of Solomon, lord of Algiers and Tunis, and from this point could direct his attacks along the shores of the Mediterranean. Sicily, Genoa, Catalonia, and Andalusia all belonged to the emperor, but to defend them against Barbarossa was beyond his power. The land, indeed, owed obedience to Charles, but Sheridan commanded the sea and was a constant menace to the whole line of coast. The most dangerous aspect of it was that Francis I had entered into relations with Barbarossa, shortly before October 1533 had received his ambassadors. Further, that the king had just claimed Alessandria, Asti, and Genoa from the emperor, while Pope Clement VII who had married his niece, Catherine de' Medici, to the Duke of Orleans, was friendly to the French, and though he indeed censured their friendship with the Turks in public, was quite the man to take advantage of it in the Medician interest in private. During the first eight and a half months of 1534, Charles had to be on his guard against Francis, the Pope, and the Sultan. Against Barbarossa, he might indeed devise schemes, and this in all seriousness. But the European situation forbade their being put into execution. Happily for Charles, an event occurred which changed the entire situation. On September 25th died Clement VII, and on October 11th, with rare unanimity, and after a conclave lasting only an hour, Cardinal Farnese was chosen as his successor and took the name of Paul III. The plans of Clement and Francis I arranged at a meeting in Marseille in November 1533, now fell to the ground. The new pope had his family to think of, Piero Luigi Farnese, his son, and Ottavio, his grandson, and had far more to hope from the emperor, who was all-powerful in Italy, than from Francis, who had to risk a war for his power in that country. During the first half of his pontificate, Paul III maintained a neutral position between the two adversaries. Francis, deprived of all support on the part of the Pope, reduced his demands upon the Emperor, or at least deferred them to a more convenient season. Moreover, the King of France must still have had some scruple about hindering the Emperor from proceeding against Barbarossa, or attacking him in the rear while engaged in such an undertaking. The indignation of Christendom would have been aroused, and, from the French point of view, the formal alliance with Solomon was not yet an accomplished fact. The German Protestants, too, had been quieted by the emperor and his brother with the assurance that in matters of faith nothing should be carried by force, but all should be left to the council which was to be called. Charles, then, had a free hand to begin operations against Sheridan Barbarossa, and under his own command and that of Doria, a fleet composed of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese galleys set sail from Barcelona against Tunis on May thirtieth, 1535. The strength of this fleet, after it had been joined in the harbor of Cagliari in Sardinia by six papal galleys, was stated by Charles himself at 74 galleys, 30 smaller vessels, and 300 transports for the land troops. Such a force, Barbarossa was by no means strong enough to face in the open sea. On land, he would have had at his disposal in Africa a force which, in point of numbers, might be a match for that of the emperor, but in quality was greatly inferior. What did it profit him, therefore, that Francis sent an ambassador to announce that the French would attack Savoy and Genoa in the summer? He needed such a diversion immediately, for he was entirely dependent upon his own resources, and these were insufficient. On June 14th, the Emperor's fleet reached the Gulf of Tunis 
and cast anchor at a short distance from the fort La Galetta. The siege lasted a month. After a breach had been made, a successful assault was delivered, and though the garrison held out bravely for ten hours, the fortress was taken. Two hundred cannon and eighty ships in the harbor were the prize of the victor. In spite of the intolerable African heat, the emperor set out with his army on July 20th upon the march to Tunis. Before they reached the latter place, they had to fight with Barbarossa, who had taken up an advantageous position and lay in wait for them. He was put to flight, however, and the fettered Christian slaves in Tunis, whose numbers are variously stated, broke their chains and opened the gates to the emperor. On July 21st, Charles entered the conquered city, and, yielding to the demand of the Spanish contingent, delivered it up to his troops for a two days' loot. The Spaniards behaved like wild beasts, plundering and murdering to their heart's content, destroying mosques and schools, and laying buildings and precious sculptures alike in ruins. From the plundered town, the Muslim inhabitants had escaped the sword, were led into slavery. Charles betook himself to La Galetta, where he reinstalled Muli Hassan, whom Barbarossa had banished in the government of Tunis, on condition of homage and the payment of a quit rent. In the fortress of Bona, which had also been surrendered, and in La Galetta, the emperor left garrisons. He himself reembarked on August 10th, but was detained in the Gulf of Tunis through unfavorable weather till the 17th, when he set sail for Trapani, reaching that place on the 22nd. In certain quarters, the rejoicing over the issue of this campaign was too pronounced. The emperor had indeed inflicted upon the hitherto invincible Cheridan Barbarossa defeat and loss, but he was very far from having broken or even weakened his strength or his energy. Charles left Africa in August, and already by the end of September, Barbarossa had reappeared in Spanish waters, where he surprised the island of Menorca, broke into the harbor of Mahon, carried away rich booty, and recaptured several thousand Christians who had been freed by the emperor in Tunis. The next year affairs went on in much the same way. In August 1536, Barbarossa made a sudden attack upon Calabria. A year later, he descended upon Apulia, where for a short time he menaced Taranto, and even frightened Rome to such a degree that many people left the city, and Paul the Third made preparations for defense. The same fear prevailed there in 1543, when Barbarossa ravaged Calabria. It quickly died away, however, when at the end of June he landed at Ostia did no damage at all, and even paid in cash for all given to him. This was because the Pope at that time was friendly to Francis I, and so came to be regarded as the friend of that king's ally, the Sultan. From all this, it is clear that by his conquest of Tunis, Charles had indeed won honor and glory, but little or no substantial advantage over Barbarossa. A striking exemplification of this fact was offered to the world in August 1543, when the fleet of Barbarossa, placed by the Sultan's order at the command of the King of France in company with the French, took the town of Nice, though the castle defied them. The Mediterranean at that time was the Franco-Turkish Sea, and Charles V, who, in October 1541, had again fitted out and led in person an African expedition was compelled by unfavorable weather to return from Algiers, which he had intended to wrest from Barbarossa's possession. In the autumn of the year, which saw the conclusion of peace between Solomon and Ferdinand, the Persian War began. For the West, this could only be regarded as a fortunate event. The Ottoman state was always prepared for war, but if it were engaged with the Persian Shiites, it must perforce allow Christian Europe an interval of peace. In the autumn of 1533, the Grand Vizier Ibrahim for the first time took command of the forces gathered on Asiatic ground. While in winter quarters, he carried on negotiations with the traitorous commanders of Persian fortresses, with the result that, as soon as operations were resumed, a whole series of fortified places surrendered to the Turks. The latter directed their march towards Tabriz, which, after crossing the Euphrates and taking more than a month's rest, they reached on July 13, 1534, and at once occupied without striking a blow. A vigorous order of the Grand Vizier checked the loot of the town, and none of the inhabitants suffered the least injury. 
Only in September did the Sultan join the army, which, by most difficult marches over mountains and through narrow defiles, was brought to Baghdad. The city likewise surrendered without striking a blow, its Persian garrison taking to flight, and here again Ibrahim succeeding in preventing all plunder. Bag Baghdad on the left bank of the Tigris, far famed as the former city of the Caliphs, now became a frontier fortress of the Ottoman Empire and remains in its possessions today. Solomon wintered in Baghdad, and only at the beginning of April set out for Tabriz. From this place it took six months more to reach Constantinople, which the Sultan entered on January 8, 1536. During the next two months, important events occurred. In February was concluded the Franco-Turkish Treaty of Alliance, mentioned above, in March, there followed the fall of the Grand Vizier Ibrahim. For fourteen years, the statesman of Greek origin has stood rather beside than beneath Solomon, both in the possession of a rank only second to that of his sovereign, and in the actual exercise of power. The Sultan had given him his own sister in marriage, placed unbounded confidence in him, always allowed him to exercise influence in the affairs of the state, and frequently to express an independent judgment concerning them, and had shared with him both table and sleeping room. On the evening of March 30th, the Sultan and his favorite retired together, sharing the same apartments. Next morning, the Grand Vizier was found strangled by the Sultan's orders. To seek the reason of such a sudden fall would be superfluous. The Grand Vizier, allowing for the difference in the manner of death, merely met the fate which befell Thomas Cromwell in England, from which Antonio Perez succeeded in escaping by flight from Spain, and which at an earlier time overtook Ramiro de Orco, Caesar Borgia's minister in the Romagna. The practices of despotism, open or veiled, are the same everywhere, alike in Christian as in Mohammedan lands. It is often as dangerous to serve as to betray it. End of section 12 Read by Kniz X, Vancouver, May 3rd, 2021. Section 13 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 4, The Height of the Ottoman Power by Moritz Brosch, Part 2. Shortly after the Sultan's return to his capital from the Persian expedition, war broke out again between Charles V and Francis I. For the emperor, it took an unfavorable course from the beginning. The outbreak seemed to draw the pope entirely over to the French side, and directly to invite the Sultan, who had concluded neither peace nor armistice with Charles to help his ally, the King of France. This, in fact, was what happened. Barbarossa was let loose upon the lower Italian provinces of the emperor and inflicted upon them various kinds of outrage. Fortunately for Charles, though unfortunately for Venice, the Turkish fleet repeatedly came into conflict with Venetian ships. The Sultan made complaints about this and sent Eunicebeg, the interpreter of the Porte, as ambassador to Venice. Four Venetian galleys, however, gave chase near Corfu to three Turkish vessels, one of which had Eunicebeg on board. Contrary to the law of nations, he was taken prisoner and ill-treated, though afterwards released with excuses. To appease the sultan, the signory put the commander of the four galleys, Gradenigo, in chains, and tried Contarini, his superior in command. This was not, however, accepted as sufficient, the less so as by the perfidy of Charles Admiral Andrea Doria, a letter written by the latter in which he feigned to be in communication with the Venetian Admiral Pissarro, fell into the hands of the Turks. Soliman resolved on war with the Republic and proceeded to devastate the Ionian island of Corfu, August 1537, and to lay siege to its fortress. The Signory entered into alliance with the Pope and the Emperor against the Sultan, an alliance which was to end in bitter disappointment. In the contemporary Venetian historians Peruta and Segredo, even in Paulus Jovius, who is disposed in other respects to be partial to Charles V, we meet with a complaint that the emperor entrapped the Venetians into this war with Soliman in order to weaken them. It may be doubted, however, whether this was really Charles' design from the outset, though his conduct and that of his admiral, Doria, could hardly have been different, had such been indeed their object. 
the emperor and pope carried out their engagement with the Republic only so far as to order their galleys to join the Venetian fleet. Andrea Doria, however, as commander of the Spanish contingent, rendered such inefficient service that the great sea fight with Sheridan Barbarossa in face of the Ambracian Gulf near the ancient Actium was lost in spite of the numerical superiority of the Allies, September 28, 1538. Soon after, the news of this catastrophe, the Signori must, thanks to French indiscretion, have heard some rumor of Charles' negotiations with Barbarossa about the end of 1538, of his offer to surrender Tunis to him, and of the dispatch of two agents to conduct the affair. Three letters of Charles from Ghent, March 1540, were subsequently found and published, one to Barbarossa himself, a second to Doria and Fernando Gonzaga, Viceroy of Sicily, a third to de Tovar, Governor of La Goleta. To these letters was added a note of what was in progress with Barbarossa. Whether or how far the latter had agreed to the Emperor's proposal cannot be discovered. The younger Granvelle, thirty years later, February 16, 1570, addressed a letter to Philip II from Rome, in which it was openly affirmed that Charles had won over Barbarossa. If Doria's behavior in the Battle of Actium actually helped Barbarossa to gain the victory, this fact may be connected with the negotiations between Charles and the Turkish admiral. Broadly speaking, the double-dealing of the Christian princes of the time is thrown into glaring light by the course of the Venetian War and the Treaty of Peace between the Signory and the Sultan. At the opening of the second year of the war, a league had been formed in Rome, February 8, 1538, in which the Pope, the Emperor, King Ferdinand, and Venice joined in an offensive alliance against the Turks. The inclusion of Ferdinand, ipso facto, involved the breach of the treaty which he had concluded with Soliman four and a half years before. The Pope and Emperor gave their help to the Republic so half-heartedly that Sheridan could continue without interruption to conquer one island in the Aegean Sea after another from the Venetians. When the Allies finally hurled themselves against him, they, as had been said, brought defeat upon themselves through Doria's tardiness and disloyalty. After this, it is hardly surprising that the war spirit died out in the Venetian Signory, and that a desire for peace took its place. They sent, January 1539, a certain Lorenzo Gritti, a natural son of the Doge, on pretense of private business to Constantinople, there to attempt to open peace negotiations. He succeeded in concluding an armistice for three months, but got no promise of peace. When Charles V heard of Gritti's mission, he asked the mediation of Francis I, with whom, since the conclusion of an armistice of ten years between them, followed by a personal interview at Aigues-Mortes near Montpellier, July 1538, he proclaimed himself one in heart and soul. Francis was asked to mediate with his friend Soliman for the inclusion of the emperor in the peace with Venice, and for the grant of an armistice on the part of the Turks to the whole of Christendom. The French king did the emperor's will, and dispatched a special agent to Constantinople to obtain Soliman's assent. The agent, however, received an answer which might almost have been dictated by Francis himself. Whereas Charles, king of Spain, wrote Soliman to Francis, May 1539, desires and would be gratified by the grant of an imperial armistice, let him first give up and deliver into your hands all the provinces, lands, places, and rights which he has taken from you and kept possession of until now. When he shall have done this, and you shall have been pleased to acquaint our porte therewith, then shall it be done according to your desire. Charles did not admit himself either to have been vanquished, or, as indeed he might have been, duped. When, on his way to put down the revolt of Ghent, he passed through France, he arranged with the king an agreement, into which they had already entered at an earlier time, for a joint embassy to Venice. The object of this was to persuade the Signory of the complete harmony prevailing between himself and Francis, and of his intention to throw his whole strength into the Turkish war, for which he could reckon on his new ally. With this mission, Charles entrusted his deputy in the Milanese, the Marchese del Vasto, and Francis, the Marshal de Anbeau, these two arrived in Venice in December. At their audience with the Signory, Del Vasto spoke first, 
and said that the emperor proposed to turn his whole strength against the Turks, that the peace with France was definitive, though some points remained to be settled, and that the two rulers had resolved to unite their forces for the overthrow of the unbeliever. Annabeau, in his turn, confirmed Del Vasto's statements, and emphasized the fact that his king was animated by a strong feeling for the welfare of Christendom. What credence could the Signori lend to such representations? In the first place, they knew that Francis I was allied with Soliman, and was not at all likely to help the emperor against the Ottomans. Secondly, they were well aware that the problem of the possession of Milan, which Francis desired at any price, and Charles would relinquish for none, was insoluble, and lay as an insurmountable obstacle in the way of any real union between the two. Thirdly, they saw clearly enough that Charles pressed them to continue the war without the slightest intention of supporting them against the unbeliever, but simply for the reason that his own position, and more especially his perennial want of money, made it desirable to give Barbarossa occupation against Venice, in order that Spain might be left at peace. Moreover, a fortnight earlier, Francis, through his ambassadors at Venice and in Constantinople, had taken an active part in paving the way for a separate treaty between Venice and the Turks. The Signory must have been blind indeed if they had taken for genuine coin what Del Vasto and Annabeau laid before them as such. They answered with phrases that committed them to nothing, neither affirming nor denying the necessity for a separate treaty. Shortly after the reception and dismissal of Del Vasto and his French companion in January 1540, the Senate resolved to send Alvis Bedouer as ambassador of peace to Constantinople. He took with him two sets of instructions. One was from the Senate, merely authorizing him to offer a large sum of money to the Turks instead of the two places they demanded, Malvasia and Napoli de Romania, the ancient Nauplia in the Gulf of Argos. The second was from the Council of Ten, empowering him, if all else failed, and peace was not to be had in any other way, to agree to the surrender of Malvasia and Napoli de Romania, which the Turks had been unsuccessfully besieging for a year and a half. Of this secret portion of the instructions, the French received treacherous information, which they communicated to the Porte, whether for the purpose of hastening the conclusion of peace, or of proving themselves faithful allies to the Sultan, it is impossible to say. Possessed of this knowledge, the Turkish diplomatists played an easy game with Badwer. He arrived in Constantinople in the middle of April, and was received by the Sultan on the 25th. By May 4th, peace was virtually concluded, though formal sanction was delayed until October 2nd. Venice had to give up to the Sultan Malvasia, Napoli de Romania, Urana, and Nadine on the coast of Dalmatia, and to leave in the Turkish possession the Aegean island of Skiros, Paros, Antiparos, Patmos, Aegina, Stampalia, Neos, most of them already taken by Barbarossa. In addition, Venice had to pay 300,000 ducats as war indemnity. This piece marks a stage alike in the decline of Venetian dominion and in the rise of the Ottoman power to the highest point it was destined to reach. It added one more to those blows of fortune which had stricken the Republic of St. Mark since the opening of the century. The League of Cambri, with its results in the second decade, and the conquest by Selim I of Mesopotamia and Egypt, which cut the Venetians off from the latest route to India by Alexandria, Cairo, and Aden, and thereby diverted a large portion of their trade. To all this was added the loss of her maritime possessions, a loss which inflicted further damage upon the already shaken finances of the Republic, and, as an inevitable result, gradually reacted upon the political energy of the ruling aristocracy. The treaty appears in a very different light, however, when viewed from the Ottoman standpoint. The war which preceded it had indeed brought no defeats to the Turkish troops, but had been marked by constant ill success. The siege of Corfu Fortress was given up by Soliman after it had lasted a week, while that of Napoli de Romania had dragged on without any result. In Dalmatia, the conflict had been waged with varying fortune. Now one series of small fortresses had been taken by the Turks, now another by the Venetians. On the sea, indeed, Barbarossa was supreme, and this wherever he showed himself. It was through him that Venetian trade had been thrown into hopeless confusion, 
and her sea traffic rendered impossible while the war went on. Yet although the war with Venice by land hardly reflected credit upon Ottoman arms, the overwhelming power of the Turks was evident from the fact that they were able to carry on the war on three other sides at the same time. In 1538, Soliman took the field in person against the tributary prince of Moldavia, drove him into flight, burnt Jassy, seized the strongly fortified Suchawa and the treasure kept there, and placed a new prince over Moldavia, from which he cut off the district between the rivers Dniester and Pruth and the Black Sea, annexing it to the Ottoman Empire. At the same time, he was persuaded by fugitives from Humayun, the Mongolian emperor of Delhi, to turn the Ottoman arms against India. A well-equipped fleet of 70 sail with 20,000 troops on board left Suez, June 1538, by the Red Sea, successfully attacked Aden, landed on the coast of Gujarat, rapidly took two fortified posts, and then set to work against a place of which the Portuguese held possession. They bravely defended themselves, and running short of provisions, the Turks had to raise the siege and retire to Egypt. On the return journey, the Arabian town Yemen was compelled to accept Soliman's overlordship. When it is remembered that the year before, in spite of the peace with Ferdinand, Turkish governors of the frontier provinces had renewed the offensive and overcome 24,000 Austrians who opposed them, it becomes perfectly evident that the Turkish offensive forces were in the 16th century taken altogether greater than those of any other European state. Even Christendom as a whole could not compare with the Turks in this respect, for, in its deep-rooted divisions, a fragile system of alliances was everything it had to offer against the all-powerful unity of Islam. Shortly after the drawing up of the Turco-Venetian Treaty, and before it had reached its final form, King Zapolya of Hungary died, July 20th, 1540. He left an infant son, born to him by his wife, Isabella of Poland. King Ferdinand at once attempted to make good his claim to the possession of the whole of Hungary on Zapolya's death. Though he had an ambassador already in Constantinople, Hieronymus Lajki, he promptly dispatched the Italian Andronico Tranquillo as a second, and jointly the two ambassadors were to procure Soliman's assent to the incorporation of Hungary with Ferdinand's possessions. At the same time, Ferdinand sent the Greek Ramiro to the Shah of Persia to urge him to declare war against Soliman. He even marched into Hungary and sent a detachment of troops to besiege Buda. There, however, he met with a brave resistance and had to retreat, contenting himself with occupying the towns of Pest, Weizen, Wyshegrad, and Stuhl Weisenberg. His ambassadors to Soliman had no better luck. Lachki was put in prison the royal dignity was awarded to Zapolya's little son as tributary to, and under the protection of, the sultan, and war with Ferdinand was resolved upon. It was very soon evident that the sultan had not taken the field in the interest of a child, but in his own. This he clearly demonstrated in the first year of the war, when he transformed Buda into the province of a Turkish pasha. It was June 1541, that Soliman left Constantinople and took the command in person. He marched by Nyssa to Belgrade, where Hieronymus Lajki, whom he had taken with him, was left behind ill, then to Buda, of which place Ferdinand's troops had been compelled, after heavy losses, to raise the siege. On his arrival there, the sultan occupied the fortress with his janissaries, banished the widowed queen and her son to Transylvania, transformed the principal church into a mosque, and proclaimed the whole of Hungary under the rule of the Porte during the minority of the little John Sigismund Zapolya. In September, two new ambassadors from Ferdinand had reached the Sultan. They were commissioned to promise a yearly tribute of 100,000 gulden for the grant of the whole of Hungary, and, in the event of this being refused, to stand firm upon the surrender of the places in Ferdinand's possession and occupied by his troops in return for a yearly tribute of 40,000 florins. Not a fraction of either did they obtain. Let Ferdinand, ran the answer given to them, deliver up to the sultan unconditionally Gran, Wyshegrad, and Stuhl Weisenberg, and then further proposals will be entertained. Soon after this, a French ambassador, Pauline de Lagarde, appeared before Soliman 
and complaining of the murder of the ambassadors Rincon and Fregoso in the previous June by the imperialists, pointed to Lachki as the person upon whom the sultan could take vengeance. Suleiman, however, gave a lesson in international law to the murderers in the imperial service and professed Christians. He set Lachki, who had fallen ill, free from his imprisonment. On September 22nd, the sultan left Buda, where he had placed a garrison and appointed a pasha. It remained in Turkish hands for 145 years. In the middle of November, Suleiman returned to Constantinople after his four-month campaign, and a month later, Sheridan Barbarossa sailed into the harbor with his fleet. The latter had been looking on from a safe haven while Charles V, in person, with a fleet equipped at heavy cost for an African expedition, was beaten back in front of Algiers by a storm. The rest of this year, and that which followed, brought little change into the situation. King Ferdinand again sent, in July 1542, Tranquilus Andronicus as ambassador to Soliman with the offer of a yearly tribute of 100,000 ducats, if Hungary were given up. But the embassy was entirely fruitless. Almost at the same time, an army of respectable magnitude was dispatched by Ferdinand to Pest, where it merely came to disaster. It was not until the spring of 1543 that the sultan took the field again in Hungary. The conquest of a series of strong places followed, and the important city of Gran, after sustaining a siege of eleven days only, was taken. Soliman promptly dedicated the cathedral of the surrendered city as a mosque, and apportioned Gran to the province of the Pasha of Buda. The Turks then pressed on to the siege of Stuhlweisenberg, which withstood two assaults but was in the end forced to yield. The war brought to the sultan success upon success, ever wider districts of Hungary submitting to his sway, and this extension of the empire was actively carried on in the following years. Soliman had returned to Constantinople, but his troops took Wyshegrad, which King Ferdinand had seized, with the Hungarian crown which was kept there. Seven other strong places fell to them by force or consent. Fights in the open field, in which now the Turks, now the Austrians, gained the advantage alternated with the monotonous course of the sieges. It was the final result of this campaign, and of the two which preceded, that Soliman was able to divide the part of Hungary which was in his power into twelve Sanjaks, which, following the course of the Danube and the Theis, extended from one side from Buda by way of Gran, Stuhlweisenberg, and Fufkirchen to Slavonia, on the other by Zsigeden to Sirmia. Each several Sanjak received a special tax register, and a defterdar established in Buda had charge of the whole system of the administration of the taxes. This was the half-military, half-civil, and financial organization which Soliman at the beginning of 1545 conferred upon the Hungarian portion of the Ottoman Empire. It remained in force with few changes, and these rather extensions of its sphere of operations, for a century and a half. In this aspect of his work, Soliman deserves the title, given to him in the East, of the lawgiver, and indeed that of a lawgiver whose work was permanent. In their hopelessness of effecting anything against the superior Ottoman arms, Charles V and his brother sought safety in peace negotiations. First in June 1544, they succeeded in getting the Pasha of Buda to consent to an armistice, originally for a month only but afterwards indefinitely prolonged. Then followed embassy after embassy from Charles and Ferdinand to Constantinople, which for two years were practically without result. It was not until the close of 1546 that Feltwick, the joint ambassador of Charles and Ferdinand, succeeded in opening a negotiation which, after a year and a half, led to the desired end. The peace, or rather five years' armistice, was drawn up on the basis of the status quo on June 19, 1547. Soliman kept all his conquests, and for the small portion of Hungary which Ferdinand had managed to hold during the war, an annual payment to the Porte of 30,000 ducats was stipulated, this payment being interpreted on the Austrian side as a free gift, while the Turks regarded it as a tribute. In the peace were included the King of France, the Republic of Venice, and Pope Paul III. The last, as a Venetian bailo, told the Council of Ten, at the instance not of the emperor or his brother, 
but of the Grand Vizier, Rustem Pasha. It is highly probable that this was the exact truth, for just at the time of the peace negotiations with the Porte, Charles V was on very bad terms with Paul III, and the Pope felt himself, as Ranka expresses it, the ally of the Protestants. Humiliating as the payment of tribute to the Sultan was, brilliant days seemed dawning for the Habsburgs at this time. For Charles, one lucky event followed another. In July 1546, died Sheridan Barbarossa. In March 1547, King Francis I, and in the following month, Charles was victorious over the Protestants at Mühlberg. To all this was now added the security of five years' armistice, which the Sultan had granted for 30,000 ducats a year. After the treaty with the Habsburgs, Soliman allowed only a short rest to himself and his army. In the spring of 1548, he began a new campaign against Persia. The superiority of the Ottoman arms proved itself against the Persian Shiites, hated by the Turks as heretics. Fourteen years had passed since the Grand Vizier Ibrahim had taken Tabriz and saved it from loot. This time, the town was taken by Soliman himself, and its inhabitants received a like forbearing treatment. From Tabriz, the march went on towards Van, a strongly fortified place which surrendered after a short siege of only eight days. Still, more striking was the issue of the second campaign. And Soliman, on his return to Constantinople in December 1549, was able to send a triumphant report to King Ferdinand and the Signory of Venice. Thirty-one towns, the Sultan's letter announced, have been taken from the Persians. Not long afterwards, the Shah of Persia attempted a countermove. When, as will be seen, the war in Hungary again broke out between Ferdinand and the Sultan, the Shah seized the opportunity to take the offensive in Asia. It remains an open question whether or not this was the result of a suggestion of Charles V, but it is an indisputable fact that Charles was already, and had been since 1525, in communication with Persia, and continued to be for more than 20 years. At first, the war went in favor of the Persians. They took two strong places, one of which was Erzurum, whose governor, with his troops, they decoyed into an ambush and totally defeated. With lightning speed, the news of the Turkish ill-success reached Europe. Already, in January 1552, it was discussed among those assembled at the Council of Trent, where it was even stated that the Shah had seized the passes of the Taurus and was threatening the whole of Syria. End of section 13. Read by Derek Benison, Los Angeles, 17th of May, 2021. Section 14 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tad Davis, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Chapter 4, The Height of the Ottoman Power, by Moritz Brosch, Part 3. In the campaign of 1553, Soliman took the field in person. The character in which he appeared first was not that of a heroic leader, but of the murderer of his own son. Prince Mustafa, the child of the Sultan's first wife, was a thorn in the flesh to the second, the Russian Churyam, whom the French poets Marmontel and Favart call Roxolana. He was the heir not only to the throne, but to his father's good qualities without any of the bad. The popularity enjoyed by Mustafa with the people, as well as with the Janissaries, was immense and proved his ruin. His stepmother, Roxolana, was scheming to put him out of the way in order to secure the succession of her son, Prince Selim, in league with the grasping Grand Vizier Rustem, her son-in-law, she could easily beguile the aged sultan and make him believe that Mustafa was a conspirator in league with the Janissaries to oust his father from the throne. Rustem exerted his powers of intrigue and Roxolana her blandishments. Soliman fell blindly into their net, 
and Mustafa's doom was sealed. In obedience to his father's summons, he appeared in the camp at Eregli, and on entering his father's tent without suspicion, though not without warning, he was strangled before the sultan's eyes, October 6th, 1553. The horrible deed roused the Janissaries to madness, and Soliman only averted a desperate revolt by the deposition of the Grand Vizier. This terrible tragedy exercised an effect on Ottoman affairs resembling that which the massacre of St. Bartholomew had on the history of France. Prince Selim, in whose favor the crime was committed, was the first of a series of degenerate sultans sunk in pleasure-seeking or stricken with imperial mania under whose sway the empire went to ruin. From their winter quarters in Aleppo, the Turkish army advanced into Persian territory. This they reached after crossing the Euphrates near the border fortress of Kars, and the war was begun with the total devastation of the enemy's country. The opening character of this expedition was maintained throughout. It was a march of incendiaries who turned happy fields into deserts and was only now and then interrupted by a fight in which sometimes the Persians sometimes the Turks, got the upper hand. At last, the superiority of Ottoman arms was proved in so far that the Persians, in spite of some noteworthy successes, could neither wreck the invading army nor wrest from it the conquests it had made. In September 1554, an armistice was arrived at, and in May of the following year, a treaty of peace was concluded at Amasia in Asia Minor. Here also ambassadors of King Ferdinand appeared, but were not immediately successful in bringing to an end the war which had broken out again in Hungary in 1551. The cause of this new outbreak of the Hungarian War was that neither side had scrupulously kept the terms of the peace of 1547. The Turkish pashas in Hungary had raided Ferdinand's territories, while the latter had, in direct violation of the treaty, involved himself in a negotiation for the freeing of Transylvania from its feudal dependence on the Ottoman Empire. Soliman had conferred the lordship of Transylvania upon Zapolya's widowed queen during the minority of her son, but in actual fact the monk George Martinuzzi had arrogated to himself the rule, reducing that of the queen to a mere name. With this Martinuzzi, Ferdinand opened secret negotiations in the hope of making Transylvania a part of the Austrian dominions and of securing its throne for himself. When the Sultan, in spite of Martinuzzi's cleverness, saw through his designs, he considered that the peace had been broken by Ferdinand and equipped an army which some 80,000 strong crossed the Danube at Petervardine in September 1551. It was commanded by Mohammed Sokoli, who subsequently, as Grand Vizier, was of the utmost service to the kingdom. In the first attack, he took twelve more or less fortified places, among them the important town of Lipa on the Marash, for which, before the end of the year, another fight had to be fought. After this, Mohammed Pasha went on to the siege of Temeshvar, where Ferdinand had placed a mixed garrison of Germans, Italians, and Spaniards. After two months, however, the siege of this place had to be raised, and the Turkish army recrossed the Danube to Belgrade. Martinuzzi, for whom shortly before Ferdinand had procured a cardinal's hat, took advantage of the departure of the Ottomans to push forward all the troops he could procure in Transylvania, together with those of the king, for the recovery of Lipa. He himself joined the besiegers without any foreboding of his approaching fate, it had, however, become known at Ferdinand's court that the newly created cardinal was playing a double game, for the king on the one side and to all appearance, but also on the other for the sultan, from whom he hoped for pardon, favor, and reward. To spoil his game, Ferdinand authorized his general Castaldo, in case of treachery on the part of Martinuzzi, to prevent him from carrying out his design by putting an end to his life. Castaldo thereupon planned the murder with another of the generals, Pallavicini and Martinuzzi's secretary, 
and on December 18th the cardinal fell, pierced by many daggers. He was the victim, in part of his own intrigues, in part of that morbid growth of princely power which in those days both in Christian and Mohammedan lands had taken upon itself to be the supreme judge in its own cause. From Lipa, the Turkish garrison had departed in accordance with the terms of the capitulation agreed upon with Martinuzzi. The campaign of 1552 opened for the king with failure and heavy loss at Sagedin, for the Turks, at this time under the command of the vizier Ahmad Pasha, with a series of successes. Between April and September, Vesprim, Temeshvar, Skolnak, and other places were taken. An army raised by Ferdinand was entirely defeated, and half of it captured and brought to Buda, where the prisoners were sold at a very low price, so overstocked was the market. It was not until October that the Turkish run of good luck was in a measure checked before Erlau, which defended itself so bravely that the siege of it had to be raised. In the following spring, an armistice of six months was signed, and in August a negotiation for peace was opened by Ferdinand's ambassador in Constantinople. The armistice was now prolonged, but neither before nor after this arrangement was there any pause in the fighting. Incursions from one part of the country into another, and sieges of towns and fortresses incessantly continued, as if war were the normal state of things and an armistice an unnatural episode. The negotiations for peace were interminably protracted. One of Ferdinand's ambassadors had again and again to journey between Constantinople and Vienna for the purpose of obtaining fresh instructions. Three times this situation repeated itself with the intolerable monotony during the years from 1553 to 1557. To this period belongs Pope Paul IV's strange prayer to the Turks to give up their Hungarian war, turn their forces against Philip II, and so help the Holy Father in the struggle he was waging with the Spaniards. At last, the ambassador Busbeck, a Netherlander, whose invaluable letters concerning this legation throw much light upon the Turkish affairs of the time, succeeded in framing a project of peace, to which he committed himself in Ferdinand's name, without a similar obligation being incurred by Soliman. Again, years passed before the project ripened into a peace, which Ferdinand, who had become emperor shortly before the death of Charles V, ratified at Prague on June 1, 1562. This negotiation brought a Turkish interpreter to Frankfurt on the Main, and during its tedious course Ferdinand steadily and in much detail proved his right to the possession of Transylvania. His demonstration was not less steadily met by the statement that the Sultan had won his overlordship by the sword. As a matter of fact, the sword dictated the whole treaty. Nothing was given up of the conquest made in the Sultan's name during the war and also during the armistice. Transylvania was adjudged to the son of Zapolya, no encroachments being allowed here on the part of Ferdinand. The yearly tribute of 30,000 ducats to the port was to be paid and in future punctually. The peace was to be strictly kept, and any breach of it, whether proceeding from the one side or from the other, was to be punished. The war had brought the Sultan important acquisitions in Hungary, Temeshvar, Skolnik, the mountain town Fulek, Tata, and other places, and these he kept by the treaty. And to crown all, after its conclusion, the Turks demanded that Ferdinand should settle the arrears of tribute, which had accumulated for three years, by a payment of 90,000 ducats. In the last years before the conclusion of this treaty, a tragedy happened in the family of the Sultan, which had its origin in the murder instigated by his wife, Roxelana, of Prince Mustafa. Roxelana had also contrived that Ahmed Pasha, who had been made Grand Vizier in the place of her son-in-law, Rustem, should be executed and replaced once more by Rustem. This was, however, the last success Roxelana achieved, and the last murder she had on her conscience. She died two and a half years later, with the soothing assurance that she had secured the reversion of the throne to her own offspring, 
or perhaps with a foreboding that a bloody struggle for the throne must decide which of her two sons, Selim or Bayezid, should succeed to it. This strife, which had evidently been smoldering from the time of Mustafa's murder, blazed out in a furious flame while Suleiman was still living. On the side of Selim, the elder brother, stood his father with all his power, but Bayezid also had a party and was able to raise an army strong enough to maintain a hot fight with Selim at Konya in Asia Minor, May 1559, before it gave way. Bayezid fled to Persia, where he was delivered up by the Shah Takmasp to the executioners sent by Selim. The unfortunate prince was strangled with four of his sons. A fifth, only three years of age, who had been left behind in Asia Minor, shared the same fate. As the price of blood, the Shah received 300,000 ducats from Suleiman and 100,000 from Selim. But the debt of the sultan was not, in the Shah's opinion, adequately paid in money. He demanded, in addition, that five sons of a Khan who had fled to Baghdad from Persian justice should be given up for execution. This demand was granted. As he was now at peace with Ferdinand, though indeed the peace in Hungary was badly kept on both sides, the sultan gave his attention to the maritime struggle with Spain. The warfare in the Mediterranean had continued up to this point without intermission, but with varying fortune to the combatants. An attempt made by Philip II in 1563 through the Austrian ambassador in Constantinople to gain an eight or ten years' peace remained without result. Fighting and looting went on. On the one side, Turkish fleets and corsairs, and on the other, Christian fleets, and more especially, corsairs equipped by the Knights of Malta, carried on their operations and made navigation unsafe. Suleiman intended now, by seizing Malta, not only to strike at the piracy of the Christians, but to inflict heavy losses on the Spanish power. The island would, in Ottoman hands, serve as a safe harbor from which the entire length of the coasts of Spain and Italy might be threatened or attacked at any point. Accordingly, Suleiman, in April 1565, dispatched from Constantinople for the seizure of Malta a fleet of more than 150 vessels with over 20,000 troops on board and abundantly equipped with all necessaries for a siege. The greatest sea captains of the empire, Piali, Durgut, and Ochali, operated in carrying out the sultan's will and organizing the siege, but they had no luck in the undertaking. They succeeded, indeed, in obtaining possession of Fort St. Elmo, but two other forts, St. Angelo and St. Michael, were so bravely defended by the knights that all assaults were vain and only entailed enormous loss upon the besiegers. Nevertheless, the Turks remained in the island from May to September, attacking the forts again and again, only to be flung back with severe losses. At last, the viceroy of Sicily, Don Garcia de Toledo, brought help to the hard-pressed knights. He had delayed long, and only when expressly commanded by King Philip, put out to sea with an ill-equipped fleet. When, however, he did effect a landing in Malta, the Turks could not maintain their position any longer, but were compelled to raise the siege and re-embark with the loss of many thousand men. While the fighting in Malta was still going on, everything pointed to a new war in Hungary. The Emperor Ferdinand had died in 1564, and the Treaty of Peace had to be renewed with his successor, Maximilian II. Unpleasant discussions arose in regard both to arrears of tribute due for the last two years and to events in Hungary. Here, Zapolya from Transylvania had annexed Zatmar, and Maximilian had ordered an attack on Tokay, which belonged to the Turks. Unfortunately, the peacefully disposed Grand Vizier Ali Pasha died in June 1565, and the vacant office was conferred upon Mohammed Sokoli. 
This Bosnian, a true statesman, and an upright man, such a one as did not again fall to the lot of the Ottoman Empire till after a hundred years in Ahmad Koprili, held from this time forward under three sultans the office of Grand Vizier, with wise moderation and at the same time with all necessary boldness. At the time of his coming into power, he favored war in order to restore the belief in the invincibility of Ottoman arms which had been shaken by the failure of the expedition against Malta. Suleiman was the more easily won over to this opinion, as he was much incensed by the conduct of the troops of Maximilian, who, respecting the peace as little as the Turks, had made incursions into Hungary and had either taken or besieged Vesprim, Toke, and Tata. Shortly after the beginning of the new year, 1566, war was resolved upon, and the Sultan, in spite of his seventy-two years and uncertain health, entertained the idea of placing himself at the head of the army. On May 1st, Suleiman, with the Grand Vizier, left Constantinople and took the field. They marched by Sofia, Nyssa, and Belgrade to Zemlin in the first place, where the young Zapolya appeared to do homage and was received very graciously. From this point, the Sultan meant to advance to the siege of Verlau, but changed his mind and decided to turn against the strongly fortified Ziget, whose commander, Nicholas Zrinya, had just attacked a Turkish scouting party and handled them very roughly. On August 5th, Suleiman halted before Siget with considerably over 100,000 men and began the siege. The outer line of fortifications was soon in the hands of the besiegers, but the inner part of the stronghold offered an obstinate resistance, and Zrinya was not to be moved to surrender either by promises or threats. A first and second assault having failed, recourse was had to the laying of mines, which were fired on the morning of September 5th and destroyed a large part of the surrounding wall. But during the night of September 5th, the sultan died in his tent. The grand vizier succeeded in keeping his death secret from the army for three weeks, as had been done, though not for so long a time, at the death of Mohammed II and Selim I in order to prevent or at least to weaken mutiny among the Janissaries. The siege of Ziget went on, and on September 8th the place fell, and Zrinya, fighting bravely, chose to die a hero's death. To the Grand Vizier Mohammed fell the difficult task of both commanding the army and paving the way for the peaceful accession of the new sultan. Thus, in the thirteenth of the campaigns conducted by himself, Suleiman I had sacrificed his life. To the dead monarch, his contemporaries in the West gave the title of the Magnificent, or the Great, his fellow believers and fellow countrymen in the East, that of the Lawgiver. In the case of Suleiman, the claim to greatness holds good merely when he is compared with the majority of the members of his dynasty, which in the person of Mohammed II alone produced a ruler of equal capacity. Quite unquestionably, however, Suleiman stands first among Turkish sultans as a legislator, and the traces of his legislative activity far outlived his own time. Though, like his predecessors, the caliphs and earlier sultans, Suleiman united in himself all ecclesiastical and temporal power, his state had become a preponderantly military one, in which the warrior class drew its reinforcement, as well as its maintenance and support, from the subject peoples. The Ottoman Empire was a military state par excellence, inasmuch as it was built upon ever-extending conquest. It was its mission to spread Islam by fire and sword, and to subdue unbelievers who refused to accept the faith to the extent of making them liable to the capitation tax. In the constitution of the army, as it had come down to him, Suleiman altered nothing in theory. His purpose was to make it more efficient, to facilitate its handling in the field, and his endeavors were crowned with success. From a Venetian report made at the beginning of the second decade of his reign, 
we learn that he had, even then, raised the total of the standing Ottoman army to 86,000 men, double the number at which it had stood in his predecessor's time. The nucleus of the army, the infantry corps of the Janissaries, he gradually augmented from 12,000 to 20,000, and he succeeded in heightening the soldierly zeal of these troops by giving them a closer organization and granting a higher rate of pay. In regard to the cavalry, Suleiman regulated the distribution of the fiefs called timars in such a way that arbitrary rule in the administration of the widely extended empire was not indeed rendered wholly impossible, but brought within very narrow limits. Moreover, his numerous enactments on feudal affairs were so systematic in character and so clearly laid down that directly after his death, in the reign of Selim II, a sort of doomsday book could be compiled in which the whole landed property of the empire was entered according to the two categories into which it was divided for purposes of taxation, and the feudal tenures were enumerated together with their obligation of military service. Besides the regular troops, there was at the disposal of a sultan, when he went to war, the mass of the irregular militia. In the enemy's country, this arm, consisting of hardly less than 100,000 men, was under little or no discipline, but on the march and within the bounds of the Ottoman Empire, Suleiman knew how to hold in check these otherwise unbridled hordes. Next to the military class, in order of importance, was that of the teachers. As not only the faith, but also the civil law of the Mohammedan peoples was founded upon the Quran, the appointed exponents of the holy book must be held to be also the best judges in cases of law, whether actually disputed in court or not. These ulema, well instructed in all the law of the faith, experts in their knowledge of the Quran, holders of the best-paid judicial posts, and administrators, seldom very scrupulous, of the incomes of many pious foundations, were an immensely rich and therefore influential class of the population. Before their sentences, fetvas all bowed, and the mingled ecclesiastical and secular power vested in the sultan only affected them in so far that the sultan at his pleasure nominated to the supreme positions from which all such judgments, whether of law or faith, proceeded. The repute of the ulema was in Suleiman's time still untainted, and he did nothing to lower it, but much to secure the attachment of these half-ecclesiastical, half-secular men of business by the commanding motive of self-interest. As a faithful Muslim and a calculating statesman, he could not dare to disoblige them, for among the Turks, too, the ancient Arabian tradition was current that on the day of resurrection the ink of the ulema would be as efficacious as the blood of the martyrs. The supreme head of the priestly body was the mufti, to whose fetvas both established modes of procedure and the regulations of daily life owed their legal validity. It is worth remarking that Suleiman gave a certain permanence of tenure, and thereby a certain independence, to this high office, by not changing the mufti during the last 21 years of his reign. During this time, he retained the same person in the dignity, namely Abbasud al-Amadi, who remained another eight years under Selim II, and in this office effectively cooperated with the Grand Vizier Mohammed Sokoli, consistently showing himself possessed of a love of peace and a humane spirit. It was this mufti who, with the Grand Vizier, tried in vain to hinder the Cyprian war projected by Selim, and a little later prevented the seizure of all the Venetians in the Ottoman Empire, pointing out that even though the Venetians, contrary to all right and reason, had thrown subjects of the Sultan into prison, still the Muslimen should not follow the evil example of the Jowers. For the training of the ulema, Suleiman issued a new course of study to be carried on in the different colleges attached to the mosques. A course of ten grades was drawn up through which an ulema had to pass before attaining to the higher ecclesiastical dignities 
or to the higher judicial post of the empire. None of the ten grades was to be omitted. Nevertheless, this actually took place, for abuse crept in, and the ulema, having become an hereditary caste, registered their sons in their earliest childhood, even in the cradle, as scholars in the lowest class, so that as boys they might be at once declared ready for one of the higher forms. Things were not very different in the Catholic Church before the Reformation, when Giovanni de' Medici, afterwards Pope Leo X, as a child of nine, became Archbishop of Aix, and as a boy of fourteen, Cardinal, in spite of the fact that the very Pope Innocent VIII, who made him a Cardinal, had established the rule that to have reached the age of at least thirty was requisite before attaining to the dignity of the Cardinalate. Apart from these institutions for theological training, little or nothing was done in Suleiman's time for the education of the Ottoman people. The national demand for education was slight, and the responsibility of meeting it was taken easily. The Turks were far from resembling the Arabians, under whose government in Andalusia almost everyone could read and write, and could carry on his education in one of the many schools of grammar and rhetoric. This was in the 10th century, when Christian learning was outstripped by Arabian, whereas in the 16th the Mohammedans had in their turn been distanced. Not only in regard to his fellow believers did Suleiman bear himself as the head of the faith, but in regard to the Orthodox Greek Christians of his realm. Mohammed II had thoroughly grasped the fact that the numerous Greeks in his empire greatly preferred himself to the Pope and willingly received their patriarch at his hands. The conqueror of Constantinople, however, and his grandson Suleiman, could, as sultans, hardly regard themselves as other than supreme in all the affairs of the Christians, temporal as well as spiritual, and they appointed and deposed the patriarch of the Greek church as they pleased. The Arabian sultans in Spain acted in just the same way, confirming the election of the Christian bishops and even summoning councils. Out of the practice of appointing to the patriarchate grew that of selling it and Suleiman raised the price of attaining to this dignity from 500 to 3,000 ducats. Later, the candidates for the office tried to outbid one another. In the 17th century, its price had risen to from 18 to 20,000 ducats and more. It must not, however, be supposed that it was only with the Christians that the sultans so dealt and bargained. Government posts were already sold in Suleiman's time, and the practice, a fatal one, grew and was destined to have mighty influence in later days upon the decay of the empire. In other than church affairs, the condition of the Christian population, called Raya, was not much better than that of a subject people which had to work for its lords at a very low wage. The Raya had to pay to the holders of the Timars a tenth, often by abuse a higher proportion, of the produce of the ground. To the state they had to pay a poll tax, and deliver up a tenth of their boys for the army. Moreover, they were subject to a whole series of rents and taxes, which, though reduced to a system by Suleiman, formed, taken together, a sufficiently heavy burden. The mere names of these taxes, bride tax, hoof tax, pasture, bee, mill, herd, and meadow tax, compulsory or villain service, and provision for the army taking the field, recall the conditions of feudal dependence in the West, and the reality of the obligations implied fully corresponded with the evil sound of the names. Still, before a Turkish Qadi, who was obliged to observe the great law book of Ibrahim of Aleppo, compiled at Suleiman's command, the Raya would get justice sooner than would a serf in Germany or France from his hereditary judge, and even if the law gave fewer rights to Christians and Jews than to Mohammedans, it still afforded the possibility for each man to secure in full those which belonged to him in law. Not without reason was this sultan called the lawgiver by his people. In regard to Suleiman's title of the Magnificent, the case is quite different. 
In the high sense in which this epithet was applied to Lorenzo de' Medici, for instance, Suleiman by no means deserved it. The sultan was fond of splendor, and his magnates followed the example he set in this respect. He magnificently adorned the city of Constantinople by the building of six new mosques. By undertaking works of utility, such as bridges and aqueducts, he enhanced the comfort of its inhabitants, and by opening up new means of communication by road, he greatly facilitated intercourse between different parts of the empire. At the same time, he had regard to the filling of his treasury and the steady increase of the income of the state, so that to carry on costly wars, pay the cost of luxury, and heap up treasure, he must beyond doubt have tampered with economic laws without sparing the sources of the public revenue. Though the figures of the Venetian accounts are not entirely to be relied upon, yet by comparing them with others, we arrive at the clear fact that Suleiman increased the income of the state to more than double the amount at which it had stood under Mohammed II, and that he must therefore have brought undue pressure to bear in the matter of taxation. It cannot be maintained that an increase in the wealth of the people, which might have taken place meantime, could of itself have produced the increase in the taxes, for Ottoman affairs were regulated for war and not for production. Instead of the magnificent, Suleiman should have been called the prodigal. He unsparingly staked the whole strength of the Ottoman Empire on the game, engaging in war almost every three years during a rule of 46, and winning a series of victories which raised that empire to a height of power which it was too exhausted to be able to maintain beyond a short period. End of section 14. Recording by Tad Davis. Section 15 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tad Davis, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Chapter 4, The Height of the Ottoman Power, by Moritz Brosch, Part 4. With all conceivable care and skill, the Grand Vizier had concealed the fact of Suleiman's death until the arrival of his successor, Selim, in the midst of the army at Belgrade. After the announcement of the mournful tidings, a largesse, according to custom, was made to the troops upon the new accession. The Janissaries, however, grumbled and demanded more, but were appeased by the declaration that no more money had been brought from Constantinople. On the day of the solemn entry into the capital, however, the rebellion broke out, and the Janissaries, by open force as well as by threatening to loot the city, succeeded in obtaining a largesse of the value which was wont to be given in former times upon the accession of a new sovereign. Selim II inherited the Hungarian War, and this went on a full year longer, without a decisive result for either side. While the emperor, Maximilian II, could not reckon on any considerable success, the sultan was bent on embarking upon a war in another direction, and the grand vizier was satisfied with the fact that Ottoman arms had overcome Ziget after an obstinate resistance, so that none of them had any desire to prolong the war. Maximilian, therefore, wrote to congratulate the sultan on his accession and asked at the same time for a safe conduct for the peace ambassadors whom he proposed to send to Constantinople. No objection was made to the grant of the safe conduct, and at the end of the summer of 1567, a peace embassy, equipped with the inevitable presence, appeared in the Turkish capital. The three ambassadors, of whom it was composed, found themselves face to face with a surprisingly altered situation. The sultan was full of warlike ardor, 
not, however, directed against Maximilian and Hungary, but against Venice, for he was intent upon the acquisition of the island of Cyprus. The Grand Vizier was in favor both of peace with the Emperor and the maintenance of the peace with Venice, as it was now of importance to the Sultan to have his hands free on all sides so that he might turn his undivided strength against the Venetian Republic, the ambassadors hoped, as one of them wrote on December 21st, to secure more favorable conditions by opposing procrastination to the Sultan's haste. But they had to do with a diplomat of greater skill than that of the Sultan. Mohammed Sokoli granted peace for eight years, February 17, 1568, on conditions comprising certain formal concessions to Maximilian and others of very real moment to the Sultan, who had to be promised the yearly payment of a tribute of 30,000 ducats under the designation of a gift of honor. At the court of the Sultan, the game of intrigue already in progress as to the question of war or peace with Venice began to draw to an issue. The Grand Vizier, who was favorably disposed towards the Venetians, had already, under Suleiman I, at their desire, procured a formal prohibition to Turkish merchants to trade with Papal Ancona, and had further brought about the renewal, June 1567, of the old treaties with the Republic. But now all he could do was to try to delay the execution of the Sultan's will and hope perchance by the delay to turn it aside from its original purpose. Salim, however, was influenced in a direction opposed to the opinion of the Grand Vizier by personal inclination, the suggestions of intriguers, possibly also by real political considerations, rightly or wrongly understood. Salim may or may not have remembered that in his scheme for the conquest of Cyprus, he only proposed the execution of what Suleiman had already contemplated when in 1564 he proposed to Duke Emmanuel Philibert of Savoy the severance of the island from the Venetian dominions. In any case, Lala Mustafa had laid Salim under great obligations when he was prince. The Admiral Piali Pasha had something to gain from a naval war. The renegade Migesh Nasi, who held in fief the island of Naxos, hoped for the investiture of Cyprus, and all these together plied the ear of the Sultan with representations as to the ease with which Venice could be conquered, and the importance of the acquisition of Cyprus for the security of Ottoman supremacy in the Mediterranean. Every Sultan, they said, should signalize his entry into power by a brilliant feat in arms, and such a feat might now be performed without risk. For Venice, enervated by a thirty years' peace, had almost forgotten the art of war. Mohammed Sokoli would have been powerless against the war party had he not been strengthened by the action of Philip II. As a result of this king's intolerable oppression, the Moors rose in wild revolt in the south of Spain, and in his attempt to suppress the insurrection, Philip did not shrink from inhuman cruelty. The Moors appealed to their fellow believers across the sea and procured active assistance from the Turkish vassal states of North Africa. This, however, could only prolong the rebellion. It could not ensure its success. The Moors resolved to appeal to the supreme head of their faith, the Ottoman Sultan. In the spring of 1569, a Moorish deputation appeared in Constantinople to claim the powerful intervention of the Padishah in their peril of subjugation and even of ruin. The feeling which this deputation met with in the Turkish capital was so deeply sympathetic, so powerfully fostered by the ulema, so widespread, moreover, and shared by such numbers of the faithful, that even the party which was urging war with Venice had to assume the appearance of taking for granted an expedition against Spain. They are said to have proposed that the Sultan should effect a landing in Neapolitan territory at Otranto, and thus, by making a diversion in favor of the Moriscos, compel Philip to desist from their pursuit. Had this proposal been executed, it would simply have amounted to ut aliquid fecise videretur, of what advantage could it have been to the Moors in Granada if distant Otranto were besieged or taken by the Turks? 
The attitude of Mohamed Sokoli was totally different. He saw that the moment had come for a great undertaking against Spain and that it must be seized. Philip II was at war with the Moors, who, supported by the Sultan, would hazard their resources to the uttermost. He was also occupied with the revolt of the Netherlands, where Alva was carrying on his bloody work and was without any European alliance or any prospect of getting one. France, in scarcely concealed rivalry with Philip, was in friendly intimacy with the Sultan. The emperor, weak, dependent on Spanish support, and yet estranged from Spanish policy, was hampered, indeed crippled, in every action by the German estates. The Italian states, oppressed by Spain, were exposed all along their shores to Ottoman attack. Finally, England was under the sway of Elizabeth, for whom alliance with Philip against Selim II would have been suicide. Such was the condition of affairs and such the state of relations among the European powers. The opportunity must be seized and a new line of action taken up to press forward the frontiers of Mohammedanism into the territory of its traditional foe, now for the moment sharply pressed and isolated. Suleiman would have lost no time in delivering a blow against Spain at a time such as this, when it was so likely to be effective. Nor was Mohammed Zokoli the man to linger and allow the Moors to bleed to death. His will, however, was only that of the Grand Vizier, and had to bend to that of a sultan who, at a moment which unmistakably called him to great deeds, was consumed with a feverish desire for the possession of Cyprus. Two errors brought about the war with Venice. In the first place, the Diwan in Constantinople was misled by the news of a devastating fire which broke out in the Venetian arsenal in September 1569. They believed that the whole Venetian fleet was destroyed, while in fact, though considerable damage was done, only four galleys were burnt. Secondly, the Venetian scenery was deceived when it persuaded itself that not only was an alliance with the Christian princes within reach, which proved to be the case after prolonged efforts to this end, but that it would also enable them to hold Cyprus. This latter conviction was accurately discounted by Mohammed Sokoli, who remarked to one of the Venetian negotiators at Constantinople, I know well how little you can count on the Christian princes. He had already, at an earlier date, said very truly to the Venetian Bilo, What will Venice do, seeing that the island, i.e. Cyprus, is at a distance of 2,000 miles by sea? The Sultan is fully resolved to have it, and it would be better for you to give it up to him than to exhaust yourselves in its defense. At the end of January 1570, the Venetian seigniory received the news that the Sultan was not to be dissuaded from his design upon Cyprus and that very shortly the surrender of the island would be demanded. In the hope of help from the Christian powers and encouraged by an earlier rumor that the port was behindhand with its maritime preparations, the seigniory resolved definitely to refuse the demand and to abide the issue of war. When the bearer of the ultimatum, who left Constantinople on February 1st, arrived in Venice and threatened that if Cyprus were not voluntarily surrendered, it would be seized, he received the answer, The seigniory are firmly resolved to defend their legitimate possession of the island of Cyprus, trusting in the justice of God. This answer, given on March 27th, must have arrived in Constantinople towards the middle of April, and in May, a fleet under Piala Pasha's command, with 50,000 men on board, was on its way to begin the conquest of the island. War had broken out, and Venetian diplomacy was at work to obtain for the Republic the help of the other Christian states at war with the Crescent. In the first place, application was made in Rome to Pope Pius V to allow the seigniory to levy a tenth on the property of the Venetian clergy for the purposes of the war. When the Pope showed himself inclined to organize a League of Powers against the Turk, the seigniory immediately authorized their ambassador in Rome to enter into the negotiations necessary for such a purpose. 
These negotiations were unduly prolonged, inasmuch as, for all concerned, the matter had a very serious side. Only the Pope threw himself heart and soul into the affair, and without his pressure and exhortation it would, to all appearance, have fallen through, in spite of the imminent peril to be averted. Even Venice, which had to withstand the first Ottoman onset, was filled with anxiety lest the results of an anti-Ottoman league should prove scarcely less fatal than those of a Turkish victory. The Venetians had the fear that Philip II, if the Turks were beaten with his help and under his leadership, which could hardly be refused, would reap all the advantage, that he would strengthen Spanish domination in Italy and do away with the monopoly of the navigation of the Adriatic tenaciously maintained by the Signory, and so offensive to Philip himself and his kinsmen, the German Habsburgs. The ruler of Spain had indeed an interest in the weakening of the Ottoman power, but it was by no means his intention that this weakening should, as a natural consequence, benefit the Republic of Venice. Moreover, he was afraid that the seigniory, if their influence were increased by the formation of an anti-Ottoman alliance, would make skillful use of it so as to obtain an advantageous peace from the Sultan, and would leave their allies in the lurch. Nor was this fear at all groundless, for we now know, what Philip probably did not, that at this very time when the seigniory was seeking alliances against the Crescent in Rome and Madrid, namely in March 1571, they were also attempting to find out in Constantinople whether they could not arrive at a peaceful solution of the difficulty which would render the league with Philip unnecessary. Such being the state of mutual suspicion of the two parties chiefly concerned, it is not to be wondered at that the negotiations concerning the league lasted from March 1570 till May 20th, 1571. On that day, however, the triple alliance against the Turks between Spain, the Pope, and Venice was at last signed in Rome. Though a difficult birth, it was destined to give a lusty proof of vitality in the Battle of Lepanto, but was then to die an early death. During the diplomatic turmoil from which the League was born, the Turks had not been idle. Their fleet had, in passing, devastated the island of Tinos, and reached Cyprus near the ancient Paphos on July 1st, after the disembarkation of the troops who were well equipped with siege guns, the Turks, under the command of Lala Mustafa, undertook the siege of Nicosia and brought it to a successful conclusion on August 8th. The town was destroyed by fire and sword. The Turkish attack was then directed against Famagusta, where the garrison made so brave a defense that the siege took a long time and was still going on when the Triple Alliance became an accomplished fact. Yet in the third month after the conclusion of the League, Famagusta had to capitulate, and the news of the perfidious breach of the agreement for the surrender, the barbarous slaughter of the brave defenders, and the infamous defiance of treaty obligations shown in throwing the inhabitants and garrison into slavery spread through Christendom. The Turkish commander, Lala Mustafa, at whose door this barbarity was laid, incurred the worst odium but while he must have appeared to many as a sort of Mohammedan Alva, he should in fact only bear a portion of the blame, though the names of those who were responsible for the greater part are not to be ascertained. The Triple Alliance now seriously gathered together its forces. In addition to papal, Venetian, and Spanish ships, it had at its disposal troops and galleys furnished by the Duke of Savoy, Florence, the feudatories of the Pope, Parma, Urbino, Ferrara, and the republics of Genoa and Lucca. In Naples, on August 14th, Don John of Austria, the half-brother of Philip II, received the admiral's flag at the hands of Cardinal Granvelle as commander of the United Fleets of the League. The place of meeting for the mighty Armada was Messina, and from this harbor the whole fleet, which was joined by some Maltese ships, put to sea, and proceeded to seek the enemy in the eastern waters of the Mediterranean. They sailed first to Corfu, then to Cephalonia, whence behind the rocky islands of the Kurzulari, 
the Achenides of the ancients, they saw the Turkish fleet lying at anchor in the Gulf of Lepanto. The latter numbered 200 galleys and 75 smaller ships, to which the Allies opposed 200 galleys, six enormous galleasses supplied by Venice, and a few smaller vessels. The whole number of troops, that is to say of actual fighting men, on board the Christian fleet is given at 30,000. On October the 7th, the fleets engaged, and after a sharp struggle, the Allies gained a victory more complete and more brilliant than had ever yet fallen to the lot of the Christian powers when contending with the Ottomans. Nearly 50 of the enemy's ships were burnt or sunk. The number of the Turkish dead amounted to 8,000, that of the captured to 7,000, and that of the Christians released from bondage in the enemy's galleys to 10,000. On the whole, it seems likely that the Ottoman fleet would have been annihilated if Jean Andrea Doria, who commanded the right wing of the Allied fleet, had not managed to fail in a maneuver and let Ochali Pasha, with 40 galleys, escape. Recent research has placed beyond doubt the fact that Doria's maneuver failed purposely in order to spare Ochali, with whom Philip II had formerly carried on a negotiation as Charles V had once done with Barbarossa. The Battle of Lepanto proved the superiority of Christian arms, its results that of Turkish diplomacy. It made clear also the fact that the Ottoman state was still at the height of its power. The maintenance of this position was facilitated by the divisions, nay hostility, which broke out not only between the cabinets of the three allies, but between the crews of the different nationalities, which had united to win the victory, but went asunder over the distribution of the spoil. How matters were going on after the victory in the Allied fleet may be gathered from a communication addressed on October 26th to the Venetian Doge by Marco Antonio Colonna, commander of the Papal Squadron. Only by a miracle, he writes, and the great goodness of God was it possible for us to fight such a battle, and it is just as great a miracle that the prevailing greed and covetousness have not flung us upon one another in a second battle. According to the agreement in the League, half of the booty gained was to go to the Spaniards. They, however, in the weighing and measuring of it, tried to overreach the Venetians. This beginning of strife was fostered, or at least permitted, by the Admiral-in-Chief Don John of Austria, who had an earlier quarrel with Sebastian Venier, commander of the Venetians, which was renewed after the battle. We hear that upon one of the Spanish galleys, each simple soldier received booty to the value of two or three thousand ducats, while Sebastian Venier, so he affirms in his account to the Senate, only received as his share 505 ducats, a coral chain, and two Negro slaves. Certainly, not all Spaniards secured any gain there of money or money's worth. We know, for instance, that the immortal Cervantes fought at Lepanto and lost his left arm, but that he made anything out of the battle we do not know. A very short time after the Ottomans had suffered their severe defeat, the alliance of the powers went to pieces. Before the end of October, Philip II ordered Don John to bring back the Spanish ships of the Allied fleet to Messina and to winter there. Don John sailed by Corfu to Messina, whither he also took the papal as well as the Spanish galleys. Next summer he received orders from Madrid to repair again to the Adriatic and cooperate with the Venetians against the Turks. Once again, the Allied fleet faced the Turkish, which had been refitted in Constantinople and was under the command of Ochali Pasha. But the two fleets only came within sight of each other without attempting a serious engagement. Don John remained before Navarino until September and then sailed with his fleet in the direction of Italy. This was the last expedition against the Ottomans undertaken in common by the Triple Alliance, and after its failure the burden of the war fell upon Venice alone. Venice was encouraged on all hands to persevere against the enemy of Christianity, but received support from none, even the papacy refusing its help. 
Pius V, the indefatigable promoter of the League, had died in May, and an application by Venice to his successor, Gregory XIII, for a loan of money, was met by a cold refusal. In comparison with his growing disintegration of the League, the conduct of the Ottoman government in the hands of Muhammad Sokoli appeared worthy of all admiration. The Grand Vizier had not only to reckon with the difficulties of the moment, but with a sultan such as Selim II, whom a French ambassador at his court described as the most imbecile person who ever held sway over the Ottoman state. To instill energy into this person, or even to get him to allow any scope to the energy of others, was in truth no easy task. Yet a single word from the Grand Vizier sufficed to gain the Sultan's attention. Selim agreed with all that Mohammed Sokoli proposed, and in political matters did all he wished and allowed what he ordered. At this time every conceivable effort was being put forth for the restoration of the navy, which had been practically destroyed at Lepanto. The arsenal of Constantinople was enlarged, space and ground being obtained for this enlargement at the expense of the gardens of the Seraglio, from which an enormous piece was cut off. The building of ships was taken in hand with feverish speed, however incredible it may appear, and in the summer of 1572, a hundred and fifty new galleys were ready, and Ochali Pasha was sufficiently strong to put to sea against Don John. Two years later, the Ottoman fleet had attained to such strength that Ochali, with 250 sail, appeared off Tunis, and once more seized it from the Spaniards, who had settled there a short time before. This achievement in shipbuilding astonished the world, for in the 16th century no Christian state was capable of equaling it. It showed clearly that the Ottoman power still stood firm, and that from the height to which it had risen under Soliman, it had not yet fallen in the very slightest degree. I could never have believed, wrote the ambassador, whose accurate summing up of Selim II has just been cited, that this monarchy were so great if I had not seen it with my own eyes. This ambassador was the Bishop of Axe, of the noble house of Noaya, an extremely anti-papal and anti-Spanish diplomatist. It was he who, when negotiations for peace were opened between the port and Venice, undertook the office of mediator. All that the Signory got from the Triple Alliance was the momentary intoxication of the victory of Lepanto. After this, there was nothing but bitter disappointment. A commercial crisis had set in at Venice, paralyzing trade, greatly strengthening the party of peace, and limiting the enthusiasm for the war within ever narrower circles. The hope of securing a fairly favorable peace gained ground and took the place of the expectation of Spanish help, which had now quite died out. The Council of Ten, which until 1582 held in its hands all the threads of state affairs, authorized the Venetian bylo Marco Antonio Barbaro in September to enter into a negotiation for peace with the Grand Vizier, either directly or through the medium of the French ambassador, the Bishop of Axe. But he happened to be for some time absent from Constantinople, and the negotiation was at first carried on through the interpreter of the port, Oram Bey, and the Jewish physician of the Grand Vizier, Rabbi Solomon. A little later it was taken up by the Grand Vizier himself and the Bilo. The negotiation lasted more than three months, in spite of the fact that peace was desired on both sides, and that the relations of two negotiators, Mohammed Sokoli and Barbaro, were those of friendly intimacy, but at last, on March 7th, 1573, the matter was settled. The treaty, which was signed in Constantinople, sealed the cession of Cyprus to the Sultan. It further arranged that the Venetians should give back to the Turks the hill fort Sopoto near Corfu, which they had taken, that they should raise the tribute paid to the port for the possession of Zante from 1,000 to 1,500 ducats, and should pay 300,000 ducats as war indemnity. On the other hand, the treaties previously concluded were reconfirmed, and in regard to the delimitation of borders, the principle of the restoration of conquests on both sides, 
and of the re-establishment of the status quo ante was adopted. Even the Bishop of Acts, one of the authors of this piece, admitted in writing to Charles IX how very badly it had turned out. The seigneury had to accept it because they could not drive the Turks out of Cyprus, and had learnt by recent experience both that no reliance was to be placed on their allies, and that their own forces were insufficient for carrying on the war. Moreover, Mohammed Sokoli had, in the course of the negotiations, promised that he would try to help the Republic to some indemnification for the loss of Cyprus. In the third month after the conclusion of the peace, he began to prepare the way for the fulfillment of his promise. By his order, Rabbi Solomon and the interpreter of the port, Oram Bey, appeared before Barbaro and laid before him the proposal of a Turco-Venetian alliance. In the strength of such an alliance, the Republic might annex the Neapolitan kingdom, conquering it from Spain with the Sultan's help. The Bilo answered evasively, and when he had sent home information as to the situation, received instructions from the Council of Ten to decline all such proposals absolutely. But the Grand Vizier refused to let drop the design which he had conceived, though his first attempt to carry it out had been a failure. In the spring of the next year, he sent his confidential agent, the Rabbi Solomon, to Venice to lay the proposal for the Turco-Venetian alliance directly before the seigneury. The rabbi came with an authorization from the Grand Vizier, but according to a resolution of the Council of Ten, was recognized and treated as an ambassador of the Sultan. He brought a formal offer of the support of the whole Turkish power to the Republic if it would go to war with Spain. The seigneury, after four weeks of deliberation, thanked the sultan for his most friendly offer, but said that they could not undertake a new war, that they had been at peace with Spain for many years, and that they wished to maintain the peace, as they would faithfully maintain that which they had just concluded with the sultan. It was a refusal for the second time of the gift which Mohammed Sokoli had destined for the Republic. For such a renunciation, the seigneury had no lack of weighty reasons. Who could guarantee that the Turks, after expelling the Spaniards, would leave the Kingdom of Naples to Venice and not keep it themselves? From the Ottoman point of view, the scheme, as proposed by the Grand Vizier, lacked neither logical consistency nor grandeur of conception. It aimed at the infliction of a crushing blow on Spain, and though for the moment its realization was rendered impossible by the refusal of Venice to cooperate, a little later, and through a different channel, Mohammed Sokoli was still able to reach his foe. During the progress of the negotiations of the following year between the Prince of Orange and the Governor-General of Philip II in the Netherlands, the Grand Vizier sent a messenger to the former, urging him to withhold his consent from the agreement and assuring him that pressure would be brought to bear on Spain from the Ottoman side. When Philip, at the close of 1577, or opening of 1578, asked the port for an armistice, Mohammed Sokoli obstinately insisted that Orange should be included in it. To insist upon such a condition was, as he must have been aware, virtually a refusal of an armistice, since Philip would not accept the demand at any price. Thus, Mohammed Sokoli contributed his share to the support of the revolt of the Netherlands as an open sore in the Spanish body politic. Selim II died in December 1574. His love of pleasure, his idleness and drunkenness had to a certain extent been of use to the Grand Vizier, inasmuch as the Sultan, after he had, through the conquest of Cyprus, become the extender of the realm, amused himself in his seraglio and gave up the cares of state without any demur to Mohammed Sokoli. Under Selim's successor, Murad III, the situation was different. The new sultan indeed owed his peaceful accession to the Grand Vizier, who, however, remained to the last without the recompense due to him. Though it is true that Mohammed Sokoli kept the management of affairs in his hands till his death, the result of an outrage, in October 1579, he had a difficult position. His sworn enemies often found a hearing with the sultan, 
and their malicious whispers could only be kept from him by an unremitting care on the part of the Grand Vizier. With Mohammed Sokoli, says a Venetian ambassador, Turkish virtue sank into the grave. It would be far truer to say that with his death began the decline of Turkish power, a decline which after him other vigorous and highly gifted grand viziers, notably those of the Kuprili family in the 17th century, tried to check. But in spite of their efforts, the downward movement took its course and has continued to the present day. End of section 15. Recording by Tad Davis. Section 16 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 5. The Empire under Ferdinand I and Maximilian II by A. W. Ward, Part 1. The palpably incomplete and far from sincere settlement of the year 1555 between the Catholic and the Lutheran estates of the Empire, known as the Religious Peace of Augsburg, had not pretended to be more than a truce. It represented in no sense an attempt to efface religious differences by means of a compromise. The Catholicism, which the enthusiasm of cardinals and popes was, with the organized aid of the Jesuit and other orders, proceeding to reinvigorate, reconsolidate, regenerate, was not to be treated or bargained with, while among German Protestants reconciliation almost ceased even to be an ideal with the death of Melanchthon in 1560. On the other hand, the agreement reached at Augsburg did amount to a distinct understanding that, until some authoritative decision, whether proceeding from a general council or a national synod or an imperial diet, should have been accepted by Catholics and Lutherans alike, both sides should be at liberty to exercise the religion of their choice. The principle had now been clearly laid down that the final issue of a struggle between the two recognized religious parties in the empire must be determined by a mutual agreement between them, pending which the estates professing either form were equally to benefit by the institutions of the empire and to be protected by its common peace. The essence of the treaty lay in its adoption of the principle of parity between the two rival religious parties, a principle beyond which the horizon of the age in which the religious peace was concluded cannot be said to have extended. No doubt this fundamental principle would not have been conceded by the Catholics but for their apprehension that a fresh resort to arms would be likely to end to their disadvantage, and thus the whole agreement was, after all, but a concession to necessity, which a decisive change in the balance of power in the empire might at any time overthrow. The Protestant estates, for their part, cherished conceptions of their territorial authority which, should their power continue to grow, might lead to a complete exclusion of Catholicism from their dominions. The history of the empire during the two generations which intervened between the conclusion of a religious peace and the outbreak of a Thirty Years' War may be summarily described as a struggle between the religious parties for territorial predominance. Still, the guarantee of public law meant much even in this period of a dwindling imperial authority, and the degree of force attaching to it amidst fluid political surroundings remains a notable phenomenon. The misfortune was that the praiseworthy main principle of the religious peace was hedged round by restrictions materially impairing its value and, which was of even worse omen for the security of the empire, that rules and exceptions alike were enveloped by a haze of uncertainty, the result partly of timorousness and partly of design. In the first place, the Protestants benefiting from the religious peace were defined to be those who adhered to the Confession of Augsburg. Herein manifestly lay a twofold source of future discontents and troubles. For not only was Calvinism entirely excluded from the purview of a peace at a time when it permeated the western borders of the empire, from Switzerland to the Low Countries, and was on the eve of formal establishment within the empire itself, but further, the compact drew no distinction between the original form in which the Confession of Augsburg had, in 1530, been first presented, and the variations subsequently introduced into the Lutheran symbol by Melanchthon. 
Above all, the freedom of choice allowed by the religious peace was granted only to the estates of the empire, together with the knights, without being extended independently of their consent to their subjects. This memorable restriction inevitably had a different significance for each of the interests which it was intended to satisfy. The Protestant princes and governments regarded the Cuyus Regio principle as confirming the positive right assumed by them of establishing and administering territorial churches of their own. In the view of a Catholic, it corroborated their consistent claim to act as the suppressors of heresy in their dominions. But the terms of a religious peace concealed other shortcomings of a kind which in such documents are not always chargeable to incompetent draftsmanship. It was not made clear whether governments which set up Protestant churches after the Treaty of Passau in 1552 should be entitled to Protestantize or appropriate monastic or other Catholic ecclesiastical foundations. Again, in those imperial towns where both forms of religion were practiced, each party was to retain possession of its ecclesiastical property and rights in proportion to its relative numbers. As more than three score of such towns were to be found in Germany, and the bulk of them in the south, where the diversity of religious creed was greatest, a perennial source of discord was thus left open. But though this clause too was to be productive of much trouble, the chief impediment to the maintenance of the Augsburg Treaty lay elsewhere, namely in the so-called Reservatum Ecclesiasticum, which stipulated that a prelate renouncing Catholicism must at once resign his ecclesiastical office. This reservation had never been accepted by the Protestants and had in the end only been included in the peace as a proposition promulgated by imperial authority, reference being expressly made to the objection raised against it by them. Meanwhile, in return for their allowing the reservatum to be included in the settlement, the Protestants obtained the concession that nobles, towns and congregations in the territories of spiritual princes who had previously enjoyed the privilege of Protestant worship were to continue there to enjoy it, but this not even as part of the agreement, only as a special declaration which was not communicated to the Reichskammergericht as binding upon its procedure. So defective then, so waterlogged, and so directly provocative of controversy and conflict were the instrument and its supplements, which were supposed to regulate the relations between Catholic and the Protestant estates of the Empire during a period of unreconciled differences and of an accumulating pressure from both within and without against the maintenance of peace. There were, of course, on the other side, forces which resisted that pressure, and to which it was largely due that a renewed outbreak of a general religious conflict was so long postponed. The large and important middle party to which the conclusion of a treaty was mainly due was composed of both Catholic and Protestant estates, electoral Saxony forming its backbone, and both Mainz and Trier belonging to it. This party was held together, paradoxical as the statement may seem, by two mutually adverse impulses – the imperial and the territorial. A desire to maintain the authority of the empire and of its tribunals, natural to the long-enduring loyalty of many German princes and populations, cooperated with a consciousness among the most intelligent of the princes and their sagacious counsellors that the princely authority had never before taken a step in advance comparable in importance to the religious peace. And in this connection, it should not be forgotten that the Diet of 1555, which accepted the religious peace, also endeavoured to provide further guarantees for the maintenance of the general security of the empire, that Landfrieden on which its soundness as a political and social fabric depended. Many of the princely houses of this period were wanting neither in imperial sentiment nor in the consciousness that, as their feudal head, the emperor might in certain contingencies intervene very potently in their destinies, under Ferdinand I, and even under his successor, the cohesion of the empire as a united polity was still an object of practical politics, and the existing desire for union displayed itself incidentally in the adoption of such a measure as the Imperial Monetary Ordinance, Reichsminsordnung of 1559, however imperfectly this was carried into effect. On the other hand, the difficulties in the way of strengthening the principle of imperial union were considerable, quite apart from the cardinal religious difficulty. 
They were, of course, mainly due to the growth of a territorial power for princes who, everywhere, with the advice of the doctors learned in the Roman law, from whom their counsellors were in increasing numbers chosen, were elaborating and fortifying their administrative systems, establishing courts of appeal for themselves, and depressing an authority which had more than once held its own against theirs, that of the territorial estates, Landstände. Another difficulty was, however, to be found in the increasing unwieldiness of the Diet of the Empire. The political authority of the Emperor himself was now specially circumscribed by the means of a compact of election, Wahlkapitulation, which furnished the electors with an opportunity of securing to themselves a distinct preliminary control of the internal government of the Empire and of its foreign policy. But more than this, the emperor could not so much as convoke the Diet without having previously obtained the consent of the electors at a meeting of their body, Kurfürstentag. While the importance of this exclusive gathering necessarily rose with the advance of the territorial power of the several electors, the usefulness of the Diet for imperial purposes continued on the wane excepting always with regard to the grant of aid against the Turk, which still remained the one great chronic defensive need of the empire. Since the religious schism had ranged the political forces in the empire so distinctly under the heads of contending confessions, grievances drawn up for presentation at the Diet became, in effect, mere party manifestos, often arranged by the estates of each confession at meetings of their own. The abnormal dilatoriness of the imperial diet was in its turn attributable to the fact that the princes of the empire, swollen with a sense of their expanding political importance and consequently more and more disposed to determine for themselves the successive steps of their policy, as a rule abstained from personal attendance. Important questions could thus not be brought to an issue at the diets without a reference, and the amount of business left unfinished by them at their breaking up grew in proportion. This accumulation of arrears favoured the use of an expedient to which resort had been had already under Charles V, the so-called imperial deputations, Reichsdeputationstage, composed of a certain selection of estates, including all the electors except the King of Bohemia. When the estates of a single circle of the empire at their meeting, Kreistag, found their resources inadequate for armed action, they might appeal for aid to the two circles in their nearest vicinity, and these might in their turn call in the assistance of yet two other circles. If the combined forces of all the five were still insufficient, the Elector of Mainz might be called upon to summon a Reichsdeputationstag at Frankfurt. This body might bid all the ten circles of the Empire combine for the furnishing of military aid. But liberty was left to the deputation to refer the matter to the emperor, who would then have to fall back again upon the summons of a diet. These cumbrous devices made it difficult for the sectional group of estates, known to the constitution as circles of the empire, to protect themselves against disturbance from within or eruption from without by prompt and effective action, whether separate or combined, of their own. At the same time, the system of execution, Exekutionsordnung, now promulgated, put no stop upon voluntary alliances between estates, such as in one shape or another, could only with difficulty be prevented. Nor had the Diet of 1555 laid any restraint on the liberty, granted by its predecessor of 1495 to the estates, of concluding even foreign alliances, if these were not detrimental to the empire. The practice had really established itself from an earlier date, when these alliances had been in substance contracts for the hire of soldiery. Yet sooner or later, alliances formed within the empire must take the shape of organizations identified with one or other of the rival forms of religion, and the schemes and rumors of alliances with foreign powers, which never ceased to be rife, would, so soon as each side saw its opportunity, be translated into fact. Thus, in matters political as well as religious, the Augsburg settlement had left the door open through which the spirit of conflict must enter. Finally, it should be noted that, in conformity with the principles adopted in the religious peace and in the new Exekutionsordnung, the Diet of 1555 remodelled the chief permanent judicial tribunal in the Empire, and the only one of which the composition was determined in common by the Emperor and the Estates, the Reichskammergericht. 
Adherents of the Lutheran Confession, trained at Lutheran universities, now sat among its judges by the side of Catholic colleagues, though the principle of an actual numerical equality between them was not yet adopted, and the presiding judge continued to be always a Catholic. The Reichskammergericht was now empowered to regulate its own procedure by common decrees, Gemeine Bescheide, to which a binding force attached until they were revoked at an annual visitation by an imperial deputation. And in these visiting commissions also it was provided that the Lutherans should be regularly represented. Thus, in the judicial sphere, too, an advance had been made towards religious parity. From his own territorial dominions, Ferdinand I sought to exclude the influence of the Reichskammergericht so far as possible. Down to 1559, he had endeavoured to exercise supreme judicial power in the affairs of the empire, as well as in those of his own dominions, through the Aulic Council, Hofrat, established by Maximilian I., but in this year he deprived it of all territorial jurisdiction, so that it now became an imperial authority proper, Reichshofrat. The competence of this tribunal and of the emperor's ordinances concerning it was steadily denied by the estates, nor was it till the Peace of Westphalia that it received full recognition and became a permanent part of a constitution of the empire. In all these arrangements and rearrangements, the Emperor Charles V had no hand. He had never understood the German Reformation and its adherents, whom, after the Schmalkaldic War, he described as ad gremium ecclesiae rediuntes, and he showed his disapproval of a principle of a religious peace by holding entirely aloof from the negotiations for its conclusion. From 1553 onwards, he had really transferred his responsibility as emperor to his brother Ferdinand, whose election as Roman king had taken place in 1531, and his formal abdication of the imperial throne followed in 1558. The aged Pope Paul IV, 1555-9, was at the same time able to give expression to his detestation of a compact with the heretics by refusing to acknowledge the accession of a prince of the detested House of Habsburg, who had materially contributed to its conclusion. But Paul's successor, Pius IV, 1559-65, immediately recognized the new emperor, who in his turn promised the traditional obedience to the Holy See. Already before his actual accession to the imperial dignity, Ferdinand had proved himself a prince of a truly politic cast of mind, who, though without constructive genius, as indeed the religious piece itself showed, possessed a remarkable capacity for learning the lessons to be drawn from facts. Curiously enough, while the elder brother who had passed the first 17 years of his life in the Netherlands had never entered into German ways of life and thought, the younger, born and educated in Spain, proved capable of accommodating his own political action to the demands of his position at the head of the German nation. No doubt the relations between him and the Germans had been drawn closer by the attempt of Charles V to secure the succession in the empire after Ferdinand to his own son Philip, although Ferdinand's son Maximilian, the consort of Charles V's daughter Maria, had been already acknowledged as successor to the Bohemian crown. Though Ferdinand had been obliged in 1551 to promise his support to the scheme, in his heart he rejoiced at its frustration, to which he had very possibly himself contributed. If he never became quite a German, either in mind or in speech, there could be no doubt as to his desire for peace and for the maintenance of law and order. And even as to the all-dominating question of religion, he bore himself alike with sincerity and with moderation. In his public acts, as well as in his private life, he showed himself a good Catholic, and his desire to strengthen the Church by means of an inner purification was beyond doubt the motive with which he introduced the Jesuits into all his lands. Nor was the policy pursued by him in the closing years of the Council of Trent, 1561-3, to inconsistent with this purpose. He not only asked from the Council concessions as to disputed points of practice, conceived in the broad and generous spirit of the Erasmian fluke, but laid before it proposals for practical reforms which would have increased the popular influence of the Church in Germany, and have led both to the advance of education and to the improvement of a condition of the poor. In his personal relations, he came to show a remarkably tolerant spirit and even admitted Lutherans as members of his court and household without appearing to take any notice of their religious profession. 
All that he demanded from those around him was purity of morals, of which, different in this respect also from his more famous brother, he set an admirable example in his happy family life. Such was the good will conciliated by the mildness of his disposition, the probity of his conduct, and the trustworthiness of his character, that when his end drew near a Venetian ambassador foretold that it would be saddening to every one. Before Ferdinand had formally taken on himself the burden of imperial responsibility, another Venetian report had described him as loved but not feared by some of the races over which he ruled, feared but not loved by others, and by the Hungarians neither loved nor feared. Of Hungary he never, except for a brief period immediately after his coronation as king in 1527, had under his sway more than a fragment. His vanquished Transylvanian opponent, the so-called national king, John Zapolya, became a vassal of Sultan Solomon II, who refused his assent to the pacification between the two rivals, and in 1541, the year following that of Zapolya's death, there set in the era of Turkish dominion, which continued for nearly a century and a half. During all these years, whether they were accounted years of war or of peace, Hungary remained the battleground of the powers which, in the course of their unceasing strife for its possession, were constantly shifting their relative positions. Almost throughout Ferdinand's public life the Turkish peril and the necessity of defending the portion of Hungary held by him as the bulwark of the Austrian lands and of Germany at large preoccupied him in council and in diet. The estates of the empire took the danger more coolly. Hungary formed no part of the empire, and they usually measured the sacrifices which they were prepared to make accordingly. In his own dominions, where Ferdinand did his best to establish a uniform taxation for their defense, his whole system of expenditure was clogged by the perennial Turkish warfare. He could collect military forces for no other purpose, nor spend money upon necessary diplomatic agencies. It was not till 1562, two years before his death, that he seemed at last to have reached an actual breathing time in his relations with the Ottoman power by the conclusion of a peace for eight years. As a matter of fact, it only lasted four, containing the customary humiliating condition of a payment of an annual tribute to the Sultan. At the close of the 16th century, the king was master of less than a quarter of the whole former Magyar kingdom and its dependencies, while more than one-third of it was under direct Turkish rule and nearly two-fifths subject to the sultan's vassal, the voivode of Transylvania. Besides suffering from the social disorder and distress inseparable from the periodical inroads of a foe intent above all upon the rape of human beings for his military service and his harems, the royal portion of Hungary remained during Ferdinand's reign politically unsettled. He was never able, even when in 1563 he at last obtained the coronation of his son Maximilian as his successor on the throne, to secure a recognition of the claim of his dynasty to the right of hereditary succession. On the other hand, he at least asserted the principle that the administration of a kingdom should, in the absence of the king, be in the hands of a governor appointed by himself, and not in those of a palatine elected by the Diet. In Hungary, as elsewhere, Ferdinand's internal difficulties centred in his relations to the estates, and nowhere were they more intensified by the question of religion. The Lutheran Reformation had rapidly penetrated into both Transylvania and Hungary proper, establishing an ecclesiastical organization of its own in the former in 1545 and in the latter in 1550. The Calvinist form, too, of a reformed religion had already spread by the side of a Lutheran. It was formally organized in Transylvania in the year of Ferdinand's death and in Hungary proper two years later. During the whole of his reign, Protestantism advanced unchecked in both countries, nor was it till a few years after his decease that a successful effort was made in Hungary by the Catholic reaction to arrest this progress. In Bohemia, while King Ferdinand was chiefly engaged in defending Hungary and Austria against the Turks, the Diets were likewise largely occupied with religious questions. Lutheran doctrines had continuously spread among the Utraquists, and the Bohemian Brethren too, a relic of a sectarian life of earlier centuries, revived in the early years of the 16th, had discovered and openly avowed their near affinities to Lutheranism. 
Thus, when the Schmalkaldic War broke out, the Bohemian estates were most unwilling to grant aid to the king in furtherance of the imperial policy, and a serious constitutional conflict ensued. The stern reassertion of a royal authority at the Bloody Diet of August 1547 ushered in a period of deceptive tranquillity. The estates consented to acknowledge Ferdinand's son, Maximilian, as heir and successor to the throne, provided that during his father's tenure of it, he took no part in the affairs of a realm, February 1549. But they could not be induced to restore to the churches and convents the lands of which a long process of secularization had deprived them, and the conflict of religious beliefs remained unextinguished. The accession of Ferdinand as emperor led to no material change in the affairs of Bohemia, though his firm and conciliatory conduct of them helped to strengthen his authority. In 1562, the estates agreed to the coronation of Maximilian and his Spanish consort, the ceremony being performed by the newly appointed Archbishop of Prague, Anton Brus, whose office had remained vacant for a century and a quarter, while nearly all the landed property attached to it had long been dispersed into secular hands. The efforts of this prelate and his colleagues at the Council of Trent were steadily directed to obtaining for the Emperor's Bohemian subjects the concession of the cup, by means of which he still hoped to bring about a reunion of Utraquists and Catholics. In the last year of Ferdinand's life, after an elaborate inquiry, this concession was granted to Bohemia, as well as to certain other parts of the empire, by Pope Pius IV, and from this time forward, the cup, to the Bohemians, a symbol of high national as well as religious significance, was in that country denied to the demand of neither Catholic nor Utraquist, even in the Jesuit churches. Yet Ferdinand gave a steady support to the work carried on in Bohemia by the Catholic reaction. The Jesuits, with Canisius at their head, found their way to Prague as early as 1555, and their college, established here in the following year, became a permanent nucleus of their indefatigable propaganda and a rival to the Utraquist University, where many of the professors were more or less openly Lutherans. Some years earlier, the administrative instincts of Ferdinand had provided the means of checking heterodox publications by the institution of a censorship. The most promising field of operations for Ferdinand's centralizing policy might have seemed to be the five duchies of Upper and Lower Austria, Styria, Carinthia and Carniola, with their dependencies, but the Turkish wars and the absorption of his chief administrative energies in the provision of means for their prosecution made it impossible for him to organize effectively the government of his hereditary dominions or to develop their economical resources. Still, he never lost sight of his purpose. In 1556, he succeeded in assembling a committee of the Diets of the Five Duchies, and in the same year he instituted a permanent military council, Hofkriegsrat, distinct from that charged with the general affairs of his dominions, Hofrat. In religious matters, the general drift of opinion and sentiment was at least as antagonistic to Ferdinand's own in Austria as it was in Bohemia and Hungary. To the ecclesiastical grievances reiterated by the Austrian estates at their combined diets from 1530 onwards, and to the open demand in 1541 of nobility and towns for the free exercise of a form of faith virtually corresponding to the Augsburg Confession, Ferdinand had declined to yield. But he was gradually coming to recognize that the pressure was irresistible. During the whole of the latter half of his period of rule, and indeed for some time before, the nobility and the towns assumed not only the ordinary exercise of church patronage, but also the general control of church revenues. Admittance into the Austrian dominions was freely granted to a strange mixture of doctrinal teaching, and not only was the use of the cup by the laity authoritatively permitted to the Austrian estates, 1555-6, to some years before this concession was approved by papal decision, 1564, but the marriage of the clergy was allowed as an ordinary practice. Throughout the Austrian territories, as with perhaps rather more of restraint in neighbouring Bavaria, there ensued, together with a chaotic fluidity of religious beliefs and an anarchy in the forms of religious worship, a relaxation of social order and moral discipline among both clergy and laity. 
It was, therefore, in the true spirit of a Catholic reform that, as has been seen in an earlier passage of this work, Ferdinand, in 1552, the year of a foundation of the Collegium Germanicum in Rome, summoned from Ingolstadt the Dutch Jesuit Canisius, Peter Canis, and his companion, Gudanus, and, after a year's residence, incorporated them in the University of Vienna, where Lutheran sympathies had hitherto prevailed. The plain and popular vein to which Luther himself owed so much of his power was not wanting in Canisius, but with an eloquence that secured to him the goodwill of large audiences in Vienna and elsewhere in the Austrian duchies, he combined a singular aptitude for influencing the cautious mind and balanced judgment of their ruler. During his later years, Ferdinand confided in Canisius as his chief adviser in matters of religion and gave a ready support to the revival brought about in the ecclesiastical and more especially in the educational life of the Austrian populations by the great Jesuits' indefatigable labours. His efforts as missionary and provincial must be reckoned among the forces making against a permanent reconciliation of the contending religious parties and interests in the empire, or even a prolonged truce between them. Such, then, were some of the elements in the personal action of Ferdinand I, and in his relations as a territorial ruler to the problems which largely occupied the empire during his reign, and in particular to the religious difficulty which went near to swallowing up all the rest. As yet, during Ferdinand I's tenure of a weakened imperial authority, there seemed some prospect of a settlement of questions arising out of religious peace within the limits of the empire by its own reorganized machinery and exclusively in the interests of itself or its members. This prospect grew less hopeful already during the reign of Ferdinand I's son, Maximilian II, and before the two decades or thereabouts with which this chapter is concerned had actually come to an end, the religious struggle in Europe at large was already approaching its acutest and intensest phase, in which the empire was no longer to retain the control of its own destinies. End of section 16「Section 17 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter 5. The Empire under Ferdinand I and Maximilian the Second by A. W. Ward, Part Two. In the first instance, then, the progress of the religious struggle, or the arresting of that progress, must depend upon the distribution of political power and influence among the more important princes and other estates of the empire and upon the attitude taken up by them individually in matters ecclesiastical. Of the four temporal electors, the emperor, as king of Bohemia, was the only Catholic. Of the three Protestant, the most important was the elector Augustus of Saxony, Morris's brother, to whose calculated conservatism, more than to any other cause, was due the maintenance of the provisional settlement in the empire. A powerful secret motive of the second Albertine elector's loyalty was no doubt the possibility of the restoration, by an emperor ill-disposed towards him, of the Ernestine branch of the House of Wettin. During the whole of his long rule, 1553-86, to 86, he was steadily intent upon the increase and consolidation of his territorial power. Although he took a personal interest in religious controversy, both his action in the affairs of the empire and his abstinence from any attempt to further the progress of Protestantism beyond its borders show how, among the German Lutheran princes, territorial considerations were already beginning to overpower those of religion. Though he had some learning, the humanistic influences which had still been strong with his elder brother were in Augustus and his Danish consort Anna, 
a very Martha among princesses, exchanged for a beneficent care for the organization of the material resources of his electorate. For the rest, while he was careful to observe the principles of Roman law in dealing with the affairs of his subjects, he closely adhered to Germanic, i.e. feudal, usage in the maintenance of his princely rights and customs. In his religious beliefs, Augustus of Saxony was a convinced Lutheran, but not at first of a rigid caste. So long as Melanchthon lived, the elector was ready to follow his elastic teaching, and the Corpus Misniacum, 1559, was compiled in this sense. At a later time he changed his dogmatic standpoint, but under Ferdinand I, and nearly to the close of the reign of Maximilian II, Augustus favoured moderate Lutheran views, such as did not wholly preclude an understanding between the two main divisions of German Protestantism. Herein, again, he was influenced by the strongly marked views and conduct of the head of the Ernestine branch of the Saxon house. In 1557, Duke John Frederick summoned to the Ernestine University of Jena, and at the same time to the chief supervision of the Thuringian Church, the foremost teacher among the rigidly orthodox Lutherans, Matthäus Flaccius, called from his place of birth Illyricus. Not less vigorous than voluminous as a controversialist, Flaccius was no doubt sustained by the conviction that he was a combatant for the truth, in face of which there are no adiaphora, and to him is largely to be ascribed the position of absolute intransigency which Lutheranism assumed alike towards Rome and towards Geneva, and to any form of dogma not distinctly averse to Calvinistic conceptions and more especially between their respective chiefs, was by the restless energy of a revengeful and ambitious intriguer fanned into a flame which long menaced the peace of the empire. In their origin, the so-called Grumbach quarrels, Grumbachsche Händel, are significant of the bitter jealousy still animating the nobility, and in Franconia, where Wilhelm von Grumbach was at home, the knights against the growth of the power of the territorial princes. Grumbach had a long-standing quarrel with the Bishop of Würzburg, Melchior von Zobel, whose election he had on a former occasion thwarted, and who, in the end, after the outlawry of the truculent condottiore Margrave Albert Alcibiades of brandenburg kulmbach had as territorial prince seized his follower Grumbach's estates. It was at this time, in 1557, that Grumbach found a new patron in the dissatisfied John Frederick at Gotha, and in 1558 he carried out a long-meditated raid upon the Bishop of Würzburg, who was killed in the fray. In the same year Grumbach, not content with John Frederick's protection, entered into the military service of the French crown, and began to busy himself with concocting schemes both against the new Bishop of Würzburg and for supplanting Augustus as elector by the Ernestine Duke, and Augustus' brother-in-law, King Frederick II of Denmark, by Duke Adolphus of Holstein. In accordance with the gross superstition of the age, which the Lutheran Reformation had by no means eradicated, magical charms were directed by Grumbach and his patron, against the lives of the elector Augustus, the Bishop of Würzburg, and the Emperor, and a Gotha peasant boy as seer regularly reported angelic communications. 
In obedience to one of these, Würzburg was attacked and taken by the Confederates, and the restoration and augmentation of Grumbach's estates forced upon the chapter whose consent the bishop had to confirm, 1563. At last the emperor intervened by placing Grumbach under the ban of the empire, but neither the calling of a deputationstag nor the emperor's injunction to John Frederick to renounce the protection of Grumbach was of avail. On the other hand, the attempt of the Franconian knights to use the occasion for pressing their grievances came to nothing, though the Swabian knights were inclined to follow suit, and the Württemberg government called a conference of Palatine, Bavarian, and Baden councillors to Maulbronn to join in preventive measures. 1564. Yet when, at this time, Maximilian came to the throne, John Frederick and his protégé were still residing unhurt at Gotha, where the latter was spinning fresh webs, designed to entangle Frederick II of Denmark in northern complications, and to isolate the arch-foe, the elector Augustus. Grumbach's schemes grew wilder as they expanded, and the imperial crown itself was promised to his Ernestine patron in a vision. Thus, the new emperor was induced by Augustus to renew the ban of the empire against Grumbach and pronounce it upon John Frederick, and, after in vain looking for assistance to the Franconian nobility and knights, to Brandenburg, to the Scandinavian north, to France, and even, it was said, to the Netherlands, the ill-starred pair were at last, early in 1567, run to earth by Augustus of Saxony, at the head of an executive army of some sixteen thousand men. Gotha capitulated on April 15. Grumbach was drawn and quartered in the marketplace, and John Frederick passed into imprisonment in Austria, where he died in 1595. Vengeance descended on all who had had a share in Grumbach's schemes. While the Ernestine lands were repartitioned for the benefit of John Frederick's brother, John William. The entire story, which occupied contemporary attention to an extraordinary extent, casts a lurid light upon the insecurity of the institutions of the empire at the time when the principle of territorial sovereignty was establishing itself there with sober but ruthless persistency. The victory of the elector Augustus and his ally the bishop of Würzburg redounded entirely to the advantage of that principle, and had no concern with the religious question. In the period following upon the promulgation of the religious peace, Augustus is found steadily opposed to any tampering with its provisions, though unwilling to join in efforts to extend the Protestant sphere of influence. At first he took a leading part in the movement for the cancelling of the objectionable Reservatum Ecclesiasticum, but he failed to maintain this opposition with his habitual tenacity. At the same time, he acted with promptitude and decision where the episcopal authority came into contact with his own. His territories surrounded the seas of Meissen, Merseburg, and Naumburg on all sides, and in 1555 he took advantage of a vacancy in the See of Meissen to introduce a bishop of yielding disposition and Protestant tendencies. At Merseburg in 1561 an obedient majority of the chapter postulated the elector's son Alexander, then eight years of age, as their bishop and in the absence of a papal confirmation the father carried on the administration of the diocese in the child's name. Finally, on the death of the wise Erasmian bishop Julius Pflug of Naumburg in 1564,
the chapter there was constrained to postulate the same prince, and after his death in the following year both chapters committed the administration of their respective sees to the elector. On the resignation of the Bishop of Meissen the same course was pursued, and before he died the elector might deem himself completely master in what he regarded as his own house. The elector Joachim II of Brandenburg, 1535-71, to 71, was in complete accord with the settlement of the religious peace, and though in a more or less timorous fashion, may be said to have generally seconded the policy of his Saxon neighbour. He had admitted the Reformation into his lands without precipitancy, and in no spirit of animosity against Rome. He simply felt, as had his uncle, the Cardinal Archbishop Albert of Mainz, who also held the sees of Magdeburg and Halberstadt, that the current was not to be resisted. The religious change by no means impaired his loyalty to the Emperor. He held back from the League of Schmalkalden, and after the religious peace, he at first took no part in the consultations among the Protestant estates, while there was much mutual goodwill between him and the Emperors Ferdinand and Maximilian. But the question of his territorial power was with him too paramount. In the case of the sees of Brandenburg, Havelberg, and Liebes, the electoral house had long assumed the right of nominating their bishops, and here no voice was raised for the reservatum ecclesiasticum. But Joachim was also determined that the great archbishopric of Magdeburg and the bishopric of Halberstadt, whose occupants sat among the princes of the empire at the Diet, should be permanently in the hands of his house. Fortunately for this purpose, there had been no difficulty in securing from the more than half Protestant chapters the election of Joachim's second son Frederick to both sees, and on his death soon afterwards, in 1552, the third son Sigismund succeeded in his stead. Under him both Magdeburg and Halberstadt were effectually Protestantized, 1561-3 but, on the pretense that the convents in these dioceses had remained Catholic, a conflict with the Reservatum Ecclesiasticum was outwardly avoided. On the directly contrary plea that the provision was inapplicable to a see which had been Protestant long before his election, Joachim II's grandson, Joachim Frederick, held the archbishopric from Sigismund's death in 1566 till his own accession to the electorate in 1598, while Halberstadt was made over to the infant prince Henry Julius of brunswick wolfenbüttel in his religious opinions the elector Joachim II was inclined to a moderate Lutheranism. His able chief counsellor Lampert Distelmeyer had himself formerly been a pupil of Melanchthon. In the remote duchy of East Prussia, the Reformation passed through more violent vicissitudes. In 1549, Duke Albert had brought his favourite teacher, Osiander, Andreas Horseman, into his secularised duchy, where, in defiance of the orthodox Lutheranism of his subjects, and of the University of Königsberg in particular, this theologian expanded his mystic deviations from the cardinal dogma of justification by faith. The resistance to these innovations, combined with the bitter jealousy of the Prussian nobility against the ducal government, caused a popular agitation to be savagely stirred up, and the Osiandrists were excluded from the sacraments. 
After Osiander's death in 1552, a still stronger hatred accumulated itself against his associate Johann Funk, the ducal confessor, who with his camarilla was believed to control the duke and his duchess with the aid of her treasurer, a charlatan named Scalich. Funk, who had caused the removal of the exorcising passages from the baptismal service, was charged with Calvinism, and the nobility once more took advantage of the fanatical excitement of the people. In October 1566, Funk, amidst popular rejoicings, suffered the penalty of death in the marketplace at Königsberg. A strict Lutheran formula of belief was promulgated as binding on all holders of offices, whether temporal or spiritual, in the duchy and the privileges of the nobility were reconfirmed. The episode, one of the earliest to mark the depth of the fissures in German Protestantism, went to the heart of the prince, who had introduced the Reformation into Prussia, and there was some colour for the fiction that he died a Catholic. 1568. The territorial power of the Elector Palatine was inferior to that of the Elector of Saxony, and even more to that of the Elector of Brandenburg, although he enjoyed precedence over both. But the aspirations of the rulers of the western border state already took a far wider range than those of their fellow electors. The Reformation had been definitely introduced into the Palatinate by the Elector Otto Henry, 1556-9, to nine. but this prince, memorable for his scholarly and artistic interests and achievements, steadily adhered to the Augsburg Confession in its original form. It was not till with his death the electorate passed to the Simon line that its rulers began to identify themselves with advanced and militant Protestantism. Otto Henry had, for the sake of his cherished University of Heidelberg, cultivated relations with Switzerland and France, and had lent an ear to the proposals of his near neighbour, Duke Christopher of Württemberg, for the formation of a union of the Protestant estates. A wholly new life was brought both into the internal government of the Palatinate and into its foreign relations by Frederick the Third, fifteen fifty nine to seventy six, whose mind was in a gross age steadfastly set on spiritual things. After beginning with the reform of the administrative system of the Palatinate, he proceeded to the work of the establishment of Calvinism, which may be said to have been accomplished by fifteen sixty four. In this year, the Ecclesiastical Council, consisting of three clerical and three lay members, was set up as the chief authority of the Palatinate Church, and under it the presbyteries began to administer the ecclesiastical discipline of the land. Often, no doubt, they displayed a spirit of intolerance that was vainly resisted by a high-minded member of the Council, Thomas Erastus, Liber. In the same year, 1564, was promulgated the so-called Heidelberg Catechism, of which the joint authors were Olivian, a native of Trier, brought up in France, and Ursinus, Beer, a pupil of Melanchthon. In this document, the doctrine of the Eucharist was distinctly formulated in the spirit of pure Calvinism. This open establishment of a form of belief and worship, abhorred by both Catholics and Lutherans, called forth a formidable array of adversaries. A pertinacious resistance to these religious innovations was offered in the Upper Palatinate, where the autonomous pretensions of the nobility and towns cooperated with the convinced Lutheranism of the governor, the electoral Prince Louis. The Lutheran princes in the vicinity of the Palatinate raised an angry protest, and Pope Pius IV 
pressed upon the emperor the necessity of active measures against this sectarian reform. But Frederick III stood firm, adhering with immovable fidelity to his position. Compromise in any direction was impossible to his nature. The Catholics in the Palatinate were only tolerated so long as they refrained from the public exercise of their religion. But he permitted no deviation into heresies outside his symbol, and an Arian movement which arose in the Palatinate was, with his approval, ruthlessly repressed. In accordance with the spirit of the Calvinistic Reformation of Frederick III, perhaps also with the impersonal character of the Palatine government in this new stage of its history, he paid comparatively little attention to the augmentation of the territorial power of his dynasty. The seas around were in any case too firmly in Catholic hands to be within reach of princely ambition. The convents, however, hitherto under the control of these sees, and very numerous here on both sides of the Rhine, were unsparingly appropriated, but their revenues were mainly devoted to the purposes of church and schools. The religious isolation of the Palatinate, together with the positive spirit of a religious propaganda which animated the elector and his councillors, made it inevitable that they should be intent upon the formation of foreign alliances. So early as 1562, Frederick III had offered a new home at Frankenthal to sixty refugee Calvinist families from the Netherlands. In the same year, Condé is found in active correspondence with the elector. The way was already opening before the Palatine House, which was to divert it further and further from its allegiance to a Catholic emperor. The three spiritual electors in Ferdinand's reign could hardly be said to hold the balance against the three Protestants among the temporal. Though none of them had as yet thought of defection from the Church of Rome, only one of their number, the least important in power or authority, strenuously upheld her interests. This was the elector of Trier, Archbishop John von der Leyen, 1556-67, who, in 1559, had to quit his capital, where, in consequence chiefly of the teaching of Olivian, the followers of the Reformation were in the ascendant. Though he soon made his way back by force, and hereupon with Jesuit help, for Canisius had, in 1565-6, to appeared in these parts to urge the execution of the Tridentine decrees, imposed a counter-reformation upon his subjects. It was only under his successor, Archbishop Jacob von Eltz, 1567-81, to that the old order of things was restored. The elector of Mainz, Archbishop Daniel Brendel von Homburg, 1555-82, only gradually made head against the influences adverse to Rome, by which he found himself surrounded both at his court and in his chapter. In time he too made effective use of the aid of the Jesuits, whom he established in colleges both at Mainz and at Heiligenstadt. But the general bent of his policy was not aggressive, and he might be reckoned as of the middle party in the empire. Finally, Count Anton von Schauenburg, 1556-8, to and Count Gebhard von Mansfeld, 1558-62, to who in succession held the archbishopric and electorate of Cologne, were with more or less of reason supposed actually to incline to Lutheranism. Gebhard's successor, Count Frederick von Wied, 1562-7, to a member of the family to which the former Archbishop Hermann had belonged, 
openly refused acceptance of the Tridentine decrees, and the papal confirmation was in consequence refused to him. His broken fortunes and shattered health, in combination with his impotence as a ruler, held <coughs> led to his resignation, 1567. His place was taken by Count Selantin von Eisenburg, whose more vigorous but pacific rule was ten years later to have a similar ending. While the electors were thus divided in opinions and sympathies, although the prevailing tendency in their lands was almost uniformly towards Protestantism, except where its advance was arrested by a reactionary propaganda, such was even more notably the case in the dominions of the princes of the empire. In the whole of northern Germany, indeed, only one princely house had a Catholic head. But the Catholicism of Ferdinand's son-in-law, Duke William, 1539-92, to 92, who united in his hands the inheritances of Cleves, Mark, Ravensberg, Berg, and Jülich, remained of a singularly tempered, ironic type, until in the latter part of Maximilian's reign the collapse of the Duke's mental powers, combined with the progress of the conflict in the Netherlands to favour an almost complete Catholic reaction. Thus, at all events, the outward cohesion was not broken among the states composing that great Catholic group, which, in the northwest of the empire, occupied a position of so much significance for both its religious and its political future. Besides the Ulich Cleves duchies, this group of territories comprised the three spiritual electorates, and the imperial towns of Aachen and Cologne, the solitary examples of their class, which remained altogether Catholic, although in the former a violent expurgation of town council and municipal officers had to be effected so early as 1560, together with the Westphalian sees of Münster, Osnabrück, and Paderborn, united under one bishop from 1566 to 1574, and the Rhenish sees of Worms and Speyer. With the exception of Jülich Cleves, the princely houses of northern Germany were either entirely or mainly Lutheran. Of the four principal lines into which the house of Brunswick-Lüneburg were divided, two were Protestant and two Catholic, but one of the latter was on the eve of extinction, and in the other the brunswick wolfenbüttel line, violently hostile to the Reformation, a change accompanied the accession of Duke Julius in 1568. His son, the Emperor Rudolf's faithful adherent, Duke Henry Julius, was a typical later example of Lutheran imperialism, and even the Catholic Duke Henry the Younger had been obliged to grant to his subjects the communion sub utraque, he had lived long enough to help to establish Bishop Burkhard von Oberberg in the diminished see of Hildesheim, which, after being for a few years subject to the unconsecrated sway of Duke Frederick of Holstein, now, 1557-73, to 73, stood out as the solitary, really Catholic see in northern Germany, but was administered on tolerant principles. Between the houses of Brunswick Lüneburg, Saxe Lauenburg, and Holstein, of which last the elder branch was represented on the Danish throne by King Frederick the Second, the great northern archbishopric of Bremen, and the neighbouring bishoprics of Verden and Lübeck, could not but forfeit their ecclesiastical independence. Under Archbishop George, the Catholic Duke Henry of Brunswick's brother, who was also Bishop of Verden and Minden, Bremen and the adjoining sees were all but wholly Protestantized. 
and after his death, in 1566, Bremen, and in 1574, Paderborn and Osnabrück, passed into the hands of Henry of Saxe Lauenburg, who, though a trimmer, professed adherence to the Augsburg Confession. The Lübeck chapter, though still Catholic, in 1561 accepted Frederick II's nomination of a virtually Protestant bishop. So again the Dukes of Mecklenburg, to all intents and purposes, secularised as well as Protestantized the sees of Schwerin and Ratzeburg, and the Pomeranian Dukes that of Kamin. In the borderlands of northern and southern Germany, the most important princely house was the Hessian, of which old Landgrave Philip remained the head till his death in 1567, nearly twenty years after he had become the prisoner of Charles V. He was indisputably the most far-sighted of the German Protestant princes of the Reformation age and the real originator of the aggressive policy based on the use of opportunities arising outside the empire. But the time had not arrived for realising the conception of a wide Protestant alliance of the princes of Western Germany with France and England, which his indomitable spirit formed in the last years of his life, and towards which, at the close of Ferdinand's reign, he actually took preliminary steps. The fourfold partition of his territories, ordered by him in his last will, was to exemplify the disastrous dynastic effects of the old Germanic system of subdivision. But his spirit was to survive in the eldest, or Kassel, line of the Hessian landgraves, in the matter of the exercise of religion, Philip, to whose private faults his public greatness may make us a little blind, showed a large-minded and at the same time politic tolerance, which recalls that of William the Silent. The head of the German branch of the House of Nassau, Duke John of nassau dillenburg though not himself inclining to the tenets of the Calvinists, regarded them as an organic portion of the Protestant body, and from an early date, 1566, identified himself with the movement in the Netherlands headed by his brothers William and Lewis. The actual establishment of Calvinism in hesse Kassel belongs to a later date, 1605. In the immediate neighbourhood of the dominions of the bellicose landgrave of Hesse lay those of the prince abbots of Fulda, who took precedence over all other abbots in the empire, and who, through eight centuries, had continued to increase their wealth and maintain a high position among its princes. But even they had not been able to resist the current of religious change, and under six abbots, who followed on one another in more or less rapid succession, 1529 to 70, Protestantism spread without much let or hindrance. It was not until 1573 that, as we shall see, the Counter-Reformation found an anchorage in Fulda. In the German South, the balance of strength between the religious parties in this period was by no means so decided as it was in the north, though here also, besides the House of Austria, only a single dynasty consistently adhered to the Church of Rome. In the southwest lay the large majority of the imperial towns, nearly all more or less Protestant, even at Augsburg the Catholics were in a minority and necessarily forming points to which a Protestant propaganda could most easily attach itself. Of the immediate nobility, too, whose representatives sat on the four counts' benches in the Diet, the Swabian and Franconian counts, and those of the Wetterau, north of Frankfurt, were, like the knights, mainly Protestant, though their interests were directly opposed to the territorial aggrandizement of the princes. 
the great bishoprics of the south, Würzburg, Ratisbon, Passau, Salzburg, might seem so many fastnesses of the Catholic Church, and even in the case of Strasbourg, while the imperial city, after joining in the full flood of the Protestant advance, had in 1532 formally adopted the Augsburg Confession, the bishops of the diocese had steadfastly maintained their allegiance to Rome. Bishop Erasmus, a count of Limburg, 1541-68, to 68, who did honour to his name by the moderation of his conduct both at Trent and at home in his see, was, however, no better able to secure the continuance of Catholic worship, either in the city at large or in its minster, than was his successor, Count John Zumanderscheid, by means of his more vigorous rule. It was inevitable that Catholicism should fare no better in the Swabian towns, among which Ulm, as usual, took the lead, although their oligarchical councils were in sympathy with the old order of things. For Duke Christopher of Württemberg, 1550-68, to whose territorial power pressed upon them, was, after his neighbour the elector Palatine, the foremost among the Protestant princes of the West and South. The abnormally numerous convents within his territories, especially the fourteen great abbesses, were reformed in 1556, their revenues being seized by his government. But, as the constitution of Württemberg gave the controlling power over its finances to the estates, these revenues were managed by committees practically representing the Lutheran clergy and the towns, and were appropriated by them to educational purposes, above all to those of the University of Tübingen. Thus the Protestant Church, which, in 1565, the Württemberg Diet declared the sole church of the land, was here even more decisively than in the Palatinate, established on a broad basis of stability. Unfortunately, however, on the question of dogma, the Palatinate and Württemberg soon found themselves widely asunder, for Duke Christopher, a prince of high character and ability, was a rigid Lutheran, and at one time advocated the exclusion of his Calvinist neighbour from the benefits of the religious peace. This strong dogmatic difference seems not to have remained without influence upon his relations with foreign powers and parties, with France in particular, which for the most part were far more pacific in their tendency than those of the Palatinate government. While to the west of Christopher's dominions lay those of the Elector Palatine and of the Baden Margraves, in whose Protestant partisanship the Counter-Reformation had not yet made a breach. His eastern neighbour was the prince whose house was under him first to become the mainstay of Catholicism in southern Germany. Duke Albert V of Bavaria, 1550-79, to united in his hands the whole of the dominions of both the Bavarian lines, Munich and Landschut and his long reign, during the whole of which he had by his side his consort Anna, daughter of the Emperor Ferdinand, was marked by unbroken vigour of purpose and conduct. No contemporary sovereign showed a stronger determination than he of putting into practice the principle of the religious peace, that each territorial prince should direct and control the religious faith of his subjects and its exercise. A spirit of revolt against the existing church had first shown itself at the Landschut Diet in 1553, when the nobility put in the forefront a complaint as to the disciplinary and moral decadence of the clergy. At the Munich Diet in 1556, the temporal estates decisively combined with this grievance 
positive demands for the concession of the cup in the sacrament, and the relaxation of the obligations of fasting. The Duke had to give way on these latter points, though maintaining the Catholic use at his court, but with regard to the general condition of the clergy and its ministrations, an anarchy ensued almost as intolerable as that prevailing on the other side of the Austrian frontier. It is noticeable that to this period belongs the conclusion of the so-called Landsberg League between the Emperor Ferdinand and the neighbouring Catholic potentates of Bavaria, Salzburg, and Augsburg, June 1558. The Bavarian nobility continued their demands, which included the right of marriage for priests at the Ingolstadt Diet of 1563, and soon afterwards, April 1564, the papal brief arrived which here, as elsewhere, under certain conditions, permitted communion in both kinds to the laity. But Duke Albert had already entered upon his twofold policy, of resisting the further advance of Protestantism in his dominions, and seeking to reform their religious condition in the spirit of the Council of Trent, where his own ambassador Baumgartner had, June 1562, while urging the concessions demanded by his duke, given a notable impulse to the effort for an inner regeneration of the church. The opposition to his ecclesiastical policy among the Bavarian nobility, and at the same time the chronic resistance to it in the diets, were permanently broken by his vigorous action in the case of the so-called Ortenburg conspiracy. Count Joachim von Ortenburg had openly introduced the reformed worship into his possessions, part of which were asserted by him to be immediate to the empire, when Duke Albert, by a coup de main early in 1564, occupied two of Ortenburg's castles, deported two of the Protestant clergy brought by him into the countship, and confiscated his Bavarian estates. The nobles who had been associated with Ortenburg, though there is no evidence either of his having aimed at supplanting the duke, or of their having entered into negotiations with foreign powers, were subjected to a six weeks' imprisonment, terrified into submission, and in part forbidden further attendance upon diets. Though Count von Ortenburg's claims to immediacy, and in consequence his right of determining the religion of his subjects, was, after a suit of nine years' duration, allowed by the Reichskammergericht, Ortenburg is said to remain a kind of Protestant enclave to the present day. Duke Albert's high-handed action had answered its purpose, and he was able to carry out unhindered his endeavours for the Catholic reformation of his duchy. In this policy, dynastic motives may have cooperated. For the election in 1565 of his son Ernest, the occupant of a plurality of canonries to the bishopric of Freisingen, opened an episcopal career in the course of which the sees of Hildesheim, Liège, and Cologne were successively secured by that prince. The exceptional success of the Catholic Reformation in Bavaria, which within the first four years was such that Albert boasted to have brought back ten thousand of his subjects to their religious allegiance, is primarily explained by the fact that here Protestantism had not as yet, as it had in most other parts of Germany, become master of the situation. But it was also largely due to the direct intervention of the ducal authority, which asserted itself so systematically as to alarm ecclesiastical susceptibilities. The government instituted visitations both of priests and people, expelling recalcitrants, regularly inspecting the clergy, holding examinations for candidates for orders, and reorganizing the whole system of primary and secondary schools. 
the chief combatants in the struggle were not the native clergy, to a large extent unmannered and unlearned, and distinguishable from the peasantry chiefly by their greater license of life, but the resolute and devoted external agency which had here early taken in hand what it regarded as its proper work. The Jesuits had made their entry into Bavaria so early as 1542, at the invitation of Duke William IV, in the person of Ignatius Loyola's companions Lefebvre and Le Jay, and in 1549 the latter, with Salmeron and Canisius, opened courses of lectures in Ingolstadt. The enterprise was resumed in 1556, when a Jesuit college was established in the same town, and brought into an organic connection with the university. The order had now a firm footing, and gradually established itself at Munich and elsewhere in Bavaria, as well as at Dillingen, the university of the Archbishopric of Augsburg. Canisius, Lancius, the first rector of the Munich Gymnasium, and above all Paul Hofreus, who in 1568 succeeded Canisius as provincial of the upper German province of the order, by their personal influence over Duke Albert helped to give completeness to his counter-reformation, together with the learned convert Staphylus Stapelage, of Osnabrück, who had been a pupil of Luther and Melanchthon, but had afterwards done yeoman service at Trent. This counter-reformation addressed itself to the intellectual life of the population at large by the spread of orthodox publications and the exercise of a severe censorship over such as seemed dangerous, including many books and tracts on a favourite theme of contemporary Protestant writers, the devil and his processes. But the movement failed to effect a radical change in the ordinary character of the Bavarian priesthood. The Cardinal Archbishop of Augsburg, Otto Truxess von Waldburg, 1534-73, a prelate who enjoyed the confidence of a succession of popes, and of the emperors Ferdinand and Maximilian, had been from the first thoroughly at one with the Bavarian house in his resistance to the Protestant advance, and had long protested against the religious peace. It was he who made over to the Jesuits the institutions which he had founded in his archiepiscopal capital of Dillingen, university, seminary, and gymnasium. Dillingen, from 1564 onwards, became a kind of second collegium germanicum as a training place for the Jesuit mission. Into Würzburg also the Jesuits were introduced in 1566, by Bishop Frederick von Wiersberg, the successor of Grumbach's victim, 1588-73, to 73, and even to Ratisbon, after previous bishops had been unable to prevent the spread of Protestantism in their diocese, the Jesuits found their way in 1587, under the sway of Bishop Philip, grandson of Albert V, and afterwards Cardinal. Finally, in the great archiepiscopal see of Salzburg, where an elder Bavarian, Ernest, uncle to Duke Albert V, and previously Bishop of Passau, had at a quite early date introduced the Jesuits Faber and Lenez, the archbishop's wholesale expulsion of Protestant families from his see led to the intervention of King Ferdinand, and finally to Ernest's resignation. 1554. But the same troubles continued under his successors, Archbishops Michael von Kuhnburg and Johann Jakob Kuhn von Belassi, the latter of whom refused to allow the papal concession of the cup to the laity to take effect in his diocese. 1564. A further forced emigration of Protestant families followed, while their children were detained 
to be brought up in the Catholic faith. These persecutions reached their height in the reign of Rudolf II. End of section 17 Recording by Tom Denham Section 18 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Denham. Chapter 5. The Empire under Ferdinand I and Maximilian the Second by A. W. Ward, Part Three. The above rapid and necessarily incomplete survey will have indicated what main forces will be found in action and counteraction during the period of jealousy and imminent conflict between the religious parties of which the chief vicissitudes have now to be summarized. To the still continuing expansion of Protestant beliefs and forms of worship among the populations at large, and to the appetite of the Protestant dynasties for the absorption of ecclesiastical lands and revenues, Catholicism was beginning to oppose an active endeavour to reform the Church and its clergy, in accordance with the decrees of the Council of Trent and to bring the life of the people into harmony with this organic regeneration. The aggressive force of Protestantism was far from having exhausted itself in the empire, and signs were not wanting of its entering into new and wider fields of action. But it was arrested by the determined refusal of some of the foremost Lutheran princes to subordinate to the advancement of their form of faith dynastic interests which they regarded as bound up with a loyal adhesion to the emperor and the maintenance of the established institutions of the empire. It was, moreover, weakened in itself by the internal divisions among the Lutherans, due to a hardening and stiffening of dogmatic systems for which the idiosyncrasies of particular religious teachers and the arbitrary decision of the princes were primarily accountable, and above all by the unwillingness of the Lutheran potentates to admit the Calvinists to a share in the privileges of parity which had been secured to themselves by the religious peace. In these circumstances, an effective joint action among the Protestant estates seemed as yet out of the question, while the experiment of foreign alliances was only beginning to suggest itself to the more enterprising or far-sighted of their number. Threatened treaties, like threatened men, sometimes live long, and even the most obnoxious stipulation connected with the religious peace of Augsburg, the Reservatum Ecclesiasticum, was to survive the first trumpet-blast of Protestant wrath. The Diet of Ratisbon, 1556-7, summoned by Ferdinand in the first instance for the grant of aid against the Turks, and in the second for giving to the religious peace what completeness it might still lack, was at once used by the more eager among the Protestant estates for an attempt to remove the detested provision. But Augustus of Saxony had no intention of seconding the Palatine policy of making the Turkish grant conditional upon the acceptance of Württemberg's proposal for the abolition of the Reservatum. An aid was granted, larger than the Palatines, and smaller than Saxony would have preferred. And the religious question was left over for the not very hopeful occasion of a religious colloquy. Such a colloquy was actually opened at Worms a few months later, September 1557, but it broke down in consequence of a protest against heresies delivered by the Ernestine theologians, with Flaccius at their head, 
which Melanchthon, who was also present in person, knew to be directed against himself. The Flacian position, which demonstrated the fallacy of Melanchthon's hopeful declaration that no difference existed as to the Augsburg Confession among its adherents, was restated in the Confutationsbuch, published in 1559, and at first set up as a kind of symbol at Jena. This outburst justified Canisius, who also attended at Worms, having in 1557 become provincial of southern Germany, in demonstrating the futility of a settlement, and the colloquy came to an abrupt end. At the Diet of Augsburg in 1559, the situation was very much what it had been at Ratisbon. The Protestant ambassadors met as before for separate consultation under Palatine leadership, the instructions of the presidents during part of the proceedings being supplied by the new elector Frederick III. The attempt to postpone the Turkish aid till the religious grievances should have found redress was again made and again defeated and the treatment of the religious difficulty was put off to a more convenient season. The reopening of the Council of Trent was at hand, and, while under the exhortations of Canisius, the Catholic bishops prepared to meet its reforming decrees halfway, Ferdinand would fain have induced the Protestant princes to be represented there. But of this there was no chance and Germany had no part in the reforms promulgated by the Council. The Protestant princes, in the meantime, continued to apply their territorial policy to the ecclesiastical foundations within their reach, and the despoiled conventual bodies found it impossible to obtain redress from the Kammergericht. On the other hand, the Catholics successfully asserted their power in the towns within their sphere of influence. At Trier, as has been seen, the archbishop elector re-Catholicized his conquered capital, and in the imperial city of Aachen, whose vicinity to the Netherlands frontier had led to the intervention of an imperial commission, the town council and all civic officers were declared open to Catholics only while many Protestant immigrants were expelled from the place. March to May, 1560. Before the Council of Trent was declared once more in session, the expediency of presenting something like a united front seems to have impressed itself so strongly upon the Protestant princes that even Augustus of Saxony was found ready to take part in a meeting at Naumburg, January 1561, where, though Melanchthon was now dead, an attempt was made to secure a doctrinal agreement on the basis of the 1540 edition of the Augsburg Confession. But the effort was frustrated by the zeal of the Ernestine John Frederick, and instead of a welcome being accorded to the ideas of union advanced by Philip of Hesse, this failure led to a wider severance than before between Lutherans and Calvinists. The strict Lutherans of the Lower Saxon Circle at Lüneburg reaffirmed their opposition to Calvinism, August 1561, and three years later Frederick III of the Palatinate put forth the Heidelberg Catechism, which proclaimed the breach as permanent. It is needless to dwell here on the general significance for the empire and its subsequent ecclesiastical life of the last and decisive period of the Council of Trent, of the decrees on reformation which supplied a definite basis for the administrative practice of the Church of Rome, and of the machinery by means of which, as applied more especially to clerical discipline and to the education of the young, that Church with an ardour augmented by success, strove to recover the ground which she had lost. 
In response to the demands of Ferdinand I, the question of the use of the cup by the laity had alone been reserved for the papal decision, and after minute inquiry and on specified conditions was favourably determined by a simultaneous series of briefs to the German archbishops, April 1564. The emperor had withdrawn the proposal for a relaxation of the observance of fasts, while that for permitting the marriage of clergymen had been answered by a conciliar anathema. Ferdinand had regarded this concession, together with that of the cup, as offering the only prospect of preventing the further disintegration of the church in his own and the adjoining lands, and he knew that in regard to the marriage of priests, practice could not at present be accommodated to precept. Although, therefore, Canisius, whose counsel in religious matters he had long so willingly followed, had at Trent uncompromisingly opposed all concession, Ferdinand seems to the last to have clung to a policy of conciliation. As late as the summer of 1564, not many weeks before his death, he consulted George Cassander, a Flemish scholar of wide training and open mind, whose pacific treatise on points of controversy between Catholics and Protestants, undertaken at Ferdinand's request, was completed by the wish of Maximilian II, and in due course found its place in the index. Meanwhile, as the Emperor Ferdinand's life drew towards its close, and within the empire and in his own dominions the elements of disturbance seemed to increase, the conflict had broken out beyond the borders of the empire, into which, if religious differences continued to divide it into opposing camps, some at least of its members could not in the end fail to be drawn by sympathy or interest. In the low countries the thunderclouds had not yet broken, but the religious situation created by the Inquisition had become intolerable, and already the fugitives for conscience' sake, a large proportion of whom found their way into Germany, were to be numbered by thousands. When William of Orange appeared at Frankfurt in 1562, on the occasion of the election of Maximilian as Roman king, he counselled the Protestant princes to be mindful of the Netherlands, and to seek to allay the contentions between the Protestant Scandinavian powers. In France, the first religious war actually opened in 1562, and in April of that year a Huguenot embassy visited the courts of the more resolute among the German Protestant princes, the Elector Palatine, the Dukes of Württemberg and of Zweibrücken, and the Landgrave of Hesse. Money aid was given by some of them, and by the Margrave Charles of Baden, and in Hesse recruitings actually began. On the other hand, Augustus of Saxony, when the Huguenot overtures reached him in his turn, was clear for non-intervention in a foreign quarrel. The Emperor, though he had always kept up a friendly understanding with his nephew Philip II, and showed little disposition to enter into closer relations with the fluctuating government of France, was on the whole, as he had ever been, anxious for the preservation of peace abroad, as well as at home. But the prospect of a wider Protestant combination, in which estates of the empire would be united with foreign allies, was no longer remote, and how this contingency would affect the empire was one of the most important of the problems of which the solution must needs largely depend upon Ferdinand's successor. The choice of that successor was determined by the election of the emperor's eldest son, Maximilian, as Roman king on November 28, 1562. We have seen that he was crowned King of Hungary in the following year, and that in Bohemia he had been acknowledged as successor at so early a date 
1549. It is true that by his last will Ferdinand, moved by parental feeling, assigned to his second son, Archduke Ferdinand, together with anterior Austria, the Countship of the Tyrol, while to his youngest son, Archduke Charles, who was a suitor for the hand of Queen Elizabeth, he left the duchies of Styria, Carinthia, and Carniola, with the Countship of Goetz. But Upper and Lower Austria remained to Maximilian, and due provision was made both for his supreme control in the matter of wars and alliances, and for the security of the succession in all its hereditary dominions of the male line of the Austrian Habsburgs. The solidarity of the power of the dynasty was thus assured. 2. Maximilian II, like his great-grandfather and namesake, was not actually brought face to face with the national and European crisis which already during his reign seemed imminent. Nevertheless, his personal relation to the conditions of the conflict that was preparing and announcing itself is of signal importance, and makes it necessary to go back for a moment on his previous history. Like the earlier Maximilian, he was not a great man, but he was gifted with some of those qualities which justly bring an exceptional popularity to princes possessed of them. Certain of the happiest features of his nationality, open-mindedness and a kindly humour, were united in him with equally marked characteristics of the age in which he lived. Unlike both his father and his uncle, he was enabled by his impressionable and flexible nature, and by his varied training, to accommodate himself to the manners and ways of many nations, and to exhibit an appreciative interest in divers intellectual currents of his times. His genuine sympathy with the religious movement that in the days of his youth had taken so strong a hold of the lands over which he was destined to rule, was patent to the world, and riveted the attention of all whose hopes or fears centred in that movement. But he was also, after the fashion of his age, a student of science, and the fashion of his age was observation and experiment, all too frequently degenerating into sciolism and quackery but Maximilian seems to have loved research for its own sake, and both science and art, botany and music in particular, as refining and brightening life. At the same time, he possessed what to a sovereign is worth nearly all other qualities and accomplishments, the gift of a spontaneous and never-failing courtesy, which made foreign princes and their envoys pronounce him the most perfect cavalier in existence, while he had an opportune recollection and a kindly word for the humblest attendant at his court. But the sceptical disposition of his mind affected and no doubt weakened the power of moral decision which few men have been called upon to exercise in circumstances of greater gravity. Born on July 31, 1527, Maximilian was the junior by ten weeks of his Spanish cousin. From the first, Philip's succession to the Spanish monarchy, and Maximilian's to the Austrian lands transferred to his father by the Emperor Charles V, had been regarded as settled. But when in 1547, Charles consented to a marriage between his elder daughter, Maria, and her cousin, Maximilian. It was actually celebrated in the following year. The hoped-for dowry of Milan, or, what would have suited him better still, the Low Countries, was withheld. There is no evidence that at the time of the marriage either Charles V or Ferdinand suspected Maximilian of any inclination towards Lutheranism, such as is supposed to have been instilled in him as a boy or youth by a teacher named Schiffer, Severus, 
during his two years' sojourn in Spain, where he and his wife, in Philip's absence, conducted the government, the great number of reports received by Ferdinand as to his son's more or less satisfactory observance of his religious duties may possibly point to some special anxiety on the subject. He was recalled from Spain by the Emperor towards the close of 1550, in order to take part in the deliberations which ended in the family compact of March 9, 1551, according to which Philip was to succeed Ferdinand on the imperial throne, Maximilian administering German affairs as Roman king under his cousin. Ferdinand's consent had been most reluctantly given, and Maximilian, whose prospects were so injuriously affected by the compact, was at once courted by Maurice of Saxony and by Henry II of France. When the crisis came, Maximilian, as well as his father, proved true to Charles V, but the collapse of the imperial and Catholic cause was in part due to the unpopularity of the Spanish scheme in Germany, and perhaps to the inevitable coldness between the two branches of the House of Habsburg. In 1552, when on his way to a Turkish campaign in Hungary, Maximilian fell ill, Sinister suspicions were entertained by him of poison administered in the Spanish interest. Cordial relations were not established between the German and Spanish lines till, as was shown by Philip's marriage with Mary of England, 1554, the ambition of Spain was directed to the establishment of her supremacy over the west of Europe, and the emperor definitely abandoned the project of securing the imperial succession to his son. Though Ferdinand was allowed to take his own course in concluding the religious peace of Augsburg, his loyalty towards his brother and his devotion to Rome remained alike undoubted. It was otherwise with Maximilian. He showed himself, as for instance in the matter of his wife's household, fully possessed by an antipathy against Spanish influence, which was stimulated by his German courtiers and counsellors. But unmistakable indications now also began to appear that his religious views tended in the same direction. Much as has been written on the subject, it is perhaps impossible to date the beginnings of these symptoms, but it would seem to have been in the critical year 1555 that the rumours as to his religious opinions first took anything like a definite shape. They connect themselves not with his jealousy of Spain, but rather with the religious agitation in Austria, which about this time had reached a high point. There was in Austria an alarming lack of clergy capable of edifying their congregations either as preachers or by their godly lives and Sebastian Fauser had been summoned to Vienna by Ferdinand as one who would help to meet this need. Soon, however, the king learned that the preacher to whom he had listened with approbation was a married man, and dismissed him. But when, about 1554, he learned that Maximilian had held discourse with Fauser, Ferdinand seems to have raised no objection. In March 1555, we know that Maximilian attended a church where Fauser ministered according to forms and in a spirit approaching, at least, very closely to Lutheranism. Soon afterwards, being in charge of the government at Vienna during his father's absence at Augsburg, Maximilian declined to approve the Jesuit suggestion that a declaration of faith should be required from all ecclesiastics. Canisius hereupon denounced him and Fauser at Augsburg, and a serious correspondence ensued between father and son, as well as communications from the emperor on the subject of his daughter, Maximilian's wife, with whose strictly Catholic life Maximilian appears not to have interfered. 
nor did he absent himself altogether from Catholic services, but he preferred the discourses of Fauser and the study of Protestant writings, insisted on receiving the sacrament in both kinds, corresponded with Christopher of Württemberg, and even exchanged letters with Melanchthon. Thus, although some vague menaces notwithstanding, there was neither in peace nor in wartime any real fear of Maximilian's attempting to side with France against Spain, his conversion to Protestantism seemed to become more and more likely. Controversial argument having been tried in vain by the Spanish magister Gallo, the Archbishop of Toledo appeared on the scene, to advise on the treatment of the case, even it was whispered, to prepare for the divorce of Maximilian from his consort. After the death of Charles V, September 1558, Paul IV would have been prepared to push things to extremities had Philip II been ready to quarrel with his German kinsmen. The accession of Pius IV, December 1559, caused more prudent counsels to prevail. But Ferdinand also had been alarmed, and in his last years never placed his eldest son in a position of permanent power. In 1559 he again bade Maximilian dismiss Fauser, but was answered by his son that rather than give way against his conscience, he would surrender all his lands and serve God in retirement. In 1560, the electors of Saxony and Brandenburg ventured to offend Ferdinand's pride by begging him to leave his son's religion unmolested. The sorely tried emperor, Archduke Charles had recently refused to pledge himself on the subject of religion, should Queen Elizabeth listen to his suit, resolved, with the aid of Maximilian's Spanish wife and her Spanish confessor, to make one more attempt. We have Maximilian's own account of the alternatives that were now placed before him. On the one side, a greatness which, if the life of the weakling Don Carlos were to be eliminated, might be like the greatness of Charles V himself. On the other, humiliation and disinheritance. Maximilian's character was not equal to the test. He no longer insisted on retaining Fauser, but was content to find him a refuge at the court of Duke Christopher of Württemberg, whence he sent confidential messages to other Protestant princes. Augustus of Saxony declared himself ready to make friendly representations to the emperor, but advised Maximilian against active resistance, and no distinct promise of aid seems to have reached Maximilian. He accordingly now gave way outwardly, although there is no proof or probability that any change took place in his religious opinions. Even early in 1561, when the Protestant princes were preparing for their meeting at Naumburg, they for a time entertained the thought of inviting him to send a representative there. But gradually his conformity with the Catholic Church became undeniable. He occasionally attended Mass, heard Catholic preachers, and disputed in varying moods with zealous Orthodox divines, including a succession of three papal nuncios, Hosius, Delphius, Commendone. Except as to his consistent demand for the sacrament in both forms, and for this too he consented to ask as a favour from the Pope, he was outwardly reconquered for the Church of Rome, by his father's firmness, seconded by the personal and other persuasions of Philip II's ambassador, the Count de Luna, who seems to have succeeded in extracting from Maximilian a kind of pledge of adherence to his present line of submission. Such a pledge was necessary 
if the Catholic electors were to be induced to vote for the election of Maximilian as Roman king, and after having, in the summer of 1561, asked the support of the hesitating Pope Pius IV for his election in February 1562, he, in the presence of the envoys of the spiritual electors at Prague, declared himself ready to remain a faithful member of the Church of Rome. Yet there can, at the same time, be no doubt that the Protestant electors put faith in a promise made by him that when he sat on the imperial throne he would openly declare his acceptance of the Augsburg Confession, for, when reminded of this undertaking after he had succeeded to the empire, he only pleaded the impossibility of carrying it out. There is accordingly every reason for regarding the unanimous election of Maximilian as Roman king, October 27, 1562, as the result of a double game. Maximilian's subsequent conduct was so far consistent that henceforth he never really broke away from the common policy of the House of Habsburg. It was in 1562 that Philip II first informed his Austrian kinfolk of the actual bodily and mental condition of Don Carlos, a confidence which was not made in vain. Maximilian not only gave his sons a Spanish education, but showed some assiduity on this head, while Philip II, whose third wife had borne him no son, was on his side desirous of maintaining the legitimate Habsburg succession in Spain. Dynastic ambition thus counted for much in Maximilian's conduct as to religion. Yet his intentions continued to remain suspected. Nor was it till February 1564 that he was at last officially recognised by the Pope in consistory. The recognition had not come too soon, for in the following July Ferdinand died. Shortly after this event, the Venetian ambassador Michele gave it as his opinion that just as the Catholic Ferdinand had protected the German Protestants in the enjoyment of the great concessions which he had made to them, so Maximilian, notwithstanding his own inclinations, would seek to preserve the remnants of the Catholic Church in the Empire. They were, in truth, little more than the remnants, but, as in the case of James I in England, the hopes of both sides ran high on the new Emperor's advent to the throne, and on the whole his religion certainly proved advantageous to the progress of the Catholic reaction. Maximilian's reign, 1564-76, to 76, like that of his father, was overshadowed by the great Turkish trouble and peril. We have seen how, two years before his death, Ferdinand had concluded an eight years' truce with Soliman II, in whose hands he left a large part of Hungary, and to whom he consented to pay a tribute. Soliman, though openly lamenting the death of so just an adversary as Ferdinand, and protesting his pacific tendencies to the new emperor, continued the negotiations into which he had entered with the young John Sigismund Zapolia, for establishing him in his father's stead as voivod of Transylvania, in dependence on the Ottoman power. Maximilian resented this humiliating condition of things, and his commanders sought to anticipate the Transylvanian in the occupation of fortified places. Soon, as has been related elsewhere, the real adversary took the field. In June 1566, Sultan Soliman II was at Belgrade, and in August Zigeth fell, after a heroic defence. During the siege, Soliman died in his tent, but owing to Maximilian's distrust of the report of the Sultan's death, the army of one hundred thousand which the Emperor had collected with so much effort had done nothing to aid Zrini at Zigeth. 
a great aid, amounting to some three and a half million florins, had been granted at Maximilian's first diet, and his armada included contingents from Tuscany and from Savoy. The dukes of Mantua and Ferrara appeared at the head of their cavalry. From France came the young Duke of Guise, eager to flesh his avenging sword. There were knights from England, from Poland, and from Malta. But Maximilian was without the genius for war, which might have made him the victor by land of an earlier Lepanto. In the next years his experienced general Schwendi gained some advantage on the Turks, but not enough to secure from the new Sultan Selim II terms substantially different from those granted by Soliman to Ferdinand. Moreover, Maximilian's army dissolved. The Bohemian and Moravian levies went home, and so did the uxorious Archduke Ferdinand. The frontier was settled on the Uti Pesedetis basis, the Turkish limits including Zigeth, and the emperor continued to pay tribute to the sultan. Zapolya remained in possession, but being dissatisfied with his share, concluded on his own account a secret treaty with Maximilian. On his death in 1561, Stephen Batori, with the Sultan's approval, took his place as Prince of Transylvania. Even after Lepanto, October 1571, Maximilian made no attempt to resume the Turkish war, and on Selim II's death in 1574, when the Turkish inroads began to become frequent across the Croatian frontier, the emperor was glad to be able to obtain a renewal of peace with his successor, Murad III. But Bathory's hostility to Austria caused the Transylvanian difficulties to continue, and the eastern peace remained a broken one. The really ineradicable opposition between the interests of Austria and those of the Turks contributed to give additional significance to the dynastic designs of Maximilian on the Polish throne, which have likewise been described elsewhere. On the death, in 1562, of Sigismund Augustus, the last of the male line of the Jagello kings of Poland, Maximilian would have gladly secured the election to the Polish throne of one of his sons, Archduke Ernest, and thus gained an influence which would have sufficed to keep Transylvania quiet. But Turkish advice, and the fear of being drawn into the chronic strife between emperor and sultan, ensured the election of the Duke of Anjou. After King Henry II of France had escaped from his Polish throne like a thief in the night, the Polish Diet had, in 1575, to make another choice, and this time, though once more the port intervened with a vigorous protest, Maximilian himself was actually elected by one faction, the other choosing the Transylvanian vovoid Stephen Bathory. The latter, as has been seen, was crowned king, 1576, while Maximilian was perpending the terms, certainly far from attractive, offered him by his supporters. The refusal of the Diet of the Empire to enter into Maximilian's Polish design would have made it impossible for him, had he lived, to urge war against Stephen Batory for the Polish crown. For the triple struggle which such a war would have involved, the only ally who offered himself was Tsar Ivan the Terrible, himself a candidate for the Polish throne, who proposed a partition of Poland and Lithuania with the Emperor. End of section 18 Recording by Tom Denham Section 19 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Chapter 5. The Empire Under Ferdinand I and Maximilian II by A. W. Ward. Part 4. It seemed convenient to recall the eastern pressure upon Maximilian's government before adverting to the progress of those internal difficulties in the dealing with which that pressure could be ignored neither by the emperor nor the diet, the ultimate resort as yet of contentions in the empire. Though the Turkish danger was after a fashion met by Maximilian's diets, from his first in 1566 to his last in 1576, it was impossible that the religious struggle and conflict of interest which intensified it should not injuriously affect the military efficacy of the empire as against the Turk, and, even had Maximilian displayed capacity in the field, it would have been impossible for him, with the inadequate resources of a disunited empire, to drive back permanently the Ottoman power. But it was not only the empire which was out of joint throughout his reign, for the religious discord that was the main cause of its troubles only reflected the conflicts which were now openly declaring themselves in its western borderlands. Maximilian's accession to the throne occurred midway between the outbreak of the French religious wars in 1562 and the first signals of the revolt of the Netherlands in 1567 and 1568. With the sympathies or antipathies entertained in Germany towards the contending interests in these struggles, there cooperated the ineradicable inclination of the Germans towards mercenary service and arms. In course of time, a very considerable proportion of the combatants in France and in the Netherlands came to be drawn from the empire. Now, while the right of an estate of the empire to conclude a foreign alliance remained practically unrestricted, the execution Sordnung of 1555 made the consent of a princely or city government a necessary condition for the levy of troops within its dominions, and the service of the empire or the emperor's assent for the transit of such troops through the territory of another estate. This transit was a matter of the greatest consequence, inasmuch as the soldiers were only paid, not clothed or fed, by their employers, and, having to support themselves on the march, were in the habit of committing every kind of excess. The princes who entered into foreign service persistently neglected asking the emperor's assent for the transit of their troops, nor was the case much altered when, in 1564, the assent of the director of the circle affected was made requisite. It was not till after many and serious excesses, especially in the archbishopric of Cologne and elsewhere on the Rhine, that in 1569 some vigorous reforms were attempted by a deputation stag, but with the fundamental question, whether estates could be prohibited from entering into foreign service, the diet, though called upon it to consider it by the deputation stag, could not be brought effectively to deal. When Maximilian II opened his first diet at Augsburg in March 1566, the grant of an aid against the Turks was, as has been seen, the purpose which he had most especially in view, and this he achieved but he had also proposed in his summons that the Diet should take into consideration the best means of attaining to religious unity in the empire. This meant different things to different parties and to different men. There were fervent and uncompromising Catholics, whose numbers were steadily being increased by the strenuous efforts of Duke Albert of Bavaria and his Jesuit protégés, fully prepared to accept the Tridentine decrees, and Cardinal Commendone appeared at the Diet as legate of the new Pope Pius V to call upon the estates to carry these decrees into execution, but Commendone found that at the Diet neither side had manifested any desire to put an end to the religious peace, and had nearly quitted Augsburg in disgust. He does not seem to have perceived how adverse the decrees, in the matter of rules and restrictions concerning the episcopate, were to the territorial interests of most of the princes. It is probable that Maximilian still thought the attainment of a common ground was possible. Herein he was in a sense before, in another sense behind, his times. While he was willing to listen to the teaching of Cassander, on the Catholic side, Cassander's earlier patron, Duke William of Ulick, and the Elector of Cologne, Frederick von Wied, whose election as Archbishop remained unconfirmed by the Pope, were in agreement with the views no doubt justly attributed to the new Emperor. But the future was not with this faction, and in the year 1567 the Archbishop Elector had to resign, and was followed by a successor approved at Rome. When the Protestant estates at the Diet proposed the holding of a national council, the Catholics repudiated this as unnecessary and fell back upon the validity of the Tridentine decrees. Meanwhile, the emperor's immediate attention had been directed, and was again brought back to the preliminary problem of the suppression of Calvinism. As to this, he and the Catholics had not unnaturally expected the Protestant estates to take the first step, but the Lutherans on their side hesitated to press home directly the exclusion of the elector Palatine, Frederick III, from the benefits of the religious peace, although they were agreed not to include him among the signatories of the demand for a national council addressed by them to the emperor, unless he should previously have accepted a formula settled by them as to the true doctrine of the Eucharist. And it was now that the moderate policy, coupled no doubt with the territorial interests of the elector of Saxony, decided the issue. 
for the Grumbach troubles were not yet at an end, and menaced the Palatine and Saxon electors alike. The Emperor, approving of Frederick III's attitude in the Grumbach question, hereupon contested himself with admonishing him on his unlawful processes of reformation, and, though the meeting of Protestant estates denounced his sacramental views, the more general assault upon his position broke down. The result was, in a word, that the elector Palatine and the cause of Calvinism came forth from the Diet stronger than before, for room was now left them for further expansion in the empire, and the breach between the Calvinists and the Lutherans had so far not been formalized. At the same time, the cause of Protestantism was weakened by the perpetuation of discord and disunion in its midst. While Calvinism was left untouched, the divisions among the professed Lutherans were unhealed. The Ernestine John William restored Flachianism of the purest water at Gina, and doctrinal controversies recommenced between Electoral and Ernestine Saxony. Duke Christopher of Württemberg, in 1568, put forth a Concordia, drawn up with such brevity by Jacob Andrei that its acceptance by both Philippists and Flachians seemed possible, but neither the missionary efforts of its author, nor the countenance of Duke Julius of brunswick Luneburg and of the Landgrave William of Hesse Castle, nor the goodwill of the Emperor himself could bring about its general acceptance. In the meantime, the Counter-Reformation, in Bavaria and elsewhere, continued its course, and the day seemed approaching when it was from the Catholic side rather than the Protestant side that aggressive movements were to proceed. During the interval between the Augsburg Diet of 1566 and that of Speer in 1570, the progress of the religious conflict in France and in the Netherlands made it more and more necessary for the German Protestants to decide on their bearing towards it. Necessarily, this must largely depend on the attitude of the emperor and the consequent chances of an intervention on the part of the empire. In the earlier part of this period, at all events, such an intervention still seemed possible, for Maximilian had not as yet made it clear how he would shape his conduct towards Spain. Meanwhile, the tortuous policy of the French government in these years was likewise perplexing to the German Protestant princes. The overtures, which it made to them in 1567, were well understood to be prompted by no sincere goodwill towards the Protestant cause, and though some of them, at meetings held in that year in Heidelberg and Malbronn, under Palatine and Hessian direction, resolved on a French alliance, the ground was cut from under their feet by the outbreak in September of the Second French Religious War. But the elector Palatine Frederick III better understood the nature of the situation in France, and had made up his own mind. In December 1567, he allowed his ambitious second son, John Casimir, who by his early residence in France seemed fitted for the task, to lead a mercenary force of 8,000 horse and a regiment of foot to the assistance of Condé. An envoy sent to Heidelberg to protest in the name of the emperor was put off with empty excuses. The die was cast, for not only was the result of the French religious war materially affected by the fact of this reinforcement of the Huguenots, but the future policy of the Palatinate was pledged by this act, as Frederick and his counselors meant it to be, and to them, in the transactions which followed, the moral as well as the actual leadership of the German Protestants proved to have passed. When in 1567 William of Orange resolved on the attempt to shake off the yoke of Alva from the Netherlands, his appeal to the German Protestant princes to bring about the intervention of the empire was coldly received by them all, with the exception of the elector Palatine. When in 1568 Orange returned, this time as a fugitive, to Germany, Frederick III alone came forward to support him with a loan, to which Landgrave William of Hesse Castle afterwards added a contribution. But even before the dispersal of Orange's liberating army, the overbearing action of Alva and his demand for the expulsion of the fugitives who were crowding into the German North and Northwest had caused great uneasiness among Catholic as well as Protestant estates. In September 1568, the Rhenish electors appealed to Maximilian to adopt such action as might check the Spanish proceedings in the Netherlands, and it is noticeable that the electors of Saxony and Brandenburg added further representations on their own behalf. Maximilian had many considerations to balance against one another, and in favor of intervention the strongest was perhaps the religious condition of his own hereditary dominions. We have seen how widespread the advance of Protestantism there had been before his advent to the imperial throne, and how his own conduct in the matter of religion had been favorable to this advance. Since his accession, Protestant feeling had continued steadily to grow in Austria, and partly owing to a consciousness that the heavy taxation which the estates had to undergo to meet the cost of the Turkish war warranted some concession in return, this feeling rose to its height in 1568. Maximilian would have preferred a scheme of comprehension on the lines favored by his father, but the nobles of Lower Austria insisted on the right of a free exercise of the Augsburg Confession on their lands, and this definite right was conceded to them, August 1568, the towns, as more or less dependent on the government, holding aloof. The elaboration of a code of religious worship and administration, agenda, for what was intended to be little or nothing short of an established territorial church, 
was entrusted to David Caetraeus, a Lutheran divine of unimpeachable orthodoxy, but of a conciliatory disposition, and the emperor amended the draft in a similar spirit towards the Church of Rome. It may be added that a similar concession was made to Protestant feeling in Styria, where Caetraeus was likewise employed in 1573, while in Upper Austria, where the estates refused Maximilian's agenda, he had to content himself with leaving alone what he could not remedy, the use of the cup by the laity being of course maintained. To the religious developments in Bohemia, reference will be made in another place. In Hungary also, so far as the royal authority in Maximilian extended, Protestantism was allowed to advance unhindered. It was during the negotiations as to the religious concessions to be made by the emperor to the mainly Protestant nobility of Lower Austria that the embassy of the electors urging him to intervene in the affairs of the Netherlands arrived at Vienna. There can be no doubt that Maximilian personally sympathized with the complaints on which this request was based, and that he would gladly have seen the troubles in the provinces ended by the dismissal of the Spanish troops and an amicable settlement of religious and other differences. Furthermore, he was certainly prepared to undertake such a settlement himself, for the Netherlands had never ceased to attract him, and we know that before the actual outbreak he had been at least inclined to offer himself as peacemaker. He now unhesitatingly transmitted to Philip the representation of the electors with a strong recommendation in their favor, and in August 1568 he sent his brother, Archduke Charles, to Spain, to renew the proffer of the emperor's personal good offices in bringing the troubles of the provinces to a close. Archduke Charles was relieved of the task of executing his other commission, that of pleading for Don Carlos, by the death of that unfortunate prince, July 23, 1568. This tragic event, it cannot be doubted, exercised a most important influence upon Maximilian II, particularly in his relations to the religious question. The death of the heir to the Spanish monarchy was anything rather than unforeseen, but there is a vast difference between expectation and event. Henceforth, Philip showed himself much more desirous than before of strengthening the bonds between the two branches of the House of Habsburg, and, in return, the future interests of his dynasty became paramount with Maximilian. While Philip coldly rejected the proposals brought by Archduke Charles as to the troubles in the Netherlands, he was ready to discuss with him marriage projects of signal moment for the future of the Austrian line. The proposed marriage of his infant daughter to one of Maximilian's numerous sons must inevitably be long delayed in execution, but already in 1570 Philip married the emperor's daughter Anne as his fourth wife. Obviously, even if the report that Philip sent warnings to his kinsmen was not based on authentic data, so close a connection with the king of Spain implied an unimpeachable orthodoxy, and could not fail to react upon the relations between the emperor and Pope Pius V, who was so well contented with Philip's treatment of the Low Countries. The friendly influence of the Pope became of the most direct value to Maximilian when the latter began to speculate on the chances of recovering the throne of Poland for himself or for one of his sons. It is true that the matter of the Lutheran agenda for Lower Austria, after the protest of the papal nuncio Comendone had been met by a suspension of proceedings in November 1568, was quietly taken up again and slowly and secretly carried to its conclusion by January 1571. The lower Austrian nobility were now both for themselves and for their subjects empowered to exercise their religion in accordance with the Augsburg Confession in its original form, and a decree followed promising the extension of this concession to the nobility of Upper Austria also. But while in this matter Maximilian's policy of delay and secrecy seems to have beguiled the Pope and King Philip, he had been found ready to abandon the proposed intervention of the Empire in the affairs of the Netherlands. After the recommendations of the electors had found their way to Spain, they had there been dispersed into empty air. The schemes for an intervention lost all imperial basis, and were exchanged for the design of a great Protestant offensive combination, in which England, the Scandinavian powers, and even Switzerland were to play their part, as well as the insurgent Protestants in the Netherlands and France. The Thirty Years' War cast the shadow of its shifting designs back over nearly half a century, and the imagination of the doctrinaires of Heidelberg was already equal to the lighting up of a war which would envelop the greater part of Europe in its flames. John Casimir, whose own share of the salvage from this general conflagration was to consist of the three bishoprics of Metz, Toul, and Verdun, was about this time betrothed to a daughter of Augustus of Saxony, and the Saxon elector was in conjunction with Brandenburg, induced to assemble a meeting of ambassadors of Protestant princes at Erfurt for the discussion of the high-flown Palatine proposals, September 1569. But the time was not ripe. The Brandenburgers took the lead in repudiating the designs put forward by the presiding Palatines, and nearly all the other ambassadors, including the Saxon, followed suit. In the same year, a counterattempt was made by the Archbishop of Trier to form a combination which should include the Rhenish Catholic princes and the Spanish Netherlands, and cooperate with the Landsberg Alliance, headed by Bavaria, which had just been renewed for seven years. 
Philip would willingly have inflated this design into a league of the whole Catholic West, but the Emperor Maximilian II, while pretending to favor this proposal, contrived to frustrate it, and after an equally futile attempt of Augustus of Saxony to convert the Landsberg Alliance into a league of both confessions, which would ensure the neutrality of the empire in the Netherlands conflict, it was joined by nobody but the electors of Mainz and Trier. The effects of the change and the general tendencies of Maximilian's policy showed themselves distinctly enough at his second diet, which met at Speer in July 1570, and in the transactions which ensued, down to the opening, six years later, of his last diet at Radisbon. In consequence of the excesses committed by the troops led by William of Orange, John Casimir, and other princes into the Netherlands and France in their transit through the Archbishopric of Cologne and other districts of western Germany, in 1568 and 1569, a deputation stag had called upon the Diet to apply an effectual remedy, but the Emperor's desire that it should henceforth be within his discretion to allow or disallow the levy of troops for foreign service, in other words, that the direction of the policy of the Empire as to the French and Netherlands wars would henceforth be placed in his hands, was by no means to the taste of the estates. It was merely provided that he should, in the future, be informed of any such levy, and his proposals for organizing the defense of the borders fell to the ground. The mistrust implied in these proceedings of the Diet is in part explicable by the fact that, while it was sitting, the marriage of Maximilian's daughter Anne with King Philip was solemnized, November. It is true that in the same month the Emperor's daughter Elizabeth was married to Charles IX of France, and that about this time the policy of Catherine de Medici took a favorable turn toward the Huguenots and towards the cause of the Netherlands, on behalf of which Orange was at this time continuously canvassing German support. The more ardent spirits among the German Protestants were for a time caught by the fantastic suggestion that Charles IX should be set up as successor to Maximilian on the imperial throne, with Henry of Anjou as Roman king. But though these schemes were resumed after the first horror excited by the massacre of St. Bartholomew, 1572, had subsided, and after Henry of Anjou had actually ascended the Polish throne, 1573, they were too artificial to have a chance of success and in the end the sympathies and hopes of militant German Protestantism attached themselves once more to the Huguenots and to Henry of Navarre, while the conservative and cautious section headed by Augustus of Saxony became more conservative and cautious than ever. In September 1575, with the aid of English money, John Casimir concluded an important treaty with the Huguenot leaders for conducting 16,000 German and Swiss mercenaries into France, and in December he marched into that country, where the presence of his force helped to bring about the hollow peace which ended the Fifth Religious War. 1576. While the withdrawal of Maximilian from an attitude of unmistakable friendliness towards the progress of Protestantism at home and abroad had failed to benefit the interests of Catholicism, as represented by Spain abroad, it could not but encourage the advance of the Catholic reaction at home, and at the same time deepen the mistrust between the imperialist section of the Protestant estates and that which cast to the winds all care for the empire and its integrity. The interests of the Counter-Reformation in Germany were probably better served by Gregory the Thirteenth who had, in 1572, succeeded to the chair of St. Peter, then by Pius V, who had fallen in with the conceptions of Philip II. But though Gregory came under the influence of fanatics, he was not one himself, and in Germany he favored more gradual and in particular educational processes, such as were set in motion by the Jesuit order, whose Collegium Germanicum at Rome he re-endowed, and whose agents he caused to be sent forth to the annual number of 100. One of the Catholic centers in Germany whence a large number of pupils, for the great Roman seminary were drawn was Fulda. Here, Abbot Balthazar Gravel had by the year 1573 persuaded himself that it was his duty to bring back all his subjects to communion with Rome, and, encouraged by the Pope, though under the protest of his chapter, introduced the Jesuits to Fulda, where they set up a seminary. This was followed by the expulsion of all Protestant preachers, and of all officials, clerical or lay, who refused to accept the Tridentine decrees, and by 1576 the restoration of Catholicism in the abbacy was complete. In indignation at the abbot's proceedings, the nobility of his principality and his chapter combined to force him to renounce his abbacy in favor of the Bishop of Würzburg, who, under the title of coadjutor, assumed its administration. The abbot appealed to the Emperor Maximilian, who declared him to have been illegally coerced, but it was not till six years later that he was replaced in all his rights. The bishop, the nobility, and the city of Fulda had then to pay a considerable compensation. Thus, in the end, this important position was reconquered by the Catholic reaction. The Bishop of Würzburg, Julius Ector von Mespelbrunn, who plays so ambiguous a part in the earlier of these transactions, had by that time secured the complete success of the reaction in his own prince bishopric. The Protestant clergy and their influence were likewise expelled from the Eichsfeld, a district in the electorate of Mainz, 
environed by Protestant territories. Here, too, the Jesuits found a new center once they spread into the seas of Paderborn and Hildesheim. The Archbishop of Trier and the Bishop of Worms were likewise active in suppressing Protestant worship, and, but for the Elector Palatine, some of the lesser free towns in these parts, where the Catholic interest prevailed, would have proceeded to imitate the example of these ecclesiastics. At the close of Maximilian's reign, the Counter-Reformation was ready for those further and still more provocative advances to which it was to proceed in the reign of his son. Meanwhile, among the Protestants, neither the steady advance of the Counter-Reformation at home, nor the deadly earnest of the religious conflict abroad, beyond the borders of the empire, prevented the continuous growth of controversy and discord. Before the reign of Maximilian had ended, the mutual aversion between the Saxon and Palatine electors had been intensified into angry antagonism. Family jealousies and quarrels added, or were to add, to the bitterness between them. John Casimir's wife, the Saxon Elizabeth, a bitter anti-Calvinist, stirred up strife between her father and her husband and father-in-law. A violent quarrel also arose out of the unfortunate second marriage of William of Orange to Anne, the niece of Elector Augustus, and was heightened through his third marriage, negotiated by Frederick III, with Charlotte de Bourbon. But before this, Augustus had made a final declaration of his hostility to Calvinism. The prevalent religious opinion in the electorate was undoubtedly anti-Calvinistic, though its Lutheranism under Augustus had not been of the rigid or Flachian type, such as obtained in Ducal Saxony, whence in 1573, on high-handedly assuming the guardianship of the two sons left behind him by John William, Augustus had summarily expelled the Flaccian clergy and university professors. But in 1574, he suddenly became aware of the influence gained in his court and council by the Wittenberg theologians, whom Melanchthon's teaching had disposed to an attitude of conciliation or compromise, vehemently resented by the rigid Lutherans, and among them by the elector's own consort. In an access of despotic rage, the elector hereupon conceived that he had discovered a crypto-Calvinist conspiracy, and proceeded with cruel severity against its supposed members. His foremost privy counselor, Krakow, was tortured and put into prison, where he soon died. The elector's body physician languished in custody for ten years, and others were treated with similar rigor. Then, determined to extirpate the pest from his land, he caused a declaration of belief concerning the Eucharist, the so-called Torgau formula, to be drawn up and imposed upon all persons suspected of Calvinism, especially the professors and clergy of Wittenberg and Leipzig, and a series of expulsions ensued. From this time forward, Augustus became more and more rigidly Lutheran, and sought to give the same character to the Saxon church. His direct antagonism to the elector Palatine reflected itself in his estrangement from the cause of the Huguenots and the Netherlands Protestants. The representatives and promoters of the Catholic reaction now saw their natural opponents divided into two camps directly adverse to one another and the effect of this division speedily showed itself in the settlement of the crucial question of the succession to the empire itself. Maximilian, though only fifty years of age, was infirm in health, and there was every reason for settling the succession as speedily as might be. After Augustus of Saxony had visited the emperor in 1573, the Palatine scheme of delaying the election of his successor till after his death was swept aside, and Frederick III had to reconcile himself as best he might to the consensus of all the other electors, in favor of choosing as Roman king the emperor's oldest son, Rudolf, who had been crowned king of Hungary in 1572. His succession to the Bohemian crown was secured by his coronation on September 6, 1575, the assent of the Lutheran majority which dominated the Diet having been purchased by a verbal promise on the part of both father and son to approve the adoption of a Bohemian confession, so comprehensive as to include the tenets of the Bohemian brethren. Thus a complete religious settlement was here postponed by a provisional understanding. At Ratisbon, where the electors assembled in October 1575, Maximilian was still confronted by a difficult task. Interest was concentrated on the terms of the Volcapitulation, which would precede Rudolf's election as Roman king, in which the audacious Palatine statesmen had at first aimed at making a kind of charter of religious liberty for Protestantism, both within and beyond the borders of the empire. Now they had moderated their demands and for a time it seemed as if they would carry Saxony and Brandenburg with them in exacting from Rudolf the twofold promise, that the Reservatum Ecclesiasticum should be cancelled, and the declaration of Ferdinand guaranteeing to adherence of the Augsburg Confession the continued exercise of their religion in the lands of spiritual princes confirmed. Undoubtedly, the whole question of the expansion of Protestantism in the empire was involved in the former demand, and at the latter distinctly implied that the Catholic reaction allowed at Fulda and in the Eichsfeld and imminent in the electorate of Cologne, should not continue to be permitted. But in the end, the resolute negative with which the spiritual electors met these proposals, and probably his own reluctance to act with the Palatine, induced Augustus of Saxony to give way, 
so that, while the settlement of these matters was left over for the Diet, Rudolf, without having entered into any engagement concerning them, was unanimously elected Roman king, October 17, 1575. The Emperor Maximilian had never had head and hands fuller of projects intended to enhance the power and influence of his dynasty than when he met his last Diet at Radisbon, June 25, 1576. The crown of Poland had been offered to him by a party which regarded him as representing the Catholic interest in opposition to the Protestant Stephen Bathory, and Maximilian cherished the hope that the Diet would approve the Polish design, besides granting him a liberal aid for the Turkish war, which would be the inevitable result of its success. But the Diet had no wish to provoke the Turks to another series of costly campaigns, and even for the mere defense of the frontier, Maximilian would have found it impossible to secure the requisite supply, had not Augustus of Saxony defeated the Palatine design of once more making the Turkish grant dependent on the satisfaction of the Protestant demand for the confirmation of Ferdinand's declaration. Almost unsupported, Augustus, fortified by a recent visit to Duke Albert of Bavaria, held out against the general wish of the Protestant princes to press this demand upon the emperor, and the breach between the Saxon and the Palatine policy had become wider than ever. But though the Turkish aid was granted, and to an unusually large amount, the Polish scheme of Maximilian had to be dropped. He would have been abundantly consoled for this had he been able to carry into fulfillment another design which had been a chief ambition of his life, and which even now there seemed a prospect of realizing. For the last three years he had, on his own account, taken up the scheme of an effective mediation in the affairs of the Netherlands, to be conducted by himself in cooperation with the leading princes of the empire. Secretly he had cherished the hope that a member of his family, perhaps his youthful son Matthias, might be summoned to the government of the provinces, which, though now in open insurrection, had not yet formally renounced their obedience to Philip's rule. An agent of the states, who were on the point of concluding the pacification of Ghent, opportunely arrived at Radisbon to urge some kind of intervention in the war on the part of the emperor, and the Diet resolved that the emperor's mediation should be offered to the Spanish government. Many opportunities have come to Maximilian in his life and had been lost to him. This, which would have exposed his European statesmanship to a test such as it had never fairly met, was snatched from him by the hand of death. While the message of dismissal was being read to the Diet, the emperor lay dying. He refused to receive the last sacraments of the Church of Rome, and, in the words of one of those who stood disappointed at his deathbed, died as he had lived, October 12, 1576. The situation which Maximilian II left behind him at home in the empire was one which could not be remedied by good intentions, even if these sprang from a singularly clear intelligence and a generous aversion from intolerance and bigotry. In his last message to his last diet, he had declared himself to be, in the religious dispute, of no party, but if he had sought to place the imperial authority above party by effecting a clear and equitable revision of the religious peace, it might still have proved possible to dispel some, at least, of the gathering clouds. As it was, the only settlement to which all parties could appeal was left dangerously open to misinterpretation and neglect, for the Protestant princes were continuing their assault upon Catholic foundations, and Catholic authorities were beginning to force back Protestant subjects into the forms of worship of the Church of Rome, or to drive them from house to house. The empire confessed its impotence to interpret, to pronounce, even to protest, and inevitably the mutually adverse parties and interests were looking for sympathy and support in return for services rendered or to be rendered beyond the frontier. Thus, a full generation before the outbreak of the Thirty Years' War, its germs are already visible in the reign of Maximilian II, who in face of the conflict was unequal to choosing his side. End of section 19. Section 20 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6, The Revolt of the Netherlands, by the Reverend George Edmondson, Part 1. In 1555, an event occurred destined to be of critical importance in the history of the Netherlands the world-famous abdication of Charles V. The emperor was but fifty-five years old, when, prematurely aged and already worn out by a life of incessant care and strife, he took the momentous resolve which he had had for some years meditated, to hand over his dominions to his son Philip and spend the rest of his days in the retirement of a monastery. Philip, already invested with the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily and the Duchy of Milan, and compensated for the loss of the empire by becoming, through his marriage with Mary Tudor, King Consort of England, was residing in that country when in the early summer of 1555 he was summoned by his father to Brussels. 
Charles was the wearer of many crowns, but amongst them all, as a final token of his peculiar affection for his native land, it was his abdication of the sovereignty of the seventeen provinces of the Burgundian Netherlands that he resolved to mark specially by an act of solemn and impressive publicity. The ceremony took place in the great hall of the Palace of Brussels. Hither, on the afternoon of Friday, October twenty fifth, 1555, the deputies of the provinces repaired. They took their seats before a dais, in the center of which, beneath a canopy emblazoned with the arms of Burgundy, were three gilt chairs of state, the central one for the emperor, that on the right for King Philip, that on the left for the regent, Maria, Queen of Hungary. On one side sat the knights of the Golden Fleece, on the other the great notables, in front the members of the Council of State, the Privy Council, and the Council of Finance. After executing the deed of abdication and attending Mass in the private chapel, Charles entered the hall, walking with difficulty, his right hand resting upon the shoulder of the youthful William, Prince of Orange. He was followed by Philip, Queen Maria of Hungary, his sister Eleanor, Dowager Queen of France, his nephew Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, and a resplendent train of great nobles and officials. The spacious hall was crowded to the door, and the vast assemblage, which had risen to greet their sovereign for the last time, waited now breathlessly expectant for what was to follow. After Duke Philibert had stated, at the emperor's command, the reasons for which the assemblage had been called together, Charles himself rose to speak. He gave an account of his long and eventful reign, thanked his subjects for their constant dutifulness and affection, and asked them to show to his son the same love and loyalty that they had exhibited towards himself. He specially commended to them the maintenance of the true faith and obedience to the church, and concluded by asking them to forgive any errors into which he might have fallen, and any wrongs which he might have unwittingly committed. At this point, overcome by his growing emotion, the emperor's voice refused to proceed. The delivery of a lengthy and fulsome reply on behalf of the States General by Jacques Mays, pensionary of Antwerp, despite its prolixity, came no doubt as a not unwelcome interlude between the outburst of deep feeling which Charles's words had aroused and that which was called forth when the emperor again rose and proceeded to invest his son, who knelt before him, with the sovereignty of the Netherlands. It was a moment when, in the tension of men's minds, Philip might have seized his opportunity to use gracious language, which would have gained him at once a place in the hearts of his new subjects. That he did not do so was less due to his coldness of temperament than to his inability to express himself in any language but Spanish. Flemish he could not speak at all, and after a few words in French, he found himself obliged to call upon Antoine Perrineau, Bishop of Arras, to address the audience in his place. The contrast between father and son could scarcely have been more strikingly exhibited. The new ruler of the Netherlands, who had thus publicly proclaimed himself a foreigner in their midst, was twenty-eight years of age. His general outward appearance was not unlike his father's, and distinctively that of a man with Teutonic blood in his veins. But it is not possible for two human beings to be further apart in temper and character than were the grave, silent, sedentary, undecided Philip and the restless, purposeful, energetic warrior statesman, whose promptitude of resource alike in the cabinet and in the field was no less conspicuous than the good-humored geniality of his manner, which subdued men's hearts. On October 26, 1555, the day following the grand ceremony of the abdication, Philip received the deputies of the seventeen provinces, who renewed the oath of allegiance they had already taken to him as heir apparent in 1548, and he, on his part, again solemnly swore to maintain in each province all ancient rights, privileges, and customs, without infringing the same or suffering them to be infringed. Possibly, when he took those oaths, Philip had no intention of deliberately committing an act of perjury. The policy he adopted at the outset in the Netherlands certainly followed with precision the lines laid down by his father. It was the man, far more than the measures, that was the inciting cause of the troubles that ended in revolt. One of his first acts was to appoint his cousin Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, to be regent. 
scarcely any but Spaniards were admitted to his intimate councils, with the exception of the Bishop of Arras, the son of Charles's trusted adviser, Granvelle. This statesman, though at first kept in the background, by force of sheer ability and proved usefulness, gradually acquired greater and greater influence. On February 5, 1556, through the mediation of the Queen of England, a truce for five years was patched up with France at Valsells. It was not, however, on either side intended to last any longer than was convenient, and in the following year it was wantonly broken by King Henry. War ensued, in which the English Queen, much against the will of her people, was induced by her husband to take part. It was marked by the great victories achieved over the French at St. Quentin, August 10, 1557, and at Gravelines, July 13, 1558. Both of these were won by the impetuous valor of La Morale, Count of Egmont, at the head of the Flemish cavalry, who at Gravelines was much assisted by the cannon of the English fleet. These two crushing defeats brought France to her knees, and the peace was concluded in February 1559 at Cateau Cambrésis. The terms were entirely to the advantage of the Spanish king, who had no scruple in allowing the French to recoup themselves at the expense of his English ally. In the course of the war, Calais had been captured in the winter by a coup de main by a French force under the Duke of Guise. The death of Queen Mary severed the only link which bound together the interests of Philip and the island realm. The restoration of all the French conquests of the previous eight years and the hand of the Princess Elizabeth of France were cheaply purchased by acquiescence in the surrender of a town whose fate was now to the Spanish negotiators a matter of little or no moment. The success of Philip in thus triumphantly dictating terms to the ancient enemy of his house was not accompanied by equal success in his efforts to enforce his will on his subjects within his own borders. It was during this time that the first seeds were sown of that dissatisfaction and discontent which were to bring forth so terrible a crop of misfortunes and bloodshed. The outbreak of the revolt of the Netherlands has been almost universally assigned by historians to a series of well-defined causes, all of which are to be traced to the course of internal policy pursued by Philip during the opening years of his rule. These causes may be discussed under the following heads, financial embarrassments, the placards against heresy, the Inquisition, the new bishoprics, and hatred of foreign domination. Charles V had drawn from the Netherland provinces the necessary supplies for carrying on his wars. To this end, he was obliged to impose heavy taxation. By a tactful admixture of persuasion and of force, he succeeded in wringing from his subjects vast sums, which they grudged because they were so often expended on objects in which the Netherlanders felt no interest and had no concern. He left the country and the treasury burdened with debt. Philip, on ascending the throne, found himself face to face with a most difficult financial situation, and despite his dislike of popular assemblies, was compelled to call together the States General to vote supplies. They met accordingly at Brussels, March 12, 1556. He asked for a grant of 1,300,000 florins to meet the charges that must be paid, and proposed the levy of a tax of 1%, the hundredth penny, upon real estate and of 2% upon movable property, to be paid in three installments. This proposition at once aroused strong opposition and was rejected by all the larger provinces. Philip was too haughty to follow the example of his father in using personal means for securing the support of influential members of the states to his proposals, his ignorance of the language being in itself a considerable hindrance to his attempting such a course. He was thus obliged to accept a commutation offered by the states and to submit at the outset of his reign to a rebuff which was the prelude to others of a like kind. The debt which Philip had to discharge was not of his own making. The sum he asked for was no larger than the grants that had been frequently voted at the demand of Charles. Yet such was the prejudice excited from the first by their new ruler's manner and temper, that in the eyes of his suspicious subjects, when he lifted up his little finger, it seemed to be thicker than his father's loins. In the matter of the placards against heresy, Philip again simply followed in the footsteps of his predecessor 
and endeavored loyally to carry out the solemn injunctions laid upon him by the emperor on the day of his abdication. Charles had issued during his reign a succession of placards or edicts to put down the spread of the reformed doctrines in his dominions, the last and most severe of these bearing the date September 25, 1550. This edict abolished all previous enactments as not being sufficiently thorough, its object as stated in the preamble being to exterminate the root and ground of this pest. It decreed the punishment of death by the sword, by the pit, and by fire against all who sold, read, copied, or received heretical books, who broke or injured images of the Blessed Virgin or of the saints, who held or permitted conventicles, who disputed upon the Holy Scriptures in public or secretly, or who preached or maintained the doctrines of condemned writers. It offered to informers half the property of the accused, and it expressly forbade the judge to mitigate the punishments on any pretext whatsoever. It even threatened with the same fate as the delinquents any person or persons who should presume to intercede on their behalf. During the regency of Maria of Hungary, thousands had miserably perished by the hand of the executioner under these terrible decrees. That Philip was nothing loath to undertake the charge laid upon him, we may well believe. The doctrines which Charles had so strenuously endeavored to repress, chiefly from motives of political expediency, his son wished to extirpate under the burning impulse of bigoted religious zeal. Nevertheless, he made at first no innovation. He merely confirmed the edict of 1550, just as it stood, and directed that it should be enforced. In an exactly similar way, the papal inquisition was introduced into the greater part of the Netherland provinces by Charles and was handed on as a legacy to his successor. The first inquisitor-general was commissioned at the request of the emperor by Pope Adrian VI, and the system thus begun continued with gradually extended powers until by the instructions issued in 1550, all judicial officers were made subservient to the inquisition, and they were ordered to carry out its sentences, notwithstanding any privileges or charters to the contrary. In the matter of the increase of the episcopate, Philip again was but attempting to remedy an admitted evil, which the pressure of other affairs had alone prevented his father from dealing with. In 1555 there were but three dioceses in the whole of the Netherland provinces, those of Tournay, Arras, and Utrecht, all of unwieldy size, especially the last named, which comprised the whole of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht, besides the greater part of the provinces of Friesland, Overysel, Drenthe, and Groningen. A considerable portion of the Netherlands, moreover, lay outside of the boundaries of these three dioceses and was under the jurisdiction of foreign prelates. Luxembourg, for instance, was divided between six bishops, none of whom resided in the duchy. Charles, early in his career, sought to remedy this state of things, and, but for the sudden demise of Adrian VI, a scheme for the erection of a number of new sees would in all probability have received the papal sanction in 1522. The emperor's quarrel with Clement VII and other causes rendered the latter efforts of Charles abortive, although they were renewed at intervals, his last instruction on the subject bearing the date of 1551. Philip, then, when he obtained a bull from Paul IV for the erection of a number of new bishoprics, was merely carrying out a previously conceived plan. His scheme differed from his father's only in proposing that the number of sees should be fourteen instead of six. In 1522, the change would probably have been accepted readily as a much-needed reform. In 1557, both the man and the time had altered. Everything that Philip did was viewed with mistrust, and the great increase in the number of bishops was looked upon as a first step to the introduction of the dreaded form of the Inquisition as established in Spain. The Spanish terror had in fact already gained possession of men's minds and aroused a feeling of instinctive opposition, mingled with antipathy to the Spanish king and all his countrymen. Here we come upon the cause which underlies all the other causes of the troubles in the Netherlands, and which furnishes the key to the right understanding of all that follows. It was not so much the measures of Philip, however questionable these might be, which stirred up a sullen resistance, so soon to be fanned into open revolt, as his personality, that of a foreigner, 
and the representative of a hateful foreign despotism. These various causes of dissatisfaction were already stirring up widespread discontent throughout the provinces, when, with the departure of the king, a fresh stage began. Philip, after his accession, spent four years in the midst of his northern subjects, but he had never loved them or their ways, and the Treaty of Cateau Cambrésis was no sooner signed than he determined at the earliest opportunity to return to Spain. By the provisions of that treaty, the Duke of Savoy had once more entered into the possession of his ancestral domains, and was therefore no longer able to fill the post of governor of the Netherlands. Philip had some little difficulty in selecting, among many aspirants, a suitable person for the vacant dignity. His choice finally fell upon his half-sister, Margaret, Duchess of Parma. This question settled, the king at once made his arrangements for a speedy leave-taking. In July 1559, he summoned the chapter of the Golden Fleece, the last that ever met, to assemble at Ghent. Over this assembly, which filled up no fewer than 14 vacancies in the order, he presided in person. A few weeks later, he bade farewell in the same town to the States General, and finally he set sail from Flushing on August 26th for Spain. He was never again to visit the Netherlands. Margaret, Duchess of Parma, into whose hands the reins of power now fell, was at this time 37 years of age. She was a natural daughter of Charles V. Her mother was a Fleming, and she had been brought up in the Netherlands under the charge of her aunts Margaret of Austria and Maria of Hungary. At the age of 12, she had been married to Alessandro de' Medici, who died a year later. After eight years of widowhood, she had to accept as her second husband Ottavio Farnese, nephew of Pope Paul III, while yet a boy of 13 years. Margaret was a woman of masculine character and marked ability, a worthy niece of the two eminent women who had been her predecessors in the regency. The reasons which influenced Philip in his choice were doubtless in the first place that Margaret was a native of the country and could speak the language freely. In the second, that owing to her long residence in Italy, she had no connection with any of the parties or party leaders in the Netherlands and was, moreover, through her position, entirely dependent upon himself. The power entrusted to the new governor, though nominally extensive, was in fact strictly limited by secret instructions, which bound her to carry out the edicts against heretics without infraction, alteration, or moderation, and enjoined her to follow in all matters the advice of the three councils, the Council of State, the Privy Council, and the Council of Finance. These three councils were supposed to be quite independent of each other, but in reality the wide range of the functions of the Council of State caused it to overshadow in importance the other two. The president of the Council of Finance, which had the superintendence of the public expenditure, was at this time Baron de Barlemont. The Privy Council, which had the control of law and justice, was under the presidency of Viglius, the author of the Edict of 1550. The Council of State, to which were entrusted the conduct of foreign affairs, interprovincial relations, the making of treaties, and all other affairs of the highest national importance, consisted at first of Viglius and Barlemont, and the Bishop of Arras, together with the Prince of Orange and Count Egmont. It was soon found, however, that the last two, though it was deemed advisable because of their great influence with the people to make them nominally councillors of state, were, as a matter of fact, rarely consulted. The whole power rested with the inner conclave of these three colleagues, devoted adherents of Philip, and of these the Bishop of Arras held indisputably the first place, alike from his preeminent abilities and tried experience in affairs. Antoine Perrineau de Granvelle was born August 20, 1517. He was one of the numerous children of Nicolas Perrineau, afterwards Seigneur de Granvelle, who, springing from a middle-class family of Ornans in the Franche Comte near Besançon, attracted by his talents and capability the favorable notice of Charles V, and became for thirty years that sovereign's chief confidant and adviser. On the death of his father in 1550, Granvelle, who at the youthful age of twenty-three had been made Bishop of Arras, and had already been entrusted with many important commissions, was called by the emperor to take his father's place. 
he now found such full scope for the display of extraordinary capacity as to win the entire confidence and esteem not only of Charles but of Philip. During the four years of Philip's residence at Brussels, Granvelle had succeeded in rendering himself indispensable to his master. Such was his facility that he was said to be able to tire out five secretaries while dictating to them in five different languages at the same time. A keen observer, the Venetian ambassador Michel Serrano, when describing the chief counselors and favorites of Philip, said that all of them together were not worth the Bishop of Arras. It was in the hands of this man that the king in a large measure placed the government of the Netherlands when his sister was appointed regent. Viglius and Barlemont were his trusted coadjutors, but the direction of affairs and of policy remained with Granvelle alone. He corresponded directly with Philip on all matters of state, and all dispatches and letters passed under his eyes before they were submitted to the regent or were discussed by his colleagues. Only such documents, or portions of documents, as were indicated by the bishop, were laid by Margaret before the Council of State. It is not to be wondered at, therefore, that many of the leading members of the ancient nobility of the country should resent the virtual monopolization of the regent's ear and of the administration by this small body of the king's friends, and should view with particular jealousy the ever-growing power of the ambitious and masterful ecclesiastic who, in the privacy of his cabinet, secretly controlled all the springs of government. Foremost among those dissatisfied nobles stood the Count of Egmont and the Prince of Orange. La Morale, Count of Egmont and Prince of Gavre, the victor of St. Quentin and of Graveline, was the head of an ancient and distinguished family, and possessed of large estates. Through his mother, Francoise of Luxembourg, he had inherited the Principality of Gavre, and through his wife, Sabina of Bavaria, he was brother-in-law of the Elector Palatine, Frederick III. Born in 1522, he had, from his youth, devoted himself to the pursuit of arms and gained early distinction in the field. So early as 1546, Charles V recompensed his services with the collar of the Golden Fleece. In 1554, he went to England to ask the hand of Mary Tudor for his master's son, and was present at the marriage celebrated in Winchester Cathedral. His greatest fame was won in the campaigns of 1557 and 1558, when, by his conduct and courage, he so largely brought about the complete defeat of the French arms. He had been since appointed Stadtholder of Brabant and Artois. His fine presence, open manner, and splendid exploits combined to make him a popular hero. Unfortunately, his intelligence was not deep. He was vain, easily led, and not endowed with a firm will. His intentions were good, but the resolution to carry them out was sometimes wanting at the critical moment. A very different man was his younger contemporary, William of Nassau, Prince of Orange. Born at Dillenburg on April 25, 1533, he was, when Margaret came to the Netherlands, but 26 years of age. The family of Nassau had long held a very high position among the ruling families of the Rhineland, and by a series of splendid marriages, the younger branch of Dillenburg had, during successive centuries, acquired vast possessions, not only in Germany, but to an even larger extent in the Netherlands. At the beginning of the 15th century, Engelbert I, by his marriage with the heiress of the Lord of Polonen, became possessed of great estates in Brabant which included the town of Breda, henceforth the family home. His son, Engelbert II, who during a long lifetime served the House of Burgundy and Habsburg with the highest distinction, was succeeded by his brother John, who on his death bequeathed his Netherland possessions to his elder son Henry, and his German to his second son William, the father of William the Silent. Henry became the foremost member of the whole House of Nassau, he was one of those appointed to take charge of the education of the young Archduke Charles and remained through life his most trusted friend and servant, being largely instrumental in securing for him in 1520 the imperial crown. In 1515, Charles obtained for Henry the hand of Claude, sister of Philibert, Prince of Orange Chalons. This prince, dying childless, by his will left his nephew René, the son of Henry and Claude, his heir 
Thus, this small principality, situated in the midst of French territory, passed into the hands of the House of Nassau, with which the titular dignity has been ever since. The intrinsic value of the territory was trifling, but to their rule of it, dependent on no overlord, the possessors of Orange owed their status of sovereign princes. René, who had succeeded to his father's place in the emperor's affections, was at the early age of 26 years mortally wounded at the siege of Saint-Dizier in 1544, and having no legitimate children, bequeathed by will all his titles and immense possessions to his cousin William. The boy had, up till this time, lived with his parents at the ancestral home, the Castle of Dillenburg. His mother, Juliana of Stolberg, had first been married to Count Philip of Hainault, then to Count William of Nassau. By her second husband, she had five sons, of whom the new Prince of Orange was the eldest, and seven daughters. Both William and Juliana had embraced the Lutheran faith, but they were obliged to allow their son to go to Brussels, to be henceforth educated as a Catholic, under the eye of the regent, Maria of Hungary. This was a condition imposed by Charles in giving his ratification to René's testamentary dispositions. The emperor from the first showed a remarkable interest in the boy, who, under the tuition of Jerome Perrineau, a younger brother of the Bishop of Arras, made rapid progress in his studies and learned to speak and write with ease in five languages, Flemish, German, Spanish, French, and Latin. In 1550, when he was 17 years of age, Charles had given him the hand of Anne of Egmont, only child and heiress of Maximilian, Count of Borren. The marriage, to judge from the extant correspondence between them, would seem to have been a fairly happy one. Eight years later, Anne died, leaving as the issue of their union a son, Philip William, and a daughter. As a favorite page of the emperor, William early became acquainted with the ways of courts and at 19 he began to serve his military apprenticeship. So well did he acquit himself under the critical eye of the most experienced soldier of his day, that when William was only 21 years of age, Charles gave him the command-in-chief of an army of 20,000 men. It was from this command that he was called away to take so prominent a place at the ceremony of the abdication. As a general, William did nothing brilliant during this time, but he committed no false step, and secured the country from threatened invasion. He was even more successful as a diplomatist, when named with Rui Gond and Granvelle as a plenipotentiary for concluding peace with France, and the Treaty of Cateau Cambrésis was in no small measure due to his skill as a negotiator. He was one of the state hostages, the others being Count Egmont and the Dukes of Alva and Erchot, who went to Paris as a security for the carrying out of the terms of peace. It was at this time, according to the account given in his own famous Apologia, that he first became aware of a secret understanding between the kings of Spain and France to extirpate heresy by fire and sword from their dominions, and, although still nominally a Catholic, was so filled with pity and compassion as to resolve henceforth to try and drive away, to use his own words, this vermin of Spaniards out of my country. At this time, too, apparently by his habitual discreetness, he first gained that sobriquet of Le Taciturn, the silent, which has ever since been attached to his name. There had doubtless never been much sympathy between Philip and William. The king had indeed, on his assumption of the sovereignty, made his father's youthful favorite a counselor of state and a knight of the Golden Fleece, had employed him on important missions, and had appointed him stadtholder of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht. But there was a feeling of coolness between them, which gradually passed into antagonism. Already, before the departure of Philip, the prince had assumed the leadership of constitutional resistance to royal despotism. It was he that had urged the States General, in 1559, to press for the withdrawal of the Spanish troops, and to make this withdrawal a condition for voting supplies. The king knew to whom he owed this rebuff, for when he was bidding farewell to the nobles before setting foot on the ship that was to carry him to Spain, he took the opportunity of publicly upbraiding the prince for his action. In vain, William, with all deference, submitted that what had been done was the action of the states. No, not the states, but you, 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 shouted Philip in fierce anger. End of section 20. Read by Colleen McMahon.
Section 21 of the Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6, The Revolt of the Netherlands, by the Rev. George Edmondson, Part 2. Margaret of Parma was most assiduous in her attention to her new duties, and, had circumstances been more favorable, would doubtless have made a good regent. From the beginning, however, her path was beset with difficulties. The presence of the Spanish troops, the enforcing of the edicts against heresy, and the carrying out of the bull of Paul IV, renewed by Pius IV in January 1560, for the formation of the new bishoprics, irritated the people. Margaret, with her consulta, as it was called, the three confidential advisers Grenville, Viglius, and Barlemont, imposed on her by the king, found themselves confronted with opposition on every side. Orange and Egmont resigned their commands of the Spanish regiments as a protest against the continued presence of the foreigners in the land. They absented themselves from meetings of the Council of State, and finally, July 1561, wrote to Philip himself protesting against matters of great public importance being transacted without their knowledge or concurrence, and asked to be relieved of functions which were merely nominal. At this stage of affairs, both the government and its opponents were manifestly, in their own belief, acting loyally in the best interests of king and country. The attitude of Orange and Egmont was no doubt in part due to jealousy of Grenville, and Granvelle, on his side, was certainly ambitious of power for its own sake, and provokingly overbearing in the exercise of it. But the voluminous correspondence still extant, from a period prolific in letter writers, enables the historian of today to judge the motives and conduct of the principal actors in the Netherland drama with an impartial clearness impossible to contemporary writers, however painstaking or well-informed. The published records of the time reveal much that is commendable not only in Margaret, but in Granvelle and Viglius likewise. Both the regent and Granvelle urged the withdrawal of the Spanish troops, and it was by their action that the regiments, which had been marched from the frontiers to the island of Valcheron, were, without awaiting direct orders from Madrid, embarked for the Mediterranean. Cardinal Granvelle, he had obtained the hat in February 1561, was not at heart a persecutor. He did not believe, nor did Viglius, in the efficacy of repressing opinions by brute force and cruelty, and they would, if left to themselves, have exercised a politic discretion and moderation in inflicting punishment. They were, however, only the servants of a master, who, though undecided in will and procrastinating in temper, kept all authority in his own hands. In the recesses of his cabinet in far-off Spain, every detail of policy in the Netherlands was weighed and considered by the king himself, and none dared act or refrain from acting without his permission. All who held office under Philip knew well that to show the smallest mercy to heretics would forfeit forever the favor of the king. Orange, on his side, was certainly at this time perfectly loyal to his sovereign, and conformed outwardly to the Catholic faith. In urging Egmont, as to whose fidelity alike to king and faith no question can be raised, and other great nobles to stand up in defense of the chartered liberties of Brabant, of Flanders, and of Holland against despotic rule, he was acting with perfect constitutional propriety. How far the local independence of provinces and municipalities was compatible with the good government and welfare of the Netherlands as a whole, was not the problem which he had just now to determine. It may fairly be pleaded that he was acting entirely within his rights as a great magnate and officer in using these charters and privileges, sanctioned as they had so lately been by the king's solemn oath, to prevent the encroachments of foreign and autocratic rule. The blame for everything that was wrong, notably for the increase in the number of bishoprics, was placed on the shoulders of Granvelle by the malcontents, foremost among whom, with Orange and Egmont, was now to be found Philip de Montmorency, Count Van Horn, and Admiral of Flanders. 
By his contemporaries, the cardinal was believed to be the author and proposer of the bishopric scheme. The archives of Madrid and Besançon tell us, however, that it was not so. The Bishop of Arras had been kept in entire ignorance of the proposal until the Pope's bull had actually been obtained, and at first he was not in favor of it. It is more honorable, such were his own words, to be one of four than one of seventeen, but he yielded to the king's wishes and accepted with some demur the offer of the primacy, as Archbishop of Malines, and having done so henceforth exerted himself to the utmost to carry the matter through. Nothing that he did probably cost him so much unpopularity. Soon he and Orange grew estranged from one another and finally ceased further intercourse. During this time, the negotiations for the second marriage of William were proceeding, and they occupy a very large space in contemporary records. His first wife died in March 1558, and only a few months later we find him again turning his thoughts to matrimony. As an ambitious politician, he probably looked upon a good match as a matter of great importance for his future prospects. After being disappointed in obtaining the hand of René of Lorraine, he turned his eyes in another and somewhat unexpected direction. The object of his choice was Anne, daughter and heiress of the Elector Maurice of Saxony and granddaughter of Philip of Hesse. She was in her seventeenth year, not well favored and only fairly well endowed, but from her near relationship to the two great German Protestant leaders, her alliance carried with it great potential influence. For almost two years, the prince had to use all his diplomatic talents to secure his end. King Philip objected to so important a subject marrying a heretic, and, above all others, the daughter of a man who had conducted himself towards the emperor his father, as Duke Maurice had, while the old landgrave of Hesse, who for his faith had suffered cruel treatment from Charles, was even more strongly opposed to his granddaughter's union with a papist. At last, William had his way. No pressure was to be put upon Anne in the matter of her religious opinions and worship, but she was to live Catholicly. The marriage ceremony took place with Lutheran rites at Dresden, August 1561, and so lavish was the expenditure on the occasion that it was said that the bride's entire dowry would not cover the cost. In December 1561, Granvelle, as archbishop, made his state entry into Malines, but found a cold reception. No nobles or knights of the fleece were there to greet him. The new bishoprics aroused general opposition. A protest was raised against the diversion of the revenues of the monasteries and against the nomination by the king of so many official members of the states, but it was the increase in the number of Episcopal inquisitors that was especially dreaded. The Reformation had been making great headway in the Netherlands, more particularly in the commercial centers, and a considerable minority of the population were more or less infected by the new Protestant doctrines. Philip continually urged the government to enforce the edicts in the most rigorous manner. Strenuous efforts were accordingly made, with the result that the Inquisition, papal and episcopal, whose delegates were to be found in every district, daily rendered itself more and more odious to the people by its merciless persecution. Notorious among its agents was a certain Peter Teitelman, of whose barbarities the annals of the time are full. The regent found, however, the greatest difficulty in getting the civil authorities to carry out the executions. More especially, the Marquis of Bergen, Stadtholder of Hainault, Valenciennes, and Cambrai, and Floris de Montmorency, brother of Horn, Baron of Montigny, and Stadtholder of Tournay, expressed their detestation of the system by declining as far as possible to give effect to the sentences of the inquisitors. All the blame was laid on Granvelle, and discontent steadily grew. Horn, who on his return from Spain had been made a counselor of state, proposed the formation of a league against the cardinal, and allied himself closely with Orange and Egmont in their efforts to overthrow his authority. The three nobles henceforth worked together, and had no difficulty in securing the active cooperation of Counts Megham, Hoogstraten, Brederode, and Mansfeld, and the Seigneur de Gleon, the last a counselor of state. Overtures were made to the Duke of Ayrshire, Count Arenberg, and Baron Barlemont, 
but these threw in their lot with the attacked ministers, and Barlemont went so far as to reveal all he knew about the malcontents and their plans to the regent. The League was a declaration of war by the nobles against the cardinal, and henceforth they did their utmost by secret intrigue, as well as by open opposition, to wreck his influence. But little scruple was shown on either side as to choice of means. In the autumn of 1562, Montigny went to Spain to expose the grievances of the nobility against Granville to Philip. He achieved nothing. Philip denied that he had made out any cause for complaint, but promised that he would himself visit the Netherlands and then make inquiry. Finding, however, that there was little immediate prospect of a royal visit, and meanwhile no redress of grievances, the three leaders determined, in March 1563, to write to the king, stating that they declined to sit with Granville in the council, and begging, as loyal Catholic subjects and vassals, that the king would save the country from ruin by the removal of a man who was detested by all. They had no complaint, they added, against the Duchess of Parma. The letter, though approved by Bergen and Montigny, was only signed by Orange, Egmont, and Horn. After a delay of some months, the king on June 6th answered shortly that he was not accustomed to aggrieve any of his ministers without cause, and invited one of the signatories to go to Madrid to discuss the matter by word of mouth. He also wrote privately to Egmont, asking him to undertake the mission. This was done by Granville's own advice, who believed that Egmont might, by skillful flattery and promises, be induced to detach himself from his friends. But after consulting with Orange and Horn, he made bold to decline the royal invitation. From this time, all three abstained entirely from attending the sittings of the Council of State. The next step taken by the Confederates was to press upon the regent the advisability of convoking the States General, and in an interview attended by Orange, Egmont, Horn, Bergen, Mansfeld, and Megham, Montigny was ill, the prince, as spokesman, discussed the position of affairs at length and reaffirmed the determination of himself and his colleagues not to take any part in the Council of State, as their advice was disdained and so many things of moment transacted without their cognizance. Margaret replied that she could not summon the States General of her own initiative and tried to defend the Cardinal and to persuade the nobles not to persist in their resolution. It was in vain. Three days after this interview, on July 29, 1563, another letter was dispatched to the king by Orange, Egmont, and Horn, reiterating their complaints against Granville and asking outright for his dismissal. Meanwhile, the Duchess was beginning to feel overwhelmed by difficulties out of which she saw no way. Little by little, her confidence in the cardinal began to wane, and, tired perhaps of his arrogance and dominating manners, she determined to send her own secretary, Armenteros, to Spain to consult with the king. On September 15th, he reached Philip at Monzon and was at once granted an interview of four hours' duration. Margaret, in her letter, laid before her brother the miserable condition of the finances and the failure of the edicts to check the rapid spread of heretical opinions and discussed at length the quarrel between the cardinal and the nobles. She had, she said, the highest opinion of the minister's merits, devotion, and capacity, but to keep him in the Netherlands against the will of the nobles would entail grave inconvenience and might lead to insurrection. Alarmed and puzzled at the course that affairs were taking, Philip at this juncture sought the advice of the Duke of Alva. Every time, he answered, that I see the missives of these three seigneurs, they fill me with rage so that unless I exerted the utmost control over myself, my opinions would appear to your majesty those of one frenzied. It was, he urged, simple effrontery to propose that the cardinal should retire, and very inconvenient. The right method to deal with them was chastisement, but since it was not practicable at the moment to cut off the heads of the leaders as they deserved, it would be best to dissemble with them, and try to divide them by gaining over Egmont. Meanwhile, as the king was deliberating, things in the Netherlands were going from bad to worse. It happened that on December 15th, Egmont, Bergen, and Montigny were present at a banquet given by Gaspar Schatz, Seigneur de Grobendonck, the king's financial agent at Brussels. 
During dinner, the conversation chanced to fall upon the sumptuousness displayed by the Netherland nobles, more particularly in the matter of liveries, as compared with what was usual in Germany. The ostentation of the cardinal was specially dwelt upon, and on the spur of the minute it was resolved by the guests that they would set the example of a simpler style by all agreeing to adopt a quite plain livery. The question arose, who should choose it? It was agreed that the lot should decide. This fell upon Egmont. In a few days, accordingly, his servants appeared clad in coarse gray frieze with long hanging sleeves. On the sleeve was embroidered what might have been taken for a monk's cow or a fool's cap and bells. The device caught hold of the popular imagination and was rapidly adopted as a party badge by the anti-cardinalists. The regent protested to Egmont against the badge, which was supposed to caricature Granville, and it was replaced by a bundle of arrows. This emblem, being found on the escutcheon of Castile, was taken to signify that the wearers were bound together in dutiful obedience to their sovereign. Whatever it might mean, the new liveries caused an extraordinary excitement. Philip at last felt that despite the advice of Alva, Granville must be sacrificed, but it must not appear that he was dismissed by the king. After some months of cogitation, Philip, on January 23, 1564, dispatched Armenteros with a reply to his sister's letter, in which he touched upon the various points she had raised, expressed his strong displeasure at the letter received by him from the three nobles, and added that, as to Granvelle, since they would not specify the grounds of their complaints, he must deliberate further. He also sent a private note to Margaret, stating that for a special reason he had kept back his reply to the lords, as he wished her letter to arrive first. He enclosed two private letters for Egmont, one of which only the Duchess was to deliver, as seemed to her judgment preferable, severally accepting and declining a recent offer of Egmont to visit Spain. It was the latter that the regent handed to Egmont. There were letters also, both for him and for Orange, written by the secretary Arasso, in which the king said that he placed great confidence in them and flattered himself that they would not only be obedient to his orders, but would do their best not to compromise his service and the good of the land. But Armenteros was the bearer of yet another dispatch addressed to the cardinal, containing a letter headed, by the hand of the king, secret. In this, Philip, after expressing his regret at the ill will shown to his minister in the Netherlands, proceeds, For these causes I have thought it would be well, in order to allow the hatred which they bear you to grow calm, and to see how they will remedy matters, that you should leave these provinces for some days in order to see your mother, and that with the knowledge and permission of the Duchess of Parma, you should beg her to write to me to obtain my approbation. In this manner, neither your authority nor mine will be touched. On March 1st, about a week after Armenteros had reached Brussels and delivered his missives, the courier arrived bringing the king's reply to the nobles. It briefly ordered them to resume their seats in the Council of State, and said that with regard to Grenville, the charges must be substantiated and time given to consider the matter maturely. This letter, though written at the same time as the others, bore a date February 19th, more than three weeks later. Such was the complicated arrangement by which Philip hoped to accomplish the removal of the cardinal, without anyone but Granville himself knowing that the dismissal came from the king. He succeeded, for Granville, who had for some time perceived that his day was over, loyally and submissively bowed to his master's decision. So well indeed was the secret preserved, that until Gachard's discovery in 1862 of the minute of Philip's letter at Simancas, the truth, though suspected, was never actually revealed. All happened according to the prearranged plan. Granville asked leave to visit his mother, whom he had not seen for nineteen years, and on March 13th, accompanied by his brother, the Count of Chantenay, and a brilliant suite, he left Brussels never to return. The demonstration of the public rejoicing at his departure was almost indecent. The joy of the nobles, writes Viglius, was like that of schoolboys on getting away from their master. The cardinal retired to his paternal estates near Besançon, without indeed withdrawing from public affairs, for he corresponded with rulers and statesmen in many countries. 
but the tone of even more than philosophical resignation which breathed through the cardinal's letters during this quiet interlude in his busy life was probably no pretense there is much that is really great in his character and the odium which was aroused against his administration was largely due to misrepresentations willfully disseminated as to his conduct and his motives many of these emanated from simon renard a burgundian like granvelle who had, by the friendship of the cardinal and his father before him, become Spanish ambassador in France and England, but who, disappointed at not being made counselor of state, had turned on his benefactor. A study of the great minister's correspondence makes it quite clear that nearly all of the grievances alleged against him were without foundation, and that, so far from being cruel or vindictive, his counsels were always on the side of moderation, and his conduct toward his enemies, with the single exception of Reynard, who may be said to have been undeserving of clemency, was magnanimity itself. The immediate result of Granville's departure was the reappearance of Orange, Egmont, and Horn in the Council of State, and the complete discomfiture of the cardinalists. The regent, tired of the tutelage in which she had been held, welcomed the change, and at once admitted the nobles to her full confidence and favor. She advised Philip to employ Granville elsewhere, and constantly invited the leading lords, especially Egmont, to her table. Orange and Horn wrote to the king March 27th, expressing their desire to serve him with zeal and devotion, and Orange sent a private letter to the same effect, in which he recalled the constant fidelity and brilliant services of the Nassaus to the House of Austria. For a short while things looked more hopeful, but it was an appearance only. The nobles as a body were self-seeking, and many of them burdened with debts and eager to replenish their empty purses by getting hold of lucrative appointments at the hands of the government. One of the consequences of the fall of Granville had been the abolition of the consulta. This was the name given in Spain to the body whose duty was to submit at regular intervals to the king's approval the names of persons to fill vacant preferments. The Spanish institution had been transferred by Philip to the Netherlands, and the duty was discharged by Granville, Viglius, and Barlemont. The power thus delegated to them was a distinct invasion of the privileges hitherto enjoyed by the stadtholders and the regent, and was deeply resented not merely by the nobles, but by Margaret herself. The time had now come to make up for lost opportunities. Granville was gone, Viglius and Barlemont thrust on one side, and treated with contumelious indifference. But if the appointments made by the consulta were dictated by political motives, those of their successors were tainted by sheer corruption and venality. The public sale of offices became a matter of common talk. The chief offender was Tomas Armenteros, the private secretary of the regent. This man lodged at the palace and was consulted on all public matters by the duchess, who allowed the bestowal of all preferments and benefices to pass through his hands. His nicknames, the Barber of Madame and Argentarios, sufficiently point to the contemptuous hatred which he excited, and to the cause of it. But he was not alone in filling his pockets with bribes and largesses. Margaret herself stooped to share the spoils, and the nobles connived or shut their eyes as long as their own greed was satisfied. The scenes at the council were far from edifying, and it is scarcely to be wondered at that Philip, who had spies everywhere and was fully informed by Granville and his other correspondents of all that was taking place, should have felt small confidence in the new order of things. It probably pleased him to see the weakness and faults of the administration, since it thus became less likely to offer opposition to his will, but a collision was soon to follow. An order arrived from Philip for carrying out the decrees of the Council of Trent throughout the Netherlands. The council had held its last sitting on December 4, 1563. On August 18, 1564, Philip issued his order. It caused a great sensation. The nobles protested. It was urged that the decrees, which dealt with a number of matters relating to the doctrine of the Church, the reform of ecclesiastical abuses, and the education of the people, could not be imposed on the Netherlands, as they contained provisions which constituted a breach of the privileges of the provinces and an invasion of the royal prerogatives. 
at a joint meeting of the Privy Council and the Council of State, despite the opposition of Viglius, it was determined to suspend the publication, and to beg the king not to insist on such ordinances as were not in conformity with the fundamental laws of the country. Philip, however, was inexorable. Throughout the country, public opinion expressed itself with increasing bitterness against the Inquisition, the placards, and the decrees. In the council, Orange pleaded earnestly for a mitigation of religious persecution. The regent did not know what course to take. In this emergency, it was determined to send Egmont on a special mission to lay before the king an exact account of the state of affairs and to endeavor to obtain from him redress of grievances. Egmont expressed his willingness to go. Viglius performed the duty of drawing up his instructions. When the draft was laid before the council for approval, Orange was far from satisfied with the tone and character of the document and expressed his opinion with boldness and force. It was his wish, he said, that the king should be plainly informed that it was impossible to carry out the placards or the decrees of the Council of Trent. Although a good Catholic, he denied to human authority the right to crush out by force liberty of conscience and of faith. He desired that the king should be asked plainly and directly to moderate the placards, to inquire into the prevalent venality and corruption, to reform the administration of justice and finance, and so to reorganize the Council of State as to increase its authority and preeminence. He spoke with an eloquence and earnestness which made a deep impression on his audience. It was a truly revolutionary proposal. Such was its effect upon Viglius that at night, when engaged in preparing his reply, the president, now an old man and in broken health, was struck with apoplexy. Next day, the instructions were revised by the council in accordance with the suggestions of Orange. Egmont started with a great train on January 18, 1565, but proceeded so slowly as not to arrive at Madrid till the first week in March. Philip resolved to receive him graciously. He knew the weak points of the victor of Gravelines and thought it would not be difficult to cajole him with flatteries and blandishments. The Spanish grandees followed their sovereign's lead. Egmont was entertained magnificently and gratified by considerable largesses, which, having a large family of daughters and being embarrassed with debts, he only too gladly accepted. But, although on other questions the king avowed his readiness to grant concessions, on the subject of religion he would not yield. And if Egmont was deceived as to his Catholic majesty's intentions, it can only have been that he was blinded by the splendor of his reception. The king had, in fact, called a gathering of some of the most learned theologians in Spain to consult them upon the religious position in the Netherlands. The conclave gave it as their opinion that the king might grant liberty of worship to prevent the greater evil of revolt. Philip replied he had not asked them whether he might, but whether he must. On receiving a negative answer, the king prayed aloud to be enabled always to persevere in his resolution never to consent to be called the master of those who rejected God as their Lord. From this solemn moment, Philip's course was inexorably marked out. Henceforth and through life, he was resolved never to allow personal or political considerations to weigh for a moment against that which he conceived to be his simple duty to God, whose anointed minister he was. In any case, Egmont's mission was doomed to inevitable failure. On the subject of the greatest of all the grievances from which the Netherlanders suffered, the king had inflexibly made up his mind never to yield, cost what it might. However much he temporized and dissembled as to other reforms, in the letter which Egmont carried back with him, Philip gave the malcontent nobles no hope in the matter of religion, for he plainly stated that he would rather sacrifice a hundred thousand lives than make any change of policy. Only in some small points of detail was he willing to modify the placards, and he suggested a conference of bishops and theologians to consider the best course to adopt. The regent took steps to carry out the royal wishes, but the conferences led to nothing. Egmont was angry at the deception which he thought had been practiced on him, and Orange and Horn refused to have anything to do with the matter, as the council had not been directly consulted. 
Margaret was fully aware of the dangers of the situation and did her utmost to persuade her brother either to make her position easier by concessions or to visit Brussels in person. He could then, she urged, learn for himself the true state of men's minds. The royal influence and authority could alone allay the spirit of unrest and discontent that was spreading through the provinces. But Philip was not like his father. Though he always professed his intention of visiting the recalcitrant provinces, he did so, there can be little doubt, merely to gain time. He was a man constitutionally averse from adopting energetic measures or acting with decision. Of him, the ambassador Chantenay, Grenville's brother, most truly said, everything is deferred from tomorrow till tomorrow, and his chief resolution is to remain irresolute. He had great belief in his powers of tortuous diplomacy, and instead of taking the prompt measures which are essential in a crisis, he sat brooding in his cabinet at Segovia and slowly evolving by what course of action he could best circumvent his difficulties, cajole his adversaries, and, it may be added, deceive his friends. End of section 21. Read by Colleen McMahon. Section 22 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6, The Revolt of the Netherlands, by the Rev. George Edmondson, Part 3. Amidst the prevailing gloom of this anxious autumn of 1565, the splendid festivities attending the marriage of Alexander of Parma with Maria of Portugal lit up the court of Brussels with a passing semblance of gaiety. The wedding took place on November 11th. On the 5th, dispatches from Philip had been placed in the regent's hands of such fateful import that she resolved to keep them secret till the ceremony was over. On the 14th, she informed the Council of State that the king required the strict execution of the placards from all governors and magistrates, considered it inexpedient to extend the power of the Council of State or to summon the States General, and ordered that the proclamation of the Inquisition and of the decrees of the Council of Trent should be made in every town and village in the provinces. At last, after long delay, His Majesty had spoken, and no choice was now left between obedience and rebellion. All the members of the council felt that the king's will had been expressed in such peremptory and unequivocal terms that discussion was useless. Now, the Prince of Orange is reported to have whispered to his neighbor, we shall see the beginning of a fine tragedy. The proclamation was made, the inquisitors displayed redoubled energy, but intense indignation and excitement were aroused among the people. Orange, Bergen, and the magistrates generally refused to carry out the edicts. Rather, they said, would they resign their functions than be responsible for the consequences of a policy bidding them to burn fifty or sixty thousand of their fellow countrymen. Lawlessness spread rapidly. The populace was furious at the sight of the barbarous executions. Lampoons, broadsheets, and handbills fiercely denouncing the inquisitors were scattered broadcast and petitions were found affixed to the doors of the houses of Orange, Egmont, and other men of mark, asking them to intervene. The Duchess was utterly bewildered. At this time, a new order of men, the lesser nobility, began to take an active and leading part in fomenting the rising spirit of resistance to arbitrary authority. Foremost among these were Louis of Nassau, William's younger brother, Henry, Viscount of Brederode, Philip de Marnix, Lord of St. Aldegonde, and Nicholas de Hames, King at Arms of the Golden Fleece. The movement first took shape at a gathering of twenty young gentlemen at the mansion of the Count of Coulomberg at Brussels, on the very day of the Parma wedding, to hear a sermon from the missionary preacher Francois Dujon, Franciscus Unius, a disciple of Calvin, who had just taken charge at great personal hazard of the French Reformed Church at Antwerp. At this and other secret meetings, it was agreed to form a confederacy of nobles, whose principles were set forth in a document drawn up and early in 1566 circulated for signature 
known as the Compromise. It declared that the king had been induced by evil counselors, chiefly foreigners, in violation of his oaths to establish in the country the Inquisition, which is spoken of as a tribunal opposed to all laws human and divine. The Confederates bound themselves by a solemn oath to unite in resisting it in every form, and in extirpating it from the land. In taking this course, they professed to be acting as loyal subjects of the king and in his interests. Finally, they promised to help and protect one another against persecution or molestation as brothers and faithful comrades with life and goods. This compromise is generally believed to have been written by Marnix with the cooperation of Lewis and Brederode. The signatures soon amounted to more than 2,000, the most zealous agent of the propaganda being Nicholas de Hames, in whose custody the dangerous paper remained. The signatories comprised a goodly number of Catholics as well as Protestants, the majority belonging to the lower nobility and the landed gentry, but many were substantial burghers and well-to-do merchants. As in all insurrectionary movements, not a few who rushed into the fray were reckless and riotous youths and spendthrift adventurers. Louis of Nassau, Le Bon Chevalier, as his brother well named him, brave, high-spirited, chivalrous, a good comrade, a loyal friend, and withal an earnestly religious, God-fearing man, was by birth and education a Lutheran. During a too short but brilliant career, no one played a more noble or more distinguished part than he in defense of religious liberty against foreign oppression. Of a different type, but scarcely less conspicuous for the services he was to render, was Philip de Marnix, Lord of St. Aldegonde, one of the most accomplished men of his day, poet, pamphleteer, theologian, orator, diplomatist, soldier, eminent in all the various fields of his many-sided activity. Both he and Count Louis were at this time 28 years of age and alike full of restless energy and religious zeal. But with St. Aldegonde, who was a stern Calvinist, resistance to the Inquisition did not imply, as with humane and kindly Louis, any hatred of intolerance. To Marnix, not less than to Philip, liberty of conscience was an inconceivable thing. Henry of Bruderode, the representative of the more reckless section of the Confederates, was a lineal descendant of the ancient Counts of Holland, but of all the possessions that had once belonged to his house, only the lordship of Vienen remained. Brederode was bold and downright by temperament, extravagant and dissipated in his habits, free of access, courteous, generous, and convivial. He was a Catholic, but thoroughly at one in his opposition to tyranny with William of Orange and his brother Louis, to both of whom he was deeply attached. Brederode had many faults, but his popularity and loyalty gave him for a while a commanding place in the councils of the malcontents. At the outset, however, the compromise met with little favor in the eyes of the great nobles. Its methods did not commend themselves, more especially to the cautious spirit of Orange. He himself, indeed, had not been reticent. On January 24, 1566, he had written with his own hand to Margaret, I should prefer, in case His Majesty insists without delay on the Inquisition and the execution of the edicts, that he place some other person in my place who understands better the humors of the people and has more skill than I have in keeping them in peace and quietness rather than run the risk of staining the reputation of myself and my family should any harm accrue to the country through my government and during my tenure of it. He lays stress upon his loyal devotion to sovereign and land, but it is noteworthy, as pointing to the change that was already coming over his opinions, that he speaks of himself as a good Christian, not as a good Catholic. Under the pretense of festivity, conferences were held during the early part of March, first at Breda and afterwards at Hoogstraten. The principal nobles, as well as a number of confederates, were present. Discussion turned on a petition or request drawn up by Louis of Nassau on behalf of the signatories of the Compromise, setting forth their grievances and aims. It was not without difficulty that Orange assented to the presentation of this petition to the regent, and only on condition that the language was modified in many places. His moderation was, indeed, far from satisfying the more hot-blooded of the leaguers. But if William held aloof, Others, like Megham and Egmont himself, 
were alarmed and not a little alienated by the audacious and almost treasonable character of the compromise movement. The conferences, in fact, rather intensified than otherwise growing divergences of opinion. On March 28th, the regent summoned a great assembly of notables, counselors, and knights of the fleece to the palace to advise with her on the critical state of the country. And courageous, though she usually was, she proposed to them that the court should be removed for the present from Brussels to Mons. From this project, she was dissuaded. As to the request, which the duchess had been asked to receive, while some urged that the doors should be shut in the petitioners' faces, Barlaimont did not scruple to propose that they should be allowed to enter and then be cut to pieces. But by the advice of Orange, supported by Egmont, more moderate counsels prevailed. On April 3rd, the Confederates began to crowd into Brussels. On the 5th, more than 600, mostly young men of birth, assembled at midday at the Hotel Kolenberg, and a little later some 250 of these marched in a serried column to the council chamber of the palace. Lewis of Nassau and Brederode, as the leaders, brought up the rear. The regent was at first disquieted at seeing the approach of so numerous a body, but was reassured by Barlemont, who exclaimed, What, madam, is your highness afraid of these beggars, Segio? By the living God, if my advice were taken, their request should be annotated by a sound cudgeling, and they should be made to descend the steps of the court more quickly than they came up. Brederode was the chosen spokesman. The request was couched in far more conciliatory language than the compromise. Nevertheless, the petitioners, while strongly protesting their loyalty and good intentions, pointed out the menacing condition of the country and besought the Duchess to send an envoy to the king, asking him to abolish the Inquisition and the placards and to publish, by the advice and consent of the States General, other ordinances less dangerous to the commonweal. They further begged the Duchess to suspend the Inquisition and the placards until the King's further pleasure should be known. Margaret, fully aware of the seriousness of the crisis, gave her reply on the following day. It was to the effect that she had no authority to suspend the Inquisition and the placards, but would give instructions to mitigate their exercise until the King's answer on the subject had been received. On April 8th, the visit of the Confederates to Brussels closed with a great carousal at the Hotel Kuhlenberg, at which Brederode presided over 300 associates. Hoogstraten, who had come upon a commission from the regent, was persuaded to remain for the feast. Brederode purposely turned the conversation upon the presentation of the request, and particularly dwelt upon the offensive term by which Barlaimont had stigmatized himself and his companions. Brederode loudly declaring that he, for his part, had no objection to the name, for that they were all ready to become beggars, if need were, in the cause of their king and country. The words were taken up by the excited assembly, and the vast dining hall rang with the cry, which the succeeding decades were to hear again and again repeated, Vivent le Guil. There can be no doubt that this little episode had been carefully prearranged by the chief actor. Brederode knew well the value of a striking party appellation, and he seized the moment of enthusiasm to appear suddenly at the head of the table with a beggar's wallet suspended from his neck and a wooden bowl in his hand. Filling the bowl, he drank to the health of all present and of the good cause. Redoubled exclamations greeted him, and the bowl passed from hand to hand, each guest as he drank pledging himself to be loyal to his friends and the league. It chanced that at the time when the excitement was at its highest, Orange, Egmont, and Horn passed the Hotel Kullenberg on their way to attend the council. Hearing the noise, they determined to go in, on the pretense of asking Hoogstraten to accompany them to the palace, really with the intention of getting the uproarious banqueters, if possible, to disperse. Despite pressure from Brederode and the other leaders, they refused to sit down, but as they stood there, the Confederates drank their health, and once more the hall shook with thunderous shouts of Vivent les Gil. The three nobles quickly left with Hoogstraten after saying a few words of caution to the revelers, little thinking that their well-intentioned visit would furnish a ground of accusation against them. From this day forward, the party of movement bore the name of Gil. Many of the Confederates at once adopted a costume of coarse gray material, 
and carried the emblems of their beggarhood, the wallet and the bowl, at their girdles or in their hats. The fashion spread rapidly, and the beggars' insignia were to be seen, worn as trinkets among all sorts and conditions of men, especially in the large towns. A gold medal was also struck for the use of members of the League. On one side was the effigy of Philip, on the other two clasped hands with the motto Fidel al Roy, Jusque a porter le Bessas. A few days after the banquet, the Confederates left Brussels and dispersed to their various homes. Meanwhile, the council had been anxiously deliberating, and the Marquis of Bergen and the Baron of Montigny were, on the refusal of Egmont again to go to Spain, selected as envoys to Philip. Not without much difficulty were they persuaded to accept the task. Instructions were drawn up to moderate the execution of the placards, and, in her letters to her brother, Margaret exposed to him fully the dangerous state of the country, and besought him either to expedite his proposed visit or to allow the envoys to bring back such concessions as would avert the outbreak of a storm. She was somewhat relieved by receiving on June 6th a letter dated May 6th in which the king declared that he had no intention of introducing the Spanish Inquisition and announced his speedy arrival. On the subject of the placards, whilst asserting that only by punishment of transgressors could the Catholic faith be maintained, Philip expressed his willingness to change the mode of chastisement so long as it was efficacious. For God knows, he adds, that there is nothing I so willingly avoid as a fusion of human blood, especially that of my Netherland subjects, and I should reckon it the very happiest thing in my reign if there were never any need to spill it. The letter was read to the council, who expressed their pleasure at the announcement of the king's visit and his benevolent intentions. There was no eagerness on the part of either Bergen or Montigny to hasten their departure, and a slight accident to the former was the excuse for a considerable delay. Montigny at length started alone and reached Madrid on June 17th, Bergen following some time after. But meanwhile, events had been moving fast. The apparent success of the Confederates at Brussels gave great encouragement to the sectaries throughout the country. Refugees began to return in great numbers, and missionary preachers from France, Germany, Switzerland, and England to make their appearance, first in West Flanders and along the southern frontier, then in many other parts of the land. These men were chiefly Calvinists, trained in the school of Geneva, but there were also many Anabaptists. The Lutherans, though the smallest of the sects in numbers, had the largest following among the educated classes. The missioners, some of them recusant monks and friars, others men of the people, naturally gifted with homely eloquence, attracted ever-increasing crowds to their preachings. At first, the conventicles were held at night in woods or in inaccessible spots, but, growing gradually bolder, the sectaries ventured into the open country by day, then into the villages, and at last into the environs of the great towns. At Ghent, Bruges, and Ypres, and especially at Antwerp, thousands came out to hear them, arms in hand. Bands of men paraded the streets, chanting the psalms in the popular versions of Marot or de Thennes, and raising in the pauses of the singing loud shouts of Vivent les Gil. The people laughed to scorn the so-called moderation of the placards, and ironically called it murderation. On July 3rd, the regent, feeling that something must be done, issued a new placard against the preachers and the conventicles. It remained a dead letter. Margaret was at her wit's end. She felt herself powerless without money, soldiers, or willing help from the nobility, all of whom, while professing their readiness to obey the king's orders, followed the lead of Egmont and declined to employ their armed retainers against the people. The Duchess complained bitterly to her brother of the position in which she found herself and besought his speedy intervention. The only policy, she urged, was that of concession. To attempt to enforce the Inquisition and placards would mean a revolution. Everything is in such disorder, she said in a letter of July 19th, that in the greater part of the country there is neither law, faith, nor king. The majority of the Council of State demanded the summoning of the States General as the only adequate remedy, and declaimed against Philip's dilatoriness. He still let month after month pass by without taking any definite steps, 
and both the regent and her advisers saw nothing but ruin staring them in the face. The chief center of disturbance was Antwerp. Crowds of armed Calvinists thronged to the preachings and bade defiance to the magistrates. Business was interrupted. It was feared that the reckless and disorderly part of the population might, under cover of religious zeal, attempt to pillage the houses of the well-to-do Catholic merchants. The simultaneous arrival of Megham and Brederode into the town only added fuel to the flame. The Loyalists looked to Megham, the revolutionary party, to the leader of the Gyo, as their champions. Thoroughly alarmed, the magistracy applied to the Duchess of Parma to save the city from threatened destruction. Margaret, in this emergency, turned to Orange, who was Burgrave of Antwerp, and asked him to undertake the task of restoring order in that important center of trade. Very reluctantly, the prince consented to the regent's request, but he knew that he was already an object of distrust to the government. For a public declaration of his sympathy with sedition and heresy, the times were not yet ripe. As the prince drew near to Antwerp, thousands of the inhabitants came out to meet him. He was greeted with tumultuous enthusiasm and loud shouts of vivent les Gyo. Such a demonstration was not to William's taste, and he did not scruple to say so. For some weeks he remained in the town and succeeded in appeasing the discord that had raged so fiercely. The settlement arrived at was of the nature of a compromise. The Calvinists were at length persuaded to lay down their arms on condition that the reformed worship, though excluded from the city, should be tolerated in the suburbs. Armenteros was not far wrong when about this time he wrote to the king that the prince has changed his religion. If the taciturn had not yet become a Protestant, he had ceased to be a Catholic. The principles which were to guide the rest of his life were already clearly in evidence. Those principles of toleration in matters of faith and conscience, which mark him out from his contemporaries in an age of bitter intolerance. About the middle of July, a great meeting of Confederates was held at Saint Tron, in the Principality of Liege. About 2,000 assembled, and a much more determined tone was adopted than previously. Louis of Nassau was the directing spirit. By the express wish of the Duchess, the leaders had an interview with Orange and Egmont at Duffel, near Antwerp, on July 18th. As this led to nothing, the Confederates resolved to send a deputation of 12 members, with Louis at their head, to see the regent herself at Brussels. With their gray costumes and beggar emblems suspended at their necks, they presented themselves before her on July 26th. The courtiers in derision gave them the name of the Twelve Apostles. Their language was far less conciliatory than before. They did not, they said, ask for pardon for their past conduct. What they had done and were doing was for the country's good and deserved applause. They asked that Orange, Egmont, and Horn should be nominated upon a special commission to safeguard their interests and to give counsel as to the best means for remedying the evils they complained of. In these three, they were willing to confide, but if their wishes in this and other matters were disregarded, they went so far as to hint that they might be obliged to seek foreign aid. Margaret, on her side, took no pains to conceal her anger. The threat of looking to the foreigner for assistance was no idle one. Louis had for some time been in correspondence with the Huguenot leaders in France and the Protestant princes in Germany. He now, with something more than connivance on the part of his brother, set to work to subsidize among the latter a force of 4,000 horse and 40 companies of foot soldiers. William was quite aware of Philip's secret designs, and he was already preparing for the worst. At Madrid, Montigny and Bergen continued to be treated with all outward marks of courtesy. They were invited to attend the meetings of the Council of State at which the affairs of the Netherlands were discussed. To outward semblance, their representations might have seemed to have been successful. In a letter addressed to the Duchess of Parma, dated July 31st, Philip consented to abolish the papal inquisition and promised toleration so far as it was consistent with the maintenance of the Catholic faith and a general pardon to all whom the regent should deem deserving. He wrote almost affectionately to Orange and Egmont. To one thing alone he opposed an inflexible negative, the summoning of the states general. 
The archives of Simancas have revealed the duplicity of these concessions. On August 9th at Segovia, the king, in the presence of the Duke of Alva and two notaries, executed an instrument in which he declared that the concession of a general pardon had been wrung from him against his will, and that he did not, therefore, feel bound by it. And three days later, August 12th, in a confidential dispatch to Requesen at Rome, he authorized his ambassador to inform the Pope secretly that his abolition of the papal inquisition was a mere form of words, because it could not be effectual without the sanction of the authority which had imposed it, the Pope himself. As to toleration and pardon, his holiness might rest assured, for I will lose all my states and a hundred lives if I had them, rather than be the lord of heretics. Philip was playing false, only until he should feel himself in a position to compel obedience by force. How long he might have procrastinated before he had made up his mind to act can never be known, for events forced his hand. On August 14th, the signal was given for an outburst of iconoclastic fury by the attack of a mob of Protestant fanatics upon the churches of St. Omer. They wrecked the altars, smashed the images to pieces, and destroyed all the objects of art and beauty which fell in their way. On the next day, a similar scene was enacted at Ypres, and the movement spread rapidly from town to town. At Courtrai, Valenciennes, Tournai, and elsewhere, infuriated bands made havoc of churches and religious houses and these deeds of savage and sacrilegious destruction reached their climax by the irreparable ruin which on August 16th and 17th befell the magnificent cathedral at Antwerp. The great procession on the Festival of the Assumption, August 15th, had passed through the streets of the city amidst jeers and angry exclamations from the crowd. But the Prince of Orange was at the town hall, and no overt act of violence was attempted. Unhappily, he left at night for Brussels at the urgent summons of the regent. On the next day, a small party of rioters found their way into the cathedral and created a scandalous tumult, which was only appeased after a struggle that ended in the expulsion of the offenders. But nothing was done for the safety of the sacred edifice, which was the glory of Antwerp and the pride of the whole country. Thus emboldened, a small body of men, women, and boys not more than one hundred in number, and drawn from the very lowest scum of the population, remained in the building after the conclusion of Vespers, and were allowed with impunity to wreak their will upon its accumulated treasures. When at last the priceless contents had been with brutal contumely destroyed or carried off as plunder, the rioters, encouraged by their success, hastened to make the round of the other churches which they treated in the same way. An English eyewitness declared that the parties thus engaged sometimes numbered not more than ten or a dozen persons. Not till the next day, when the work of destruction was accomplished, did the magistracy attempt to put an end to these disgraceful disorders. Hereupon, the epidemic of iconoclasm ran its course with a rapidity that was truly alarming. It broke out in the northern provinces with the same virulence as in the southern, and for a fortnight ensued an orgy of outrage and plundering. No insults were too coarse, no indignities too gross to be perpetrated upon places and objects sanctified by the worship of centuries and dear to the hearts of all faithful Catholics. The penalty afterwards paid for these criminal excesses was not undeserved, either by the offenders themselves or by the cowardly magistrates and citizens, who, by standing aloof, connived at their atrocities. The effect of this outbreak was in many ways disastrous. It alienated the more liberal Catholics from the cause of the Confederates. It excited the fears of the Duchess Regent to such an extent that she made secret preparations to leave Brussels for Mons. Neither entreaties nor threats would have turned her aside from her purpose had not the town magistracy, on hearing of her intention, ordered the gates to be closed. Henceforth, Margaret looked upon the great popular nobles whom she had so lately favored, as her enemies. She denounced Orange, Egmont, and Horn to the king as secret traitors and instigators of revolt. For a while, indeed, she felt it necessary to dissemble and to make a kind of compact with the Confederates. She promised for her part that those of the Reformed faith should have liberty to worship in places where such worship had already taken place, 
and that members of the League should be held free from blame for anything that they had done. An instrument to this effect was signed by her on August 23rd, and two days later, Lewis of Nassau and his allies solemnly undertook to assist the government in putting down disorder and in bringing disturbers of the peace to justice. The iron entered deeply into Margaret's soul before she degraded herself, as she thought, by assenting to such an accord. Her intense indignation breaks forth in her correspondence with her brother, and she finds comfort in the thought that force had compelled her action, and that the king was not bound by her agreement. Nay, she besought him to come, and arms in hand, make himself master in his own dominions. Meanwhile, the concessions she had made, and the exertions of the various governors in their respective provinces, secured for the moment an outward appearance of calm. The news of the iconoclastic outrages, as may well be imagined, awakened vehement indignation at Madrid. The king, for once, forgot his habitual dissimulation and broke out angrily, It shall cost them dear, I swear it by the soul of my father. His counselors were unanimous in urging upon him the necessity of hastening in person to the Netherlands and of taking with him such a force as to crush opposition, if conciliatory measures failed. Philip listened to their advice in silence. He had his own plans, which for the present he divulged to no one. He succeeded in keeping his sister and all his trusted advisers ignorant of his intention, but not his wary and wakeful adversary, the Prince of Orange. William learnt from his well-paid spies that Philip was secretly gathering large bodies of troops together and discovered that the king laid the blame for all the troubles that had arisen, not on the rioters or the sectaries or even on the confederates, but first and foremost on the great nobles. These, he had been heard to declare, had stirred up the spirit of disaffection, and exemplary punishment must fall on their heads as originators and sources of the evil. The prince took his measures accordingly. On October 3rd, he arranged a conference at Dendermonde between himself, accompanied by his brother Louis, and Egmont, Horn, and Hoogstraten. On none of the accounts of what took place can absolute reliance be placed. One thing, however, is certain, that the chief interest of the discussion turned on an intercepted letter from Don Francis de Alava, the Spanish ambassador at Paris, to the Duchess of Parma. In this letter, the king is represented as speciously luring on the Netherland leaders to their destruction by an outward show of gentleness, in order that he might with greater certainty visit them, and especially the three great lords, Orange, Egmont, and Horn, with the swift and condign punishment they deserved. Speaking for himself and his brother, Louis of Nassau urged the necessity of armed resistance, and even went so far as to advise under certain eventualities the transference of the sovereignty to the German branch of the House of Austria. But his arguments failed to move Egmont or to convince Horn. Egmont refused absolutely to take up arms against the king, and Horn, though sullen and despondent, declined to commit himself to a policy of active disloyalty. Margaret, when confronted with Alava's letter, declared most indignantly that it was an impudent forgery. Such a denial proves little. Forgery or not, its revelations of the king's designs were in no sense fiction, but literally and entirely true. William left the conference sad and disillusioned. He saw that he could count henceforth on no help from those who hitherto had been his chief friends and allies. He knew with his clear insight that they were walking straight into the jaws of destruction, and so, though now isolated and almost in despair, he went quickly on with his preparations to meet force with force and to prevent his country from being trampled underfoot defenseless beneath the heel of Spanish tyranny. With the ready help of the Counts John and Louis, his brothers, he entered into active communications with the Elector of Saxony, the Elector Palatine, the Landgrave of Hesse, and the Duke of Wertenberg, with the object of forming a German league in defense of the cause of the Reformed faith in the Netherlands. He met with many difficulties. Urged to declare himself a Lutheran, William at length in November, writing to the Landgrave at Hesse, went so far as to admit that it was his intention to inform the king secretly of his adhesion to the Confession of Augsburg. This he never did, but henceforth he may be regarded as having definitely given up his nominal conformity to the Roman Church. His own personal adhesion to the Confession of Augsburg was not enough, 
and for many weary months his pleadings and his arguments were exerted in vain. Surely, he pleads, the German Protestants will not permit these hapless Christians to be crushed without an effort. In this way the year ended, amidst gathering storms. End of section 22. Read by Colleen McMahon. Section 23 of The Cambridge Modern History, Volume 3, The Wars of Religion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 6. The Revolt of the Netherlands by the Rev. George Edmondson. Part 4. On February 4th, 1567, William who had been since October energetically engaged in his own provinces of Holland and Utrecht in the task of repressing disorder and, by conciliatory measures, appeasing the minds of the people, returned to Antwerp, where his presence was urgently required. His moderation towards the sectaries in Amsterdam and other places did not meet with the approval of the regent. But the states of Holland, consisting chiefly of Catholics, voted him a gratuity of 50,000 florins for the services he had rendered to the province. The prince, though at the time in sore straits for money, declined to receive any recompense. Arrived at Antwerp, he found the town thronged with Protestants, congregated there from many quarters, and in a most defiant and bellicose humor. Their number was placed by Thomas Gresham, Queen Elizabeth's agent, as high as 40,000. Margaret was at this time doing her best to render of no effect the unwilling concessions she had made to the Reformed congregations. She refused to allow their ministers to baptize or to marry, and she called upon the governors to aid her in keeping the sectaries in order. She had now in the country several German and Walloon regiments recently levied. These she placed under the command of Aremberg, Megham, and other loyalists showing clearly that it was her intention to crush opposition by force. The measures of the government were calculated to provoke insurrections, perhaps were intended to do so, and it was not long in coming. John de Marnix, Lord of Toulouse, the elder brother of saint Aldegonde, one of the most hot-headed and able among the Confederates, had no difficulty in gathering around him a band of 2,000 Calvinist zealots, principally drawn from Antwerp, and with these he endeavored to make himself master of the island of Valcheren. Foiled in this, he encamped himself at a place called Ostroville, about a couple of miles from Antwerp, with the hope of getting possession of that city. The Duchess Regent, on hearing of this outbreak, lost no time in dispatching a picked force of Walloons under the command of Lenoy, with orders to exterminate the miscreants without mercy. On March 13th, the conflict ensued. The rebels were utterly routed, and almost the whole of them, with their gifted leader, perished. This massacre, for it was little else, was perpetrated almost within sight of the walls of Antwerp, and the Calvinists in the town, hearing the sounds of battle, rushed to arms with the intention of helping their fellows. They found the gates locked and guarded by order of the Prince of Orange. The sectaries then gathered in threatening masses in the great Place de Meyer. Here William, accompanied by Hoogstraten, and followed by an armed force of Catholics and Lutherans, came to parley with them. The gates, he declared, were shut to prevent the victorious cavalry of Lenoy from entering, and at great personal risk he endeavored to persuade the angry crowd that only by abstaining from violence could they hope to be saved from destruction at the hands of the regent's mercenaries. On this occasion, the prince showed himself possessed of extraordinary courage. He was greeted with cries of false traitor, soldier of the Pope, servant of Antichrist, and the like, and one artisan went so far as to present a loaded arquebus to his breast. His efforts at accommodation were long in vain. The hostile bodies of citizens stood face to face, on the one side the Catholics and Lutherans, on the other thirteen or fourteen thousand fierce Calvinists. But at length Orange prevailed, and an accord was agreed to on the same basis as that of the previous September. William, as he proclaimed it, raised the cry of Vive le Roi. It met with a feeble and sullen response from the congregated masses, 
who then dispersed to their homes. Meanwhile, a strong force had been placed under the orders of Philip de Noircarmes, governor of Hainault, to suppress certain seditious movements in that province. He had an easy task in dispersing some bands of undisciplined insurgents at Lassie, and then proceeded to lay siege to Valenciennes, the chief center of disturbance. Here he met with obstinate resistance, and it was not until after a lengthy blockade that the city capitulated on April the 2nd. The sufferings of the inhabitants were terrible, and a savage vengeance was taken in order to give a lesson to other recalcitrant towns. For a while, indeed, the routs of Osterville and Lassie and the capture of Valenciennes broke down the spirit of resistance in the country. The time was now come, the regent felt, for dealing with the Prince of Orange, whose doubtful attitude was particularly disquieting to her. His courage and tact in keeping the peace in Holland and at Utrecht and Antwerp, far from gaining the thanks and recognition of the government, made him only appear the more dangerous. The terms he had offered, Margaret said, were strange and preposterous, and she insisted on putting his loyalty to the test by peremptorily, though with insinuating words, requiring him to take an oath, which had already been subscribed by many of the leading nobles, including Egmont, to serve the king and act for or against whomsoever his majesty might order, without restriction or limitation, on pain of dismissal from the service of the state. Brederode had already bluntly refused to take the oath and had given up his military command. Horn and Hoogstraten also had preferred to resign their appointments rather than commit themselves to such a declaration. But Orange had as yet, by various excuses, managed to avoid taking definite action. He now answered unequivocally that he could not undertake to do what might be contrary to his conscience, adding that he henceforth regarded himself as discharged from all his functions. Margaret, however, was still unwilling to accept his resignation. She sent, therefore, on March 23rd, her secretary, Bertz, to Antwerp on a special mission of persuasion, but with no effect. As a last resort, Bertz proposed that Orange should meet Egmont and Megham to discuss the matter. He agreed, and the momentous conference took place at Villebroek on April 2nd, the day of Valenciennes' surrender, in the presence of Bertz, who took notes of all that passed. These notes were seen by Strada, whose narrative of the interview may therefore be regarded as authentic. The deputed nobles did their utmost to shake the prince's resolution, but he was immovable. In his turn, William made overtures to Egmont. Take arms, he said, and I will join you. Much impressed by the earnestness of his old and trusted comrade, Egmont, in his turn, urged him not to leave the country. It will be the ruin of your house, he said. The loss of my property, William rejoined, does not trouble me. Then, with tears in his eyes, he added, Your confidence will destroy you. You will be the bridge over which the Spaniards will pass to enter the Netherlands. The two friends embraced in deep emotion and parted never to meet again. Two days after this meeting, William wrote to the Duchess, asking that his post might be filled by others, and withdrew his daughter, Marie of Nassau, from the court. On April 11th, he retired to Breda. Arrived there, and fearing for his personal security, he set to work to make preparations for quitting the Netherlands. On April 22nd, he started with his whole household and made his way into exile at his ancestral home of Dillenburg. Circumstances were quickly to show that the step taken by the Prince of Orange was not dictated by groundless forebodings. Philip had not been brooding over the condition of the Netherlands for months without result. His mind was at last irrevocably made up. He determined to follow the relentless policy advocated by the Duke of Alva and to send that stern and redoubtable captain in person with a picked body of troops to carry it out. The fiction of a royal visit was still sedulously proclaimed. The ships for the escort were actually got ready. Alva, so Philip declared, was only going to prepare the way for his sovereign. The deception was kept up to the last, and with such thoroughness that even now it is impossible to say positively, though the probability amounts almost to certainty, that the king never intended to leave Spain. Alva had his final audience with Philip about the middle of April 1567, and a fortnight later, April 27th, he set sail from Cartagena, where a fleet of 36 vessels under Prince Andrea Doria awaited him, for Genoa. 
Arrived in Italy, he assembled from the garrisons of Lombardy and Naples four tercios, about 9,000 men, of veteran Spanish infantry and 1,300 Italian troopers. With these, afterwards increased by a body of German mercenaries, Alva started in June upon his long and hazardous march across the Mont Cenis, and then through Burgundy, Lorraine, and Luxembourg to Brussels. The army threaded its way along defiles and through forests in three divisions, shadowed on the one flank by a French, on the other by a Swiss force, who suspiciously watched its progress northwards, ready to repel any invasion of their respective territories. But all went well. On August 8th, Alva crossed the frontier of the Netherlands. Such was the iron discipline enforced by him that no acts of depredation or violence were committed during this slow and toilsome march. Contemporary writers speak with admiration of the splendid armor and martial bearing of this choice body of veteran troops, which, for the first time in the history of war, included a corps of musketeers. To give his soldiers the very best equipment he could procure, and to keep them under the strictest control, was in the opinion of this wary and successful commander far more important than mere numbers. He preferred even to regulate the very vices of his army rather than connive at license. With a train of some 2,000 Italian courtesans organized into battalions and companies, the champion of the Catholic faith and the defender of the divine right of kings entered the Netherlands. On his way to the capital, Alva was met by many of the Flemish nobles. Among them was Egmont. When he saw him approaching, the duke was overheard to exclaim, There comes the great heretic. The words were said loud enough to reach the count's ears, but the subsequent cordiality of his reception did away with any bad impression. The duke placed his arm around Egmont's neck, accepted from him a present of two beautiful horses, and afterwards rode side by side with him, both conversing apparently in the friendliest manner. On August 22nd, attended by a detachment of foot soldiers, Alva made his entry into Brussels, and taking up his quarters in lodgings that had been prepared for him, at once proceeded to the palace to pay his respects to the Duchess of Parma. For some time, the regent had been doubtful as to the reception she should give to the new Captain General. Not only were the man and his mission distasteful to her, but she looked upon the step taken by her brother as a direct insult and aspersion upon herself, and disastrous to the country. Just after she had succeeded by extraordinary exertions in restoring order in the provinces, she found herself, in what she considered a humiliating manner, superseded. In her letters to her brother, she gave full vent to her indignation, and again and again requested to be relieved of her charge. You've shown no regard for my wishes or reputation. The name of Alva is so odious here that it is enough to make the whole Spanish nation detested. She could never have imagined that the king would have made such an appointment without consulting her. She was hurt to the very bottom of her soul by the king's conduct towards her. Her reception of Alva was chilling. The audience, according to the custom of the court, took place in the Duchess of Parma's bedchamber. Margaret stood in the middle of the room with Airshow, Barlemont, and Egmont by her side, without advancing a single step to greet her visitor. The duke, though a Spanish grandee, with deferential courtesy took off his hat, but was requested to replace it. The interview, which was of the stiffest and most formal character, lasted for half an hour. The next day, the Council of State asked the duke to exhibit his powers. He at once sent the various commissions he had received from the king. There was general surprise at the extent of the powers conferred upon him by these instruments. The bare title of regent was left to the duchess, but all real authority, civil as well as military, was placed in the hands of the captain general. Alva at once proceeded to introduce garrisons into the principal towns. When Margaret protested against the quartering of Spanish troops in Brussels, the duke quietly rejoined, I am ready to take all the odium upon myself. Not at first, however, did he unmask his full intentions. To get his prey into the net, not to frighten it away, was his chief care. The nobles were attracted to Brussels by brilliant festivities. Egmont was soothed and flattered. All the arts of cajolery were used to draw horn from his retreat at Viert to the capital. Egmont, though repeatedly warned of his danger, could not make up his mind to fly. 
and Horn, though full of suspicion, thought it the best policy not to refuse Alva's pressing invitation. He came to Brussels, and all was now ready for the carrying out of a daring and deep-laid plan. On September 9th, Counts Egmont and Horn, with other counselors, were invited to the Duke's residence for the ostensible purpose of deliberating upon the plans of a citadel to be erected at Antwerp. After dining with the prior Frederick of Toledo, a natural son of Alva, they accordingly went to the Captain General's quarters about four o'clock in the afternoon. The Duke received them in the friendliest manner, and after entering into a discussion with them and the other counselors and some engineers about the plans upon the table, suddenly withdrew, pleading indisposition. The consultation lasted for three hours. At seven o'clock, as Egmont was leaving the room, Don Sancho de Vila, captain of the guard, saying that he had a communication to make to him, drew him on one side. At a signal, the doors were thrown open, and the count found himself surrounded by a company of Spanish troops. Thereupon, Davila demanded his sword. With a gesture of surprise and anger, Egmont threw it upon the ground, exclaiming, I have often done the king good service with it. He was then arrested and confined in a darkened chamber on the upper floor. Horn, who had been allowed to leave the hall of audience, was at the same time arrested in the courtyard and separately confined. Both remained thus immured for a fortnight, shut off from all communication with their friends, and were then taken under the escort of a strong military force for greater security to the castle of Ghent. On the afternoon of the same day, three other arrests of importance were made, those of Egmont's private secretary, Bacherzil, of Antony de la Lue, who had served Horn in the same capacity, and also of Orange's friend, Antony von Strahlen, the well-known and influential burgomaster of Antwerp. The whole design had been so skillfully arranged that the victims were all secured at one swoop without so much as a blow being struck or an effort made to escape. This coup de main had a stunning effect upon men's minds, and absolute tranquility, caused by terror, prevailed everywhere. Alva himself was astonished at the apparent completeness of his success. Thank God, he wrote to his gratified master, all is quiet in the country. The boast that he had made on entering the Netherlands seemed justified. I have tamed men of iron in my day, he is reported to have said. I shall know how to deal with these men of butter. But Alva was not satisfied with arrests. He required a tribunal which should know how to execute summary justice upon his prisoners. He proceeded, therefore, to create one. It was known officially as the Council of Troubles, but it is passed down to history branded by popular repulsion with the terrible name of the Council of Blood. Alva announced its formation to the king in the same letter in which he relates the story of the arrests. This tribunal exercised an authority overriding that of all other tribunals in the provinces, even that of the Council of State, and yet it was an absolutely informal body, erected by the mere fiat of the duke without any legal status whatsoever. Its members could show no letters patent or charter from the king, not even commissions signed by the captain general. The duke was president and reserved to himself the final decision upon all cases. Two members, Vargas and Del Rio, alone had the privilege of voting, and these two were Spaniards. Of the nobles, Barlemont and Noir Carmes, who had already shown that they were thorough supporters of the royal policy, had seats on the tribunal, as well as the Chancellor of Gelderland, the presidents of Flanders and Artois, and the councillors Blasier and Hessels. But the authority of all these Netherlanders was practically nil. They were the tools, and unfortunately, the willing and zealous tools, of Spanish tyranny. Both Vargas and Del Rio were lawyers and well fitted for the part they had to play, the former by his unscrupulous inhumanity, the latter by his subserviency. Of Juan de Vargas, history has nothing to record but what is infamous, and nothing casts a darker stain upon the memory of Alva than his deliberate choice of this execrable instrument. The Council of Troubles was not long in getting to work. A swarm of commissioners were appointed to ransack the provinces in search of delinquents, and informers were encouraged to accuse their neighbors and acquaintances. Truckloads of such information were not slow in arriving, and were duly placed before the tribunal. For the purpose of dealing with these, the council was divided into committees. 
but all committees reported to Vargas, and all sentences were submitted to Alva. The council sat regularly, morning and afternoon, and the Duke himself was frequently present for seven hours in the day. From a judicial point of view, the proceedings were a mere farce. Whole batches of the accused were condemned together offhand, and from one end of the Netherlands to the other, the executioners were busy with stake, sword, and gibbet, until the whole land ran red with blood. Barlemont and Noir Carmes were speedily disgusted with such wholesale butchery, and soon absented themselves from the sittings. Their example was followed after a time by the Chancellor and the two presidents. But their absence only served to accelerate the progress of the work of death and confiscation. Vargas was indefatigable in the execution of his congenial task, relieving its grim monotony from time to time with jokes and jeers in bad Latin, and he was almost rivaled in diligence and cruelty by his Flemish colleague Hessels. Alva reckoned on receiving 500,000 ducats in the year from confiscated property. He cared nothing for the impoverishment of the country, so long as the exchequer grew rich. Meanwhile, the Duchess of Parma, irritated beyond measure by the humiliation of her position, had sent her secretary, Machiavelli, to Madrid to demand the king's permission for her retirement. Machiavelli returned on October 6th, bearing a dispatch by which the king informed his sister that he accepted her resignation, and in token of his satisfaction with her services, raised her pension from 8,000 florins to 14,000 per annum. Machiavelli brought with him another dispatch, conferring on Alva the offices of regent and governor-general. The Duchess left the Netherlands in December for her home at Parma, amidst general signs of popular affection and regret. One of her last acts had been to write to Philip, to beg him to temper justice with mercy, and not to confound the good and the bad in the same punishment. She had been an able administrator and possessed many good qualities but the praise of clemency can scarcely be claimed for her government. Her harshness, however, at this moment of her departure, seemed to be mildness itself when contrasted with her successor's almost inhuman temper. The Duchess gone, Alva's judicial murders and plunderings continued with growing energy. As a single instance of their sweeping character, it may be mentioned that in the early hours of Ash Wednesday, when it was known that most people would be at home after the carnival, not less than 1,500 persons were seized in their beds and hurried off to prison. Their fate is recorded in a letter written by the governor, in which, after informing his master of the arrest, he quietly adds, I have ordered all of them to be executed. One of the first acts of the council in 1568 was to address a summons, which proved futile, to the Prince of Orange, his brother Louis, the Counts Hoogstraten, Kulemberg, and Vandenberg, and Baron Montigny, to appear within a fortnight before the tribunal, on pain of perpetual banishment and confiscation of their estates. William replied by denying that either Alva or his council had any jurisdiction over him. But though the head of the House of Nassau was out of their reach, William's son and heir was, by an oversight of extraordinary imprudence on his father's part, at this time studying at the University of Louvain, a dastardly act of revenge was planned by the Spanish tyrant. In February 1568, Philip William, Count of Buren, was kidnapped and conveyed to Spain, to be there brought up in the principles which his father detested, and taught to hate the cause for which that father sacrificed his life. When the professors of the university ventured to protest to Vargas against such a breach of their privileges, they met with the barbarous reply, non coramus privilegios vestros. Vargas had an equal contempt for the laws of the land and for those of grammar. The process of the two prisoners in the castle of Ghent had been handed over to Vargas and Del Rio, and in the middle of November 1567, they were separately subjected to a lengthened interrogatory. Not till the very end of the year, however, were they furnished with a copy of the charges made against them. These consisted of 90 counts in the case of Egmont, of 68 in that of Horn, and replies were demanded within five days. And this, although in accordance be it admitted with the barbarous custom of a cruel age, they had been languishing all these months in solitary confinement, with all access to them barred, and with all their papers and documents in the possession of their accusers. The charges were met on the part of both prisoners by indignant denials of any treasonable or disloyal practices or intentions. 
and, as a concession to their remonstrances and those of their friends, the use of counsel was at length permitted to them. Meanwhile, ceaseless efforts were being made on their behalf to secure their pardon, or at least their trial, as knights of the fleece, before a court of the order. The wife of Egmont and the dowager Countess Van Horn, the admiral's stepmother, were especially active. The former, who was a Bavarian princess, had with her eleven young children been reduced to absolute penury by the sequestration of her husband's estates. She wrote most touching appeals to the king, to Alva, to the emperor, and to different knights of the fleece. Her efforts were not without effect. The emperor Maximilian wrote two letters to his cousin pleading the services of Egmont and the privileges of both lords as knights of the fleece and of Horn as a count of the Holy Roman Empire. Several of the German princes took a similar course. Even Barlaimont and Mansfeld, staunch loyalists, shrank from being parties to condemnation without a fair trial, and Granville himself counseled clemency. But nothing moved Philip or the stony-hearted Alva. Before the latter left Spain, the death of the nobles had been determined and irrevocably fixed. Neither privileges nor entreaties were of the very slightest avail. An armed eruption by Hoogstraten from the south, and a more formidable one under Louis of Nassau from Friesland, sealed their fate. Hoogstraten was easily overthrown, but Louis gained on May 11, 1568, a victory which necessitated Alva's departure for the north. He was, therefore, in a hurry to finish with his victims before he left. A decree on May 28th declared the two Nassaus, Hoogstraten and others, banished forever from the land and their property confiscated. This was followed by the execution of a number of distinguished persons and by another decree on June 1st, which suddenly announced that no further evidence on behalf of Egmont and Horn would be received thus shutting out all the elaborate testimony in their defense collected by their counsel. On the following day, June 2nd, their case was submitted to the Council of Blood, in other words, to Vargas and Del Rio, who pronounced the prisoners guilty of high treason and sentenced them to death. The sentences were at once confirmed and signed by Alva. The next day, the two lords were brought in carriages from Ghent to Brussels, escorted by 3,000 troops, and were placed in separate chambers in the Brudhuis, a large building still standing in the great square of the Hôtel de Ville and facing that edifice. On the afternoon of the 4th, Alva attended a meeting of the council, at which the secretary read aloud the sentences, that the counts of Egmont and Horn, as guilty of treasonable and rebellious practices, should be beheaded by the sword, their heads being set on poles and their estates confiscated. The duke then sent for the bishop of Ypres and commissioned him to inform the condemned that their execution would take place on the following morning and to prepare them for their fate. Entreaties for delay were unavailing. The bishop entered Egmont's chamber shortly before midnight and found the unfortunate man, wearied after his long imprisonment by the fatigue of his journey, fast asleep. He awakened him and, unable to speak, silently placed in his hands a copy of the terrible sentence. The Count had no suspicion that his doom was immediate. Of naturally sanguine temper, he was even hoping that his removal to Brussels might be the prelude to his release. He was rudely undeceived, and was at first far more overcome by astonishment than by dismay. Then the thought of his devoted wife and young family rushed into his mind, and the idea of their being left desolate and penniless filled him with anguish. But he speedily grew calm and listened attentively to the good bishop's exhortations, confessed himself, and with much solemnity received the sacrament. This done, and with some hours of life still remaining to him, he composed himself to make preparations for his end. He wrote a touching letter to the king, protesting his loyalty and begging him to forgive him, and in regard for his past services to have compassion on his poor wife and children. It was signed, from Brussels, this 5th June, 1568, at the point of death, Your Majesty's most humble and loyal vassal and servant, La Morale d'Egmont. At 10 a.m., a body of soldiers came to conduct Egmont to the block. The great square was full of people, and every window and roof crowded, while the scaffold in the middle was surrounded by serried lines of Spanish infantry. On this were placed two black cushions and a small table with a silver crucifix. As Egmont walked along, he recited the 51st Psalm. His countenance was serene, and he gravely acknowledged the salutations that were addressed to him. 
Following the advice of the bishop, he did not attempt to speak to the people. But after spending some time in earnest devotion and kissing the crucifix repeatedly, knelt down on one of the cushions. As the words were on his lips, Into thy hands I commend my spirit, the executioner struck off his head. We know less of the last hours of Horn than we do of those of his more brilliant companion in misfortune. The admiral was attended by the curate of La Chapelle. His first feelings on hearing the dread news were those of indignant resentment, but when this outburst was over, he showed, like Egmont, the greatest fortitude and self-composure in facing the ordeal which awaited him. He had a pang to endure which had been spared to Egmont, the sight of his friend's corpse covered with a blood-stained cloth. But he instantly controlled his emotion, and after a few words of an audible prayer, briefly asked the people to forgive his faults and to pray God to have mercy on his soul. Before the stroke fell, he was heard to exclaim, In manus tuas domine. Thus the two men, whose names have gone down to history so indissolubly linked, died with equal courage and with the same solemn words, though in different tongues, made their parting appeal to the divine mercy. The heads of both of the victims were exposed for three hours and were then removed. The bodies were placed in coffins and taken, that of Egmont to the convent of St. Clara, that of Egmont to the church of St. Gadul. Here they were visited, especially that of the popular Victor of Gravelin, by crowds of weeping people who uttered vows of fierce revenge against the perpetrators of what they regarded as a judicial murder. The remains were finally transferred to the family vaults of the Egmonts and Montmorencies. These executions were intended to serve as a great example and to strike terror into the minds of all opponents of the government. As a matter of fact, they aroused a perfect frenzy of undying hatred against the Spaniard and against Spanish rule and surrounded the memories of Egmont and Horn with a halo of martyrdom for the cause of freedom which they had done little to deserve. There can be small doubt that neither of them was a dangerous enemy, and that Egmont, at any rate, with skillful management, would have been found a most tractable tool in the hands of the king, ready to do anything that was required of him. By making them the victims of one of the most dramatic tragedies recorded in all history, Philip and Alva committed an act which was not only an unnecessary crime, but an irretrievable blunder. End of section 23 Read by Colleen McMahon.